All right, we'll get started here in a moment. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to, what is this, day four of our April Council meeting. We've got a day of ground fish and a little bit of salmon. Um, I'll ask uh, our Executive Director, Merrick Burton, if there are any announcements for the day. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Council members and everyone listening online. Um, no big announcements this morning. I would just flag that we do have, it appears, uh, some, fairly substantial snowfall in Portland. It's affecting power and internet and things. So we'll hope that it doesn't affect the, the staff office mothership. Um, so far, so good, but uh, we'll cross our fingers for that. Otherwise, uh, no, no further comments, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Well, we will get started with agenda item F4 and our vice chair, <clears throat> Brad Pettinger has the gavel for that. I will pass the gavel and we'll get started. Thank you, Chair Grolnick, and uh, I'll look to uh, Todd to, uh, to start us off at F4. Todd. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Good morning, Council. Um, yesterday, we have for you agenda item F4, which is preliminary preferred management measures alternatives for 23, 2023 and 2024. So under this particular agenda item, the Council is scheduled to select your preliminary preferred management measure alternatives for 23 and 24. The anticipated actions that the council is, is scheduled to consider are referenced and summarized in the action item checklist, which is agenda item F4 attachment one. And you'll note that it is a supplemental revised attachment. There weren't many changes to that particular document. It was more of a, a cleanup grammatically. So there is that for you. Um, as reference to provide some historical background for this agenda item, back in November 2021, the council forwarded a range of routine management measures as well as some new management measures for the GMT to analyze in their overwinter work. Um, I'll note that, that all that analysis is contained in agenda item F4, attachment two, um, just short of 300 pages for a team that has uh, largely never been in the same room with one another. Um, in terms of the new management measures that the council directed the GMT to look at included an FMP amendment for short belly rockfish, a threshold that would trigger council uh, review. There is um, also some non-trawl rockfish conservation area management modifications, specifically in the gear realm, as well as um, extending the primary tier sablefish season um, and ACT considerations for how to set an ACT for both quillback and copper rockfish. Um, the, as I mentioned earlier, the GMT was able to complete all of the analyses that the council directed them to do in November. Back in March um, of this year, the council reviewed um, some questions that the GMT had and directed the team to provide some initial analyses on cow cod south of 4010 um, specifically in removing the 50 metric ton ACT that is, a, that is in effect at present. Um, additionally, there were some uh, direction for the, for the GMT to take a look at the FMP definition of block area closures to make it consistent with um, federal regulation, as well as uh, some block area closures and bycatch reduction areas for spiny dogfish. Um, Looking at your briefing book materials, you'll see a whole slew of reports. Um, the attachments, of course, as I mentioned before, your, uh, the action item checklist, the larger measure, measure analytical document, as well as some preliminary social economic analyses, and um, 
the errata or the corrections to the to the attachment to. Um, I'll note that the errata or the corrections to the main document, which is attachment two, are fairly minor, and we just wanted to make sure that you had those in your hands for your decision making to avoid any uh, confusion. All the states have report, uh, provided reports. California, excuse me, Washington, Oregon have submitted one report each, and California has four reports there for you to consider. NIMS as well has provided a report um, in specific to item 12E, which is the non trawl portion of the specs um, action. So looking at the GMT, um, they have multiple reports there. However, they, are, they have opted to provide two uh, presentations for your considerations that would summarize um, their reports. However, they can answer any questions that you may have. And both the GAP and the uh, enforcement consultants also have reports. Um, looking at your actions this morning, um, you are to adopt any final harvest specifications. And I'll note I, under F3, you adopted almost all harvest specifications with the exception of quillback rockfish, which uh, staff and the GMT understand that that will come back in June for final decision making. Um, you're also to adopt preliminary preferred alternatives to routine management measures, including allocations, and identify any new management measures that need to be analyzed and considered for final action at the June meeting, and identify um, your preliminary preferreds, as I mentioned earlier. So with that, Mr. Vice Chair, I conclude my overview. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Questions for Todd on his overview? Okay, not seeing any. Uh, with that, we'll go to the NIPS report and uh, Keely Kent. Keely? Thank you. Um, I actually have uh, Ms. Lynn Massey on the line who will be giving the NIMS report. Um, she should be connected. Okay, thank you, Keely. Lynn? Morning, Mr. Chair, can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, perfect, thank you. Uh, good morning, council members. My name is Lynn Massey from the National Marine Fisheries Service and I'll be summarizing agenda item four, F4A, Supplemental NIMS Report 1. At the March 2022 council meeting, NIMS submitted a report under agenda item E9 containing proposed re revisions to the council's November 2021 motion on action item 12E, which would provide limited fishing access to the non trawl rockfish conservation area as a management measure in the 2023-24 ground fish harvest specifications and management measures action. The Council's Enforcement Committee and members of the GAP provided feedback on some elements of NIMS's pr proposal, namely the proposed definition to the directed open access sector and some of the proposed specifications for the new gear configurations that would be legalized for use inside the non trawl RCA. In response to this feedback, NIMS provides a revised pr proposal for action item 12E, which is what you see in italics in this re report. Um, quickly, I'd like to note that we are still working on some minor changes to the gear specifications that are different from what you see in this, this report. Uh, and I'll be careful to note that as I go through the revisions. So first, based on feedback from the gap, NIMS revised the minimum depth requirement for the vertical jig gear configuration to be 50 feet off the bottom as opposed to 30 feet off the bottom. Uh, this change makes the requirement consistent across both proposed gear configurations and also conforms to the minimum depth that is practiced by Emily Platt exempted fishing permit per, uh, participants. Uh, this is one of the specifications that will be tweaked a little further. The EC recommended that we write the regulations such that there is a 50 feet distance between the weight and the first hook which would still ensure that the fishing depth is at least 50 feet off the bottom, but it would also ease enforcement burden because they would have a more concrete measurement to check. Second, NIMS added a requirement to the troll gear configuration specifications to require placement of floats along the main line with no more than 25 hooks in between each float and no more than 20 floats total. This change would improve the practicality of enforcing the maximum hook requirement at sea. This is the second specification that we may be tweaking a bit further just to make it so that the marker doesn't necessarily have to be a float, but just some visibly clear marker that makes it easier for enforcement to count hooks. Third, in response to additional EC concerns, NIMS added language dictating that only artificial bait may be used in the water and carried on board. We didn't have the and carried on board part before. <laughs> Similar to this, NIMS also added language dictating that the hook requirement would apply to the number of hooks allowable in the water and on board. 
uh, in response to additional feedback from the EFP directors and the EC, NIMS plans to allow a limited number of spare hooks to be carried in excess of the 100 and 500 hook maximum limits. And this is to allow fishers to replace lost or broken hooks without having to return to port. Uh, last, in response to feedback from both the EC and the GAP, NIMS revised the definition of directed open access to be predicated on target fishing for ground fish as opposed to landing only ground fish. This change would ensure that ground fish fishers landing a small amount of other species would still be allowed to fish inside the non-trawl RCA and would also be subject to the forthcoming non-trawl logbook requirement, whether fishing inside or outside the non-trawl RCA. Um, and before I conclude, I'd just like to note that um, a lot of collaboration has gone into developing this proposal, and I'd like to thank everyone that has helped me. Uh, first, I want to thank the Enforcement Committee. They have spent a, a great deal of time with me on this report, both in their meetings and on calls, and I really appreciate their contributions. I also want to thank the GAP. Uh, they have been very kind to let me drop in and out of their meetings as I continually ask about different op options for the gear specifications. Uh, and I really appreciate their feedback and open conversation with me. Um, and last, I want to thank Healy, Brett, Jesse, and Todd for being continuous sounding boards as I've gone through what is now many iterations of this pr proposal. Uh, so that concludes my summary, and I'm happy to take any questions the council might have. Okay, thanks, Lynn. Uh, questions on the uh, NIMS report? Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Good morning. <clears throat> I. Lynn, I, I had a question last, I think it was last meeting we heard that the, the new logbooks, electronic logbooks that are gonna be mandatory coming forward would be included in this, I thought. Am I wrong or, or is, is that part of this or maybe it's just a separate component of it? Thank you for the question. Um, the log, the non-trial logbook will be implemented in a separate action uh, but the definition that we wrote for the directed open access sector is applicable to, to both the non trial logbook requirement and this management measure uh, in the spec section. So it kind of spans them both. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I believe so. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Further questions for Lynn? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Good morning, Lynn. Um, I appreciate your recap of the ongoing discussions that have occurred with the EC and the gap on the gear definition. Um, one note that is in the gap report uh, is a recommendation to consider uh, two different uh, declarations for each of these two EFP gears. Um, can you maybe update us on the viability of amending the VMS declarations in time for the effective date of uh, January 1, 2023, um, and, and what it would take to, to do that, and if that's something that um, you're examining internally? Thanks. Thank you for the question, Ms. Ms. Uramko. Um, Yes, we do plan to make new declarations for this management measure. Um, we are exploring internally uh, two different options for that in terms of which rulemaking to attach uh, a PRA uh, modification analysis to. Um, so worst case scenario, um, the new declaration changes come very early 2023, January or February. Uh, best case scenario, we have them uh, probably sometime in the late fall, early winter, uh, December timeframe. Uh, but we are uh, working internally with OLE to get those in place, and I expect that it should happen. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Lynn. That That's wonderful news. and just want to acknowledge the work going on behind the scenes. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marcy. Further questions? Okay, seeing that. Thank you, Len. Next up will be um, Heather Hall with the WDFW report. Heather. Thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. Um, good morning. I'll uh, walk through the WDFW report on this agenda item. Um, uh, 
uh, WDFW uh, started meeting with stakeholders uh, um, to talk about um, ground fish management measures for 2023 and 2024 in back in the fall of 2021 and, and as recently as uh, March of 2022 to get input on um, changes that would be needed to keep catch under ACLs uh, for the upcoming biennium. Uh, the real focus on those discussions was in Washington were on um, the need for uh, management changes, particularly for vermilion rockfish. Um, and under uh, F3, we know there are two ACL alternatives, which we looked at, uh, no action and alternative one. Um, but both of them, uh, both of the alternatives really um, set the component ABC at levels that have been below um, where the Washington Recreational Fishery Catch has been in recent years. Um, in our report and, and I think in other discussions, we've mentioned that um, catch projections uh, for this uh, biennium looking ahead were really impacted by um, changes to our sport fisheries uh, due to the pandemic. In 2020, um, many of our areas and recreational fisheries were just completely closed. And then um, going through 2020 and in a good part of 2021, um, there were actual port closures in Washington that extended to that entire time. So while we typically use the most recent catch for those years, which might have been 2021 and 2020 in our projections, uh, those values were um, a bit different. So there is maybe a, a different degree of uncertainty in our projected catch estimates, but um, just teeing that up. So in addition to management measures that we looked at for vermilion rockfish, uh, we also uh, will need to um, implement managed measures to reduce catch of copper rockfish and quillback rockfish, which are managed in the nearshore rockfish complex north of 4010. Um, and there's only one alternative for those under the no action alternative. Um, So the alternatives for Washington recreational fisheries really focus on retention restrictions. Um, none of the three species that we um, were really focused on are targeted. They're primarily caught incidentally when fishing for other species. And um, throughout our discussions, we have uh, really one uh, preliminary preferred alternative, but it impacts the um, um, retention for um, copper rockfish, quillback rockfish, and vermilion rockfish. So our PPA recommendation is to prohibit the retention of copper, quillback, and vermilion in the months of May, June, and July. Um, the Washington Recreational Fishery is not open year-round. It is already closed um, from mid-October through mid-March. So our fishery is open from um, in March to October, um, and it includes a daily bag limit of nine uh, with only a seven rockfish uh, sublimit within there. Um, we would maintain those uh, daily and sub bag limits um, and just focus on the pro prohibition of those three species. We did look at sublimits um, in addition to the nine rockfish bag limits. So for example, a one fish a limit for copper quillback and vermilion. But again, as I mentioned, since these species aren't really targeted, um, they already only um, occur in a daily bag limit at one or two fish. So the daily or the sublimits didn't really have uh, any effect on reducing catch. Um, we did look at um, the alternatives for vermilion rockfish that looked at a longer period of time where, pro where retention could be prohibited, but we really tried to balance that with the need for um, keeping some data flowing in for future stock assessments. We know these assessments on nearshore rockfish 
are highly dependent on um, fishery data. Uh, we do not have a nearshore commercial fishery, so recreational uh, catch data is the only um, fishery data that feeds into the stock assessments and so landed on the preferred alternative of, of limiting that no retention to just those months. And again, May, June, and July are really where there's a lot of effort in our recreational fisheries, so uh, it, it captures that. Um, and then uh, aligned that no retention for copper and quilt back with vermilion uh, so that they, it, it um, creates kind of a, a regulatory um, conformity. So it's the same across all three of those species that reduces confusion and, and hopes, help, hopefully helps with enforcement. Um, so in our report, as you um, go through it on page four is a look at um, where we have uh, our projected mortality for all species that in the Washington recreational fishery, including um, uh, vermilion, copper and quillback are described in there. And then a further breakdown of the alternatives that we looked at um, regarding retention restrictions for copper, quillback, and vermilion rockfish are summarized in an appendix on the on the last page. I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, questions for Heather? Okay, thanks Heather. Okay. Next up would be um, Maggie Summer in the uh, ODFW report. Maggie. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. ODFW report one has been in the briefing book since the advanced version. I will just summarize it. Uh, the intent was to provide information on how uh, we work through our state process to coordinate with the federal process on uh, recreational ground fish fishery uh, management and specifications in particular. Um, we, uh, in uh, summary, our state Fish and Wildlife Commission adopts federal ground fish regulations into state administrative rules and in addition considers uh, and usually adopts additional measures on top of that uh, to achieve specific conservation and fishery objectives in Oregon. And for example, uh, Oregon adopts sector specific harvest guidelines for all of our recreational uh, nearshore ground fish species. Um, and management measures for our commercial nearshore fishery, which operates under a state limited entry permit, as well as for our recreational fishery. We provide uh, quite a bit of background information on uh, not just the management process, but also our sampling uh, data availability for in-season management, some of the management tools we use in the state, which are uh, really the same set of tools we look at in the federal process. Um, and then we present uh, on page three, uh, what we are proposing, what would be the no action alternative for federal harvest, uh, pardon me, for federal management measures in 2023 and 2024 for Oregon's recreational fishery, uh, which would be maintaining the uh, uh, a, a, a year round season and the bag limits shown in figure one. It's a table. Uh, in figure one, pardon me, on page three. Uh, we then on, on page four at the top in figure two, for the council's information, just uh, also show what our state management measures are. They are a little bit more restrictive than the federal management measures. Uh, we work uh, generally under the federal measures as an umbrella and we can adjust state measures relatively uh, rapidly in state rule. We, again, our commission adopts annual measures um, on a preseason basis, and then we monitor uh, catch in the recreational fishery uh, intensively throughout the season and can make adjustments through our temporary rulemaking process. Uh, and it allows us to be um, uh, quite responsive to conservation and fishery needs. Uh, and then we speak specifically to quillback rockfish at the end of the report, um, noting that we have prohibited uh, through state rule retention in all uh, uh, all fisheries in Oregon, except the trawl individual quota fishery, um, in which there is, is 
they're extremely low amounts of catch uh, pullback rockfish anyway, and we certainly anticipate continuing that prohibition into 2023 and 2024. Uh, for other rules, uh, as usual, our staff will go through uh, a process to examine data and go through a relatively intensive monitoring process to make recommendations to our commission on state bag limits and other measures uh, for each year. So the bottom line uh, here is that for the federal management measures in 2023 and 2024, uh, we are proposing moving forward with a no action alternative uh, shown in the table on page three. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Maggie. Questions for Maggie on the ODFW report? Okay. Now do the uh, CDFW report. I'll turn to uh, Marcy Rimko. Marcy. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, we will have Melanie Parker of our CDFW groundfish uh, staff. Uh, present um, a number of CDFW reports to you this morning. Um, you've met Melanie previously in discussions on ground for specifications, um, and she's a critical member of our project uh, and our uh, recreational ground fish and halibut monitoring team. So with that, good morning, Melanie. Good morning. Um, Mr. Vice Chair, Ms. Yeremko, and council members, as Marcy stated, I am Melanie Parker with CDFW, and this morning I will be reading uh, Supplemental Report 1 and summarizing Reports 2, 3, and 4, and then uh, CDFW Report 5, which is making its way into the briefing book right now, um, Jason Krauss will address that. Agenda Item F4A, Supplemental CDFW Report 1, April 2022. California Department of Fish and Wildlife report on preliminary preferred management alternatives for 2023 and 2024. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife offers the following recommendations for council consideration as preliminary preferred alternative management measures for the 2023-24 biennium. CDFW met remotely with stakeholders on January 27th, February 24th, March 23rd, March 30th, 2022 to discuss harvest specifications and management measure options, and to solicit input in order to develop preferred alternatives for sport and commercial fisheries. And here I'll pause just to direct your attention to um, CDFW reports two, three, and four. These are provided for informational purposes. They were handouts that were prepared for the March 23rd meeting with our stakeholders. Uh, Report two provides a management and catch history for yellow eye rockfish in California from 2005 through 2021. And reports three and four provide a management and catch history for quillback rockfish and copper rockfish from 2012 through 2021. Um, there's a lot of really interesting information in there about um, catch trends and just the uh, season structures through the years for our ground fish fisheries off of California. CDFW anticipates further discussion will be needed with stakeholders between now and June to inform the council's final actions, specifically on California recreational measures. CDFW also anticipates the need for these discussions to continue beyond June and that in-season actions during 2023 and 2024 may be appropriate to address newly available fishery data and discard mortality rates or unforeseen events as they arise in the new biennium. State and federal management jurisdiction. Overwinter discussions with the National Marine Fisheries Service indicated a need to further specify which management measures are intended for use in federal waters and or state waters as NIMS only has management jurisdiction over federal waters. CDFW has routinely taken action through its state rulemaking process to ensure state regulations for groundfish are consistent with the federal regulations for groundfish to allow for ease of enforcement and reduced angler confusion. The state rule implementing the council's recommended management measures into regulations for 2023-24 is expected to be effective on or around January 1, 2023. CalCOD ACT limit south of 4010 north latitude. CDFW supports a PPA that removes the precautionary 50 metric ton ACT as described in groundfish management, 
Management Team Report 1, F4A, GMT Report 1, April 2022. CDFW supports the status quo trawl, 36%, and non-trawl, 64%, allocation proportions for CalCOD, utilizing a 50-50 sharing agreement within the non-trawl sectors, limited entry and open access, and recreational, and setting ACTs for each non-trawl sector. Retention in the non-trawl sector will continue to be prohibited, except for California commercial passenger fishing vessels participating in CDFW's CalCOD exempted fishery permit. Commercial fishery, copper and coalback rockfish. CDFW supports a PPA maintaining the 2022 sub-trip limits of 75 pounds per two months for copper rockfish and 75 pounds per two months for coalback rockfish within the minor nearshore rockfish trip limits in the area between 42 and 4010 North Latitude and 75 pounds per two months for copper rockfish and 75 pounds per two months for coalback rockfish within the deeper nearshore rockfish trip limits south of 4010 North Latitude, i.e. status quo, for the 2023-24 management cycle. CDFW agrees with the points made in section 2.8.2 of agenda item F4, attachment two, April 22, regarding the contributing factors that would inherently keep mortality of copper and coalback rockfish to a minimum. Those factors include the limited closed class of participants in the deeper nearshore fishery and the effort shift toward other species covered under the deeper nearshore fishery permit as a means to continue providing product to the live fish market. Furthermore, CDFW supports maintaining status quo trip limits until sufficient discard mortality data are collected to better inform trip limit models. As noted in section 2.8.2 and in agenda item E7A, Supplemental CDFW Report 2, November 2021, there is a high degree of uncertainty in the projected impacts as the modeling likely overprojected the estimated discard mortality. Therefore, maintaining status quo trip limits is advisable until data become available to better inform managers of the effects of the sub-trip limits, at which time adjustments to the sub-trip limits could be considered through in-season action. Lastly, CDFW sees merit in the continuation of these minimal retention sub-trip limits for copper and quillback rockfish to allow for fishery-dependent data collection, specifically biological data. It is extremely important for future stock assessments to maintain the flow of data as data gaps would add to greater uncertainty in the results of future assessments. Non-bottom contact hook and line gear allowance in the non-trawl RCA. CDFW supports a PPA of option one as described in section 11.1, .1, agenda item F4, attachment two, April 2022. Under option one, vessels in the commercial non-trawl sectors open access, limited entry fixed gear, and IFQ gear switchers would be allowed to use non-bottom contact hook and line gear within the non-trawl RCA. Use of vertical hook and line gear anchored to the bottom, dingle bar, and long line gear would remain prohibited within the non-trawl RCA. Additionally, CDFW is encouraged by the efforts from NIMS, enforcement, and industry to further refine the definitions pertaining to the allowable gear types and trip declarations. CDFW looks forward to the outcome of this collaboration and the updates to the analytical document in June. Recreational fishery, recreational fishery season structure. CDFW proposes the following range of recreational ground fish fishery season structure scenarios for the 2023-2024 biennium as a PPA. This PPA was crafted following discussions with interested stakeholders and the management measures have all been analyzed within the draft integrated alternatives analytical document. Agenda item F4, attachment two, uh, April, 2022. CDFW will continue to work with the Groundfish Advisory Subpanel members and other industry representatives to solidify recommendations in preparation of final action at the June council meeting. All of the scenarios depicted below would be a substantial departure from the status quo and that all of them result in a significant reduction in fishing time in nearshore waters of 50% or more. The severe reductions are necessary to incorporate the best scientific information available from the 2021 stock assessments and rebuilding analyses completed for quillback and copper rockfishes off California. Under status quo, 
California's nearshore waters in each of the five ground fish management areas are open between eight and 10 months of the year. The proposed 2023-24 season structure scenarios all propose a reduced range of nearshore fishing opportunities that span from a minimum of two to a maximum of five months, depending on the area. CDFW has been working with stakeholders over winter to examine possible alternatives to mitigate for the severe losses in nearshore fishery opportunities that are necessary to reduce catch and bycatch of these two nearshore rockfish species, such as an offshore fishery as described in agenda item E9A, Supplemental CDFW Report 1, March 2022. Projected impacts under these scenarios were calculated using the established wreckfish catch projection model and are highly uncertain. Projections include impacts for quillback and copper rockfish under one fish and zero fish, no retention, sub bag limits as described in the bag limit section of this document. See the model and catch projection uncertainty section of this document for additional information. Scenario one, seasons would be uniform with opening and closing season dates and depth constraints across all management areas. In other words, statewide. The fishery would be closed January and February, open seaward of the 50 fathom RCA line, referred to as the offshore fishery from March through May and October through December and open in all depths from June through September. During the offshore fishery months, retention of nearshore rockfish Cabazon and Greenling is prohibited. Lingcod is open in the same months and depths as the shelf and slope rockfish. Scorpionfish, sand dabs, other flatfish, petroli sole, starry flounder, leopard shark, and other ground fish are open year round at all depths. Here I'll take a little time to orient you to table one. We have several tables in this document that follow the same structure. Uh, previously, when we've provided tables uh, proposing season structures for ground fish. The rows have contained our five management areas with the columns marching across the table the months. Um, we have instead of management areas here, the rows relate to specific species or species groups. Uh, typically, all of our ground fish season structures have been aligned with the rockfish cabazon green wing complex, the RCG complex. Um, here, because of the need to reduce impacts and avoid encounters with quillback and copper rockfishes, we have had to consider uh, pulling apart this RCG complex and decoupling the season structures for some other ground fish species from our nearshore species. So the nearshore rockfish, Cabzon and Greenling, um, would have one set of seasons, which you can see here, um, is closed from January through May. It is open at all depths from June through September, and then again closed October through December. Whereas the shelf and slope rockfish and lingcod would be closed January and February, would be open um, seaward of the 50 fathom RCA line, again, that offshore fishery from March through May. And then the same as the nearshore rockfish, Cabazon and Greenlings would be open at all depths from June through September. And then that offshore fishery again, just for the shelf slope and lingcod, um, October through December. Uh, California scorpion fish, Pacific sand dabs and other flatfish, Petroli sole and starry flounder currently are open at, um, year round. Um, so that would be a continuation. Uh, leopard shark and other ground fish, um, this would be a decoupling of their seasons from the RCG structure. And then while California sheephead and ocean whitefish are not included in the federal FMP, they are state managed species. Historically, their season structures have also been coupled to that of ground fish. Um, through state action, we expect that those season structures for those species will no longer be coupled to those with uh, ground fish. They will have a separate season structure that we will determine through our state rulemaking package. Table two provides some projected recreational impacts for select ground fish under season structure scenario one. Uh, quillback and copper rockfish projected impacts are shown for a one fish bag outside of brackets and a zero fish bag or no retention inside of brackets. 
um, because the yellow eye rockfish under this scenario is projected to be 14.5 uh, metric tons. Um, that is over the harvest guideline by a couple of metric tons. Uh, Coolback rockfish is north and south of 4010, um, would be approximately 2.3 metric tons under one fish, 3.5 metric tons south of 4010 under one fish. Copper rockfish, again, with status quo regs, would be about 3.1 metric tons uh, north of 4010 and 105.9 metric tons south of 4010. Calicod is projected to be 7.8 metric tons and canary rockfish, 116.5 metric tons. Again, there is increased uncertainty with these projections for all of the scenarios, and uh, I'll speak about more of our projection uncertainty with our model later on in this uh, document. Scenario 1A is the same as scenario one, except no offshore fishery opportunities are provided. Um, we had heard some concern about uh, safety and access to offshore fisheries. And so we offer each of our scenarios with an offshore fishery and also without an offshore fishery. Uh, impacts under scenario 1A uh, are Similar to those under scenario one, um, they are reduced for yellow eye rockfish, cow cod and canary rockfish, um, also copper rockfish south of 4010. There is um, a significant reduction in projected impacts. Um, there's a, a substantial amount of copper rockfish that are caught in um, our southern area of our state that come from waters deeper than 50 fathoms, so that um, no longer offering the offshore fishery um, would result in and reduced mortality. Scenario two, seasons would be uniform with opening and closing season dates and depth constraints across all management areas. The fishery would be closed in January and February, open seaward of the 50 fathom RCA line from March through June and September through December, and open in all depths for July and August only. During the offshore fishery, retention of nearshore rockfish, cabazon, and greenling is prohibited. Lingcod is open in the same months and depths as the shelf and slope rockfish, scorpionfish, sand dab, and other flatfish, petroli sole, starry flounder, leopard shark, and other groundfish are open year-round at all depths. Um, so table five shows um, scenario two um, season structure in a tabular format. The main difference between scenario one and scenario two is the time that is offered in um, our near shore or the all depth fishery. Under scenario one, four months are offered and under scenario two, it is only two months in July and August only. Table six shows projected impacts similar to um, what we showed under um, scenario one. Projected impacts under scenario two for yellow eye rockfish are 12.3 metric tons. Coolback rockfish with a one fish bag north of 4010 is 1.7 metric tons. South of 4010 with a one fish bag, two metric tons. Copper rockfish north of 4010 is 2.1 metric tons. South of 4010, 67.6 metric tons, again with a one fish bag. Cow cod, 7.4 metric tons, and canary rockfish, 93.7 metric tons. Scenario 2A is the same as scenario 2, again, without inclusion of an offshore fishery. So the impacts for our uh, rockfish and link cod do come from the all-depth fishery only in July and August. Um, so yellow eye impacts are 7.9. Coolback rockfish under a one fish bag north of 4010 would be 1.7 metric tons. South of 4010, 1.9 metric tons. Copper rockfish with a one fish bag north of 4010 would be 2.1 metric tons. South of 4010, 45.3 metric tons. Cow cod, 1.3 metric tons. And canary rockfish, 51.1 metric tons. Scenario three. Seasons would be uniform with opening and closing season dates and depth constraints across all management areas and offers all depth fishing between Memorial Day and Labor Day holiday weekends. The fishery is closed January through March and open seaward of the 50 fathom RCA line from April 1 through May 26 in 2023 and April 1 through May 24 in 2024. And then from September 5th 
2023 and September 3rd in 2024 through December 31. And the fishery is open in all depths from May 27th in 2023 and May 25th in 2024, which is the Memorial Day holiday weekend, through September 4th in 2023 and September 2 in 2024, which is the Labor Day holiday weekend. In all areas of the state, during months that an offshore fishery is active, retention of nearshore rockfish, cabazon, and greenlings is prohibited. Lingcod is open in the same months and depths as shelf and slope rockfish, scorpionfish, sand abs, and other flatfish, petrolley sole and starry flounder, leopard shark, and other groundfish are open year-round at all depths. And Table 9 uh, displays that information in tabular format, so you can see that there would be uh, a little bit more than three months of fishing at all depths um, from the Memorial Day weekend holiday at the end of May through the Labor Day uh, holiday weekend at the beginning of September. And table 10 shows projected impacts under scenario three. Uh, yellow eye rockfish is projected to be 12.6 metric tons. Quillback rockfish north of 4010 under a one fish bag would be 2.1 metric tons and south of 4010, 3.3 metric tons. Copper rockfish under a one fish bag north of 4010 is projected to be 2.7 metric tons, and south of 4010, 88.7 metric tons. Cow cod, uh, 6.4 metric tons, and canary rockfish, 96.9 metric tons. Scenario 3A is the same as scenario three, again, without that offshore opportunity. Um, so the only fishing for rockfish and lingcod would be the all-depth fishery between the Memorial Day weekend and Labor Day weekend. And Table 12 shows impacts under 3A. Um, yellow rockfish is slightly reduced compared to uh, just Scenario 3 um, at 10.3 metric tons. There's not much change to quillback rockfish uh, impacts under this option compared to just Scenario 3. Copper rockfish under a one fish bag north of 4010, uh, 2.7 metric tons, and south of 4010, 67.4 metric tons. Cow cod impacts would be 2.3, and canary rockfish, 72.8 metric tons. Scenario four, seasons differ north and south of Pigeon Point, which is 3711 north latitude. In the northern management area, uh, between 42 north latitude and 4010 north latitude, the Mendocino Management Area, 4010 North Latitude to 3857.5 North Latitude, and the San Francisco Management Area, 3857.5 North Latitude to 3711 North Latitude. The fishery is closed January through March and open seaward of the 50 Fathom RCA line, which is the offshore fishery, from April through June and then December, and is open in all depths from July through November. In the central management area, 3711 North Latitude to 3427 North Latitude, and the southern management area, 3427 North Latitude to the U.S.-Mexico border. The fishery is closed January and February, open seaward of the 50 Fathom RCA line from March through April, and then October through December. It is open in all depths from May through September. In all areas of the state, during months that an offshore fishery is active, retention of nearshore rockfish, cabazon, and greenlings is prohibited. Lingcod is open in the same months and depths as the shelf and slope rockfish, scorpionfish, sand abs, and other flatfish, petrolley sole and starry flounder, leopard shark, and other groundfish are open year-round at all depths. Table 13 uh, shows the season structure um, just described for the northern Mendocino and San Francisco management areas. Um, so you can see that an all-depth fishery would be provided from July through November, and that offshore fishery would be available from April through June, and then in the month of December. And Table 14 shows season structure under Scenario 4 in the central and southern management areas. The all-depth fishery is shifted um, to be from May through September with an offshore fishery offered um, March and April and then from October through December. Projected impacts under scenario four, uh, yellow eye rockfish would be 14.8 metric tons. Quillback rockfish would be under a one fish bag north of 4010, 2.3 metric tons and south of 4010, 3.2 metric tons. 
copper rockfish north of 4010 with a one fish bag, 3.0 metric tons, and south of 4010, 129.1 metric tons. Cow cod is projected to be eight metric tons, and canary rockfish, 122.3 metric tons. Scenario 4A. Again, the scenario is the same as scenario four, except no offshore fishery opportunities are provided. And so the only RCG and lingcod fishing would be um, for the northern Mendocino and San Francisco areas, as described in table 16, between July and November. And then in table 17, for the central and southern management areas, the RCG and lingcod opportunities would occur between May and September only. And table 18 uh, provides projected impacts under scenario 4A, COI rockfish at 11.7 metric tons, uh, coalback rockfish impacts north and south of 4010 are the pro approximately the same as under uh, scenario 4. Uh, copper rockfish under one fish bag is 3 metric tons north of 4010 and 106.9 metric tons south of 4010. Calcon is projected to be 3.8 metric tons and canary rockfish 96.5 metric tons. Sub bag limits, coolback rockfish. CDFW does not have a recommended sub bag limit PPA for coolback rockfish at this time, but did analyze impacts under each scenario above under status quo, which is one fish and no retention, zero fish sub bag limits. Copper rockfish. CDFW does not have a recommended sub bag limit PPA for copper rockfish at this time, but did analyze impacts under each scenario above under status quo, one fish, and no retention, zero fish sub bag limits. Vermilion rockfish. CDFW supports a PPA that is the status quo vermilion rockfish sub bag limit of four fish within the 10 fish RCG daily bag and possession limit. CDFW expects the status quo bag limit, changes to season structure as described above, and in-season catch tracking and monitoring will provide the necessary management tools to keep vermilion rockfish mortality from exceeding the species-specific ACL or OFL contribution to the minor shelf rockfish complex. No retention of select species during offshore fisheries. During offshore groundfish fisheries, as proposed in scenarios one, two, three, and four in the recreational fishery season structure section of this document, retention of nearshore rockfish, which is defined as black, blue, black and yellow, brown, china, copper, calico, gopher, kelp, grass, olive, coolback, and treefish rockfishes, cabazon, and greenlings would be prohibited. It is expected most nearshore rockfish, cabazon, and greenlings would not be encountered or only be encountered rarely in the directed groundfish fishery occurring seaward of 50 fathoms. Prohibiting retention of all nearshore rockfish, cabazon, and greenlings during the times the offshore groundfish fishery is open, but the nearshore groundfish fishery is closed, is critical for effective enforcement of the nearshore groundfish fishery closure. It is expected this element of the regulations would be implemented via state rule as most nearshore waters inside 50 fathoms fall within the state waters jurisdictional line. Bycatch of nearshore rockfish in state managed fisheries. Recreational fisheries for several other non ground fish species occur statewide or in certain portions of the state. Many of these fisheries are state managed. Anglers participating in these other recreational fisheries may retain groundfish on the same trip, but must abide by all applicable groundfish regulations. The groundfish impacts that occur in the non-groundfish recreational fisheries are currently accounted for within the California Recreational Groundfish Fishery Impacts, as mortality estimates are produced for individual groundfish species, irrespective of the regulations, or whether groundfish was a primary or secondary target or if the fishery was closed. CDFW does expect incidental release mortality of nearshore groundfish species in conjunction with these state managed fisheries when the nearshore groundfish fishery is closed in the 23-24 biennium. However, there is little data to inform analysis because past fishing regulations have generally allowed groundfish targeting and retention at times and in areas when these fisheries are prosecuted. 
Non-ground fish fisheries for which mortality of ground fish occurs includes, but is not limited to, California sheephead, ocean whitefish, yellowtail, white sea bass, California halibut, Pacific halibut, sand basses, and ocean salmon. An estimate of ground fish bycatch in non-ground fish fisheries is not available as the California Recreational Fisheries Survey Program does not generate estimates of bycatch in species-specific target fisheries. Estimates are made at the trip type level, and trip types are generalized as bottom fish, salmon, HMS, and inshore. Analysis of surf sample data is included in the Integrated Alternatives Analytical Document, Agenda Item F4, Attachment 2, April 2022, and found that on average, a minimum of 0.2 metric tons of quillback rockfish statewide could be expected as bycatch from anglers targeting lingcod, with at least some trace amount of quillback rockfish in the Pacific halibut and California halibut fisheries. At least 5.6 metric tons of copper rockfish bycatch occurs annually in non-RCG fisheries in California in the Southern Management Area, where state managed nearshore non-ground fish fishery activity is highest. Actual bycatch of quillback and copper rockfish in these non-ground fish fisheries is expected to be substantially higher than the projected minimum values provided here, but cannot currently be quantified. Model and catch projection uncertainty. The anticipated mortality of select ground fish species in the California recreational fishery under various season structure options is projected using, using the RecFish model. The model was developed in 2004 with subsequent augmentation of monthly catch by depth and time parameters. RecFish allows projection of catch by depth and season length independently in each of the five California ground fish management areas. The RecFish model is a catch-based model as opposed to an effort-based model and has previously been reviewed by the SSC. While the RecFish model is the best available science, there are some known uncertainties which are explained here. For some species, few data are available to inform the model, which is particularly the case for species with deeper depth distributions, such as the shelf and slope rockfish species, or species for which retention is prohibited or encounters are infrequent. For these species and depth bins, projected impacts may vary substantially from actual impacts. Recreational fishing regulations off California have allowed virtually no recreational fishing activity, activity in deep water for more than 20 years. The model assumes that the management measures, fishing behavior, and ocean conditions during the historic period will be representative of the current fishery. It also assumes the management measures, fishing behavior, and ocean conditions during the historic period and current fishery will be representative of those under proposed management measures. If significant changes to management measures are made to the fishery, or if large shifts in angler behavior or ocean conditions occur, substantial changes to the actual fishery impacts may result, which the model cannot predict. The historic catch data informing the model for 2023-24 are from 2017 through 2019 and January through October 2021. During these times, the bag limit for copper and quillback rockfish was 10 fish within the 10 fish RCG daily bag and possession limit. In November 2021, the Council recommended and NIMS approved reductions to bag limits for quillback and copper rockfishes from 10 fish to one fish within the RCG daily bag and possession limit, effective January 1, 2022. The projections of total mortality produced in November 2021 are likely overestimates of total mortality. However, no new catch information has become available since that time to update projected mortality. As the 2022 fisheries progress, new information will become available. Unfortunately, this information will not be available in time to inform the recommendations that must be made at the April and June Council meetings on the season structure and additional management measures for 2023-24. The greatest sources of model projection uncertainty include the reductions in 2022 from a 10 fish to a one fish bag in the RCG complex for quillback and copper rockfish is not something the model predicts well. Copper rockfish was a target species during the time period used in the projection model, not a species to avoid. 
This change will impact angler behavior in ways the model cannot predict. The model is inherently uncertain whenever significant changes to regulations are made. The management measures pr proposed by CDFW in this report are a radical departure from the past and current management measures and introduce the greatest source of uncertainty to projecting impacts as fishing would occur in completely new areas that haven't been accessed by the recreational fishery in two decades. New depth dependent mortality release rates are in development by the GMT and are expected to be available for use and management later in 2022. It is expected application of these new rates will change the discard mortality in both the formal monthly surfs estimates and subsequently in the wreck fish model catch projections. In season monitoring and management response. For the reasons discussed above, CDFW believes the catch projections provided are highly uncertain and for quillback and copper rockfish are expected to be over projections. CDFW tracks groundfish mortality in season on a weekly and or monthly basis to ensure that mortality remains within allowable limits. Several rockfish species of concern, yellow eye rockfish, copper rockfish, quillback rockfish, and black rockfish are tracked on a weekly basis using surf field reports. Beginning in 2022, the list of species was expanded to include quillback and copper rockfish as a result of new stock status information. Data on observed and released fish from weekly surf reports are converted into an anticipated catch value in metric tons using catch and effort data from previous years. Weekly ACV data are used as proxy values to approximate catch during the five to eight week lag time between when data are collected and when surf's catch estimates become available. ACVs have proven to be an effective and reliable tool to closely monitor recreational in-season mortality on a weekly basis. The Council might be most familiar with CDFW's ACV methodology because of its application to in-season Pacific halibut quota monitoring, but the approach originated out of the need to track overfish species attainment, yellow eye and cow cod, in California's recreational groundfish fisheries many years ago. CDFW also performs monthly tracking of non-overfish species, such as vermilion and canary rockfish, using surf estimates produced throughout the year. These species tend to be encountered at a much higher frequency than yellow-eye rockfish and quillback rockfish, thousands of fish per week as opposed to tens of fish. The volume of data associated with these species makes it much more challenging to summarize and track on a more frequent basis than monthly. So CDFW prioritizes the use of ACV methodology to only those species that are constraining or need close monitoring to ensure catches stay within allowable limits, such as yellow eye and Pacific halibut. Monthly tracking has proven effective at keeping catches of the remaining species within allowable limits. In-season tracking reports are provided by CDFW to the council at each council meeting. To date, CDFW's weekly and monthly tracking processes have been an effective and reliable tool to closely monitor recreational in-season mortality and provides timely and accurate information to apply in-season adjustments, such as changes to depth limits, season length, or bag limits to fisheries if needed. The CDFW proposed PPAs within this document were developed to reduce total mortality of quillback rockfish and copper rockfish in response to best scientific information newly available in 2021. Both quillback rockfish and copper rockfish continue to be managed within the minor nearshore rockfish complexes, both north and south of 4010 North Latitude, and species within complexes are managed to the complex ACL. If mortality of these species in season reaches or is projected to exceed ACTs or other harvest limits, Fishery managers may confer to consider the risk to the resource and the socioeconomics of the fishery to determine if in-season management action is warranted to slow or stop fishing further mortality from occurring. CDFW also reaffirms its commitment to keeping mortality of yellow eye rockfish, the only remaining rebuilding stock in the FMP within the California Recreational HG by using in-season monitoring and reporting methods described above. And with that, I'll take questions. Okay. Well, thank you, Melanie, for a pretty thorough uh, report there. Um, questions for Melanie? 
Marcy, you're up to. Um, not, not so much a question, but just a comment. Um, we recognize the length of the report, um, but the length of the report reflects the amount of work um, and time and effort that we've spent on this issue uh, since approving the new stock assessments for copper and quillback rockfish, which are primarily targeted and taken in our California recreational fishery. Um, so we've done our best here to disclose the extent of the changes that are under consideration in the PPA and um, appreciate uh, the council's um, acknowledgement of the, uh, the changes that will be necessary. And we've done our best to disclose that in full detail here. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Further questions or comments? Okay. Thank you, Melanie. And uh, next up, I guess, uh, Jason Krause, I believe, with uh, CDFW report number five. Jason? Hey, good morning. Mic check? Yes, you're good to go. Great. All right. Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair and Council members. My name is Jason Krause, and I'm a lieutenant with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife Law Enforcement Division and a member of the Enforcement Consultants. I'll be reading agenda item F4A, Supplemental CDFW Report 2. And I wanted to note that I'm presenting this for California. And while I am California's representative on the enforcement consultants, I want to be clear that this is not something the enforcement consultants have reviewed. Right. California Department of Fish and Wildlife report on preliminary preferred management alternatives for 2023 and 2024. The enforcement consultants from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife have identified another waypoint in need of correction upon additional review of the 100,000 non troll rockfish conservation area boundary line currently specified in regulations of California, excuse me, of Anacapa Island, the Northern Channel Islands, and the Southern California Bay. The enforcement consultants from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife request the new latitude and longitudes identified in Table 1 be included with number 2 on the action item checklist, RCA coordinates update, and its preliminary preferred alternative. The waypoint identified cuts off a portion of the 100,000 depth contour on the east end of Anacapa Island there's approximately one square mile of the 100,000 depth contour that lies seaward of the RSA boundary line specified in regulation. Uh, I believe this is supposed to be closed. But this closing area creates confusion among anglers and strains enforcement resources. The proposed modification would better align the RSA boundary line with the depth contour, lessening the burden on enforcement resources. This concludes the report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jason. Questions for Jason uh, on CDFW report number five? Okay, not seeing any. Thanks, Jason. And actually, maybe I skipped over Melody's reports two through four, which I believe are informational sheets as far as IDing the different rockfish species. I don't know if uh, you want to cover that also, uh, Marcy. I'm sorry. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Melanie did refer to uh, those three handouts in her discussion of CDFW Report 1, um, but we felt it important to include the historic background of our management measures that we've had in effect since uh, the early 2000s. It's useful for stakeholders to be able to review performance of the fisheries on these three critical stocks. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Okay, um, next will be the uh, one of the, the first of the GMT presentations, and, uh, Whitney Roberts. Whitney. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, making sure you can hear me? We can. Great. Good morning, uh, and good morning, members of the council. Uh, Whitney Roberts here with the GMT. Um, so before I jump into the first of our presentations, um, I would like to summarize GMT Supplemental Report 2, if that's okay with the Council. It's been in the briefing book for a while now, although it is supplemental, um, and it's only two pages. So um, I do have a quick summary prepared that I can just walk through and then jump into presentation one, if that works for you, Mr. Vice Chair. It, it does. Great, perfect. Um, so the GMT Supplemental Report 2 um, is on Pacific Spiny Dogfish Spatial Management Measures. Um, and as you'll remember, yesterday the Council selected no action as the FPA for Pacific Spiny Dogfish Harvest Specifications, and that will set um, lower ACLs in 2023 and 2024 that have been, then have been um, historically uh, in place and um, that in, in 
prompted some council interest in looking at spatial tools to mitigate spiny dogfish bycatch in 2023 and beyond. Um, spiny dogfish are largely caught as bycatch by the midwater trawl gear um, with particularly high concentrations of catch in the fall and winter months off of northern areas of the west coast um, with abundance declining as you move southward. Um, the GMT notes that there are some gaps in in-season tracking, um, specifically with regard to bottom trawl discards um, in the IFQ fishery, because there is some catch by bottom trawl gear as well, um, albeit, not, albeit not the majority. Um, and the GMT also just notes that industry measures may be nimbler and more responsive than any spatial measures put in place. Um, but with all of that said, um, the intent of this supplemental report too is to signal to the council the GMT's intent to um, analyze the use of block area closures for groundfish miti bycatch mitigation purposes by both midwater and bottom trawl gear off of all three states, um, noting that block area closures for bottom trawl gear are already available off Oregon and California. So we would only be looking at the bottom trawl gear component off of Washington um, as part of the analysis. Um, and this analysis for um, bottom trawl gear can also be tiered off of Amendment 28 um, because the inclusion off of Washington was in the range of alternatives for Amendment 28, but was not selected um, as final action. So. Um, the, however, the midwater trawl gear component of block area closures for groundfish bycatch mitigation um, has been added to the action item checklist as a new management measure for this meeting because it has not been previously analyzed. Um, and it, the, the GMT will provide this analysis for block area closures in June um, and will, it, it will largely be qualitative with a focus toward building a general framework from which the GMT and the council can look at more um, specific uh, analysis in season if um, spiny dogfish or other groundfish catches become a concern. Um, and just to note that the although the the uh, what triggered this interest is of course spiny dogfish, um, the GMT's intent is to make the scope of this analysis applicable to all groundfish bycatch um, and uh, to make the scope applicable to both bottom trawl and midwater trawl gear for equity reasons, um, noting, as I said, the, the gaps in in-season tracking um, and the inability to uh, specifically accurately estimate the um, contribution of bycatch from either gear type in the trawl sector. Um, and then lastly, the GMT didn't see merit in further analyzing um, bycatch reduction areas for groundfish bycatch mitigation purposes by bottom trawl gear um, because the bycatch reduction areas are only bound by depth contours, not by latitude as the BACs are. And so the GMT believed that these would be too broad of a measure to um, accomplish the council's objective for these bycatch mitigation purposes for groundfish. Um, so that summarizes Supplemental GMT Report 2, um, and I'm happy to take any questions on that report before I move to Presentation 1. Okay, questions for Whitney? I'm not seeing any hands, so you're good to go. Great, thank you. Um, so I will be sharing my screen, and um, give me a second while I do that. It says I cannot share screen um, right now, so I may need privileges. I think they're working on here, so just uh, okay. All right, our control tower says you're you should be good to go. Okay, great. Should be. So, are you seeing the presentation mode or the notes? We're seeing both right now. Both. Okay. Um, interesting. Let me try that again. Are you seeing? Still seeing both? Perfect. It's. It's. Okay. It's, yep. You're good to go. Yep. Good okay. Go. Great. That was easier than I expected. Glad to hear. Um, so I will be presenting Supplemental GMT Presentation 1, 
Um, and this accompanies supplemental GMT report three, which covers action items two through 11. Um, and then action items 12 through 18 will be covered in the presentation two, which Katie will give. So uh, number three, well, it's starting off with number three. Number two is, um, I believe, the RCA modifications, and that's um, briefly described in our report, so that can be referenced there. But starting with number three, um, off the top deductions, um, the research component setting off the top deductions, uh, the GMT recommends continuing to use the historical maximum for all species except for these two listed here, cow cod south of 4010 um, and yellow eye rockfish. And for cow cod, the uh, set aside was set in 2021 and 22 at 10 metric tons for research. And um, the GMT doesn't expect any new research needs, um, but there is a great need for additional data and there are possible actions that could allow additional research needs in the future. Um, so the GMT doesn't see, see any merit to changing that value and recommends continuing to use that 10 metric tons for the next biennium. Um, for yellow eye rockfish, uh, similar, there are no expected changes to research needs for yellow eye. Um, and we list here uh, those research needs that will be continuing in the next biennium and set and recommend setting that 2.92 metric tons for yellow eye rockfish. The second part of off the top deductions includes incidental open access. Um, and for this, the GMT recommends uh, continuing to use the historical maximum for all species except for the five listed here. Uh, for dark blotched rockfish, um, even with some recent high incidental open access bycatch, the GMT notes that the ACL is not at risk um, and recommends continuing to use this 9.8 metric tons which is based on the historical average as opposed to the historical maximum. For Petrali sole, um, again, this is the using the historical max average instead of the historical maximum. Um, for Petrali, we recommend the 11.1 .1 metric tons, um, and this one could free up some Petrali sole for the IFQ fishery, which is an important species for that fishery. Um, and then Sablefish South, uh, the the 25 metric tons that's been used as the GMT best estimate isn't expected to constrain any other fisheries, but actions with the non troll RCA could increase incidental open access mortality. So recommending that 25 metric tons um, for yellow eye rockfish. This is based on the average of years that have been uh, observed in the directed Pacific halibut fishery. Um, and so that is 2.66 metric tons. Um, and then similarly for the nearshore rockfish north complex, that is also based on the average years observed in the directed Pacific halibut fishery, and that would be 1.3 metric tons. Lastly, for off the top deductions is the exempt, exempted fishing permits. Um, the GMT has not received any notification of potential changes. Um, so we recommend adopting the uh, amounts that are listed in appendix one of GMT report three. Moving on to tribal set-asides, the GMT recommends uh, adopting the status quo set-asides uh, proposed by the tribes, noting these two um, divergences from the 2021 set-asides uh, for dark blotch rockfish and Pacific Ocean perch. In um, November, the GMT provided a table of the downstream impacts um, from the increase of the Pacific Ocean perch it, uh, set aside and did not anticipate any constraints to non-treaty fisheries. Um, and then for dark blotched rockfish, this could alleviate some constraints to tribal fisheries. Number five is uh, annual catch targets. Um, there are two stocks that we highlight here, cow cod south of 4010. Um, the GMT recommends removing the 50 metric ton ACT, which is option one. And then the rationale for that is outlined in the supplemental GMT report one. Um, and then for quillback and copper rock fishes off California, um, the attachment to analysis um, section five outlines a, uh, an ACT setting methodology that is based on percentage reductions of 25%, 50%, or 75%. Um, but the there are some other, there are two other potential methods that the GMT highlights in our uh, supplemental report three. 
Um, the first one is setting the ACT equal to the ACL contribution. And then the second one is um, setting the ACT equal to a more conservative SPR harvest rate from the California Quillback and Copper Rockfish, re or, sorry, the Quillback Rockfish Rebuilding Analysis only. There's not a rebuilding analysis for copper. So this second one would only apply to Quillback Rockfish. Um, however, the GMT does note that it's difficult to manage to those low harvest targets that are less estimated to be less than two metric tons and has concerns with the small sample sizes. Um, however, the GMT would monitor in season and the council should consider what routine management measures would be appropriate if the ACT were to be exceeded. Um, and those potential management measures include trip limits, bag limits, and seasons. Um, so moving on, number six is the two-year trawl, non-trawl allocations. Um, I'll show those amounts on the next slide, but the GMT recommends, recommends status quo allocation shares for all of these stocks. And those are listed in table two of GMT report three, which is shown here now. Um, and those are just for reference, I won't go through them, but those are the status quo two-year trawl, non-trawl allocation shares. And you'll note the custom sharing approach for slope rockfish south of 4010. Um, I'll go more into that at a later item as well for black Hill rockfish. Number seven is the Amendment 21 trawl, non-trawl allocations. Um, and just as a reminder, these are, these are considered more formal allocations compared to the two-year trawl, non-trawl allocations. They were set as part of Amendment 21, um, and several of them have been adjusted recently with Amendment 29. Um, those are listed in Table 3 of GMT Report 3. Um, for item number eight, harvest guidelines and state shares for stocks in a complex, there are four stocks the GMT considered. Um, and for Black Hill Rockfish, again, that's within the Slope Rockfish complex south of 4010, the GMT is recommending the status quo allocation scheme. Um, that uh, allocation scheme was set in the 2021-22 biennium. Um, and when Black Hill Rockfish was uh, began, be, began to be managed within the Slope Rockfish complex south with a species specific harvest guideline and trawl non-trawl sharing scheme um, separate from the other stocks in the complex. For Oregon Black Blue Deacon Rockfish Complex, um, their mortality for this complex has been below the OFL contribution to the complex in recent years. And so the GMT did not see a need for a species specific harvest guideline. Um, for Cabazon Kelp Greenling off Washington and Oregon, um, the GMT also did not see a need for a species specific harvest, harvest guideline even though there was an exceedance off of, for the complex off Washington in 2019. Um, however, the OFL contributions are expected to be increasing, um, have been increasing in recent years and will continue to. Um, and so, and there have been no exceedances off Oregon. So the GMT didn't see a need to set that. Um, and then lastly, for Nearshore Rockfish Complex North, um, recommending status quo shares, and that will also be discussed some more under item number 11. Item number 10 is the at-sea set-asides. Um, I'll start off by saying the GMT recommends status quo for all the species listed in this table. Um, these are all bycatch stocks. And as a reminder, the at-sea set-asides are based on status of the stocks here, expected utilization in the IFQ fishery and any upcoming management conditions. Um, the set-aside amount is, is deducted from the trawl allocation and the remainder goes to the IFQ fishery, um, the other trawl sector. And the, this is um, a, an abbreviated version of Table 8 in our GMT report, um, and which we updated from the November report to include 2021 catches as well as 2021 ACL attainment so that the council has that information. Um, none of these are expected to constrain either of the trawl sectors. Um, and then lastly, I will note that top piece, which is that the GMT gave consideration to Pacific Spiny Dogfish at sea set aside but ultimately did not recommend setting one um, given that the spiny dogfish bycatch is extremely variable in the at sea sector. Um, there are already move along measures implemented by the industry um, and the spiny dogfish catch is dependent, generally dependent on the Pacific whiting tack, which also varies as well as the start date, which is expected to change in um, the next biennium based on council action. Um, so the GMT did not see a need to set aside a specific amount for that at this time. Moving on to number 11, 
which is within non trawl allocations. Um, the GMT recommends adopting status quo allocations for these stocks shown below um, with non trawl HGs, ACTs, and shares, except, uh, oh, I'm sorry, status quo for all of the stocks, except for those with options listed below in the table. And with the ones with options, I will walk through uh, each of these on the next several slides. And I have the uh, GMT report table, report three table listed there as a reference as well. So for yellow eye rockfish, um, the GMT recommends the status quo sharing with the use of ACTs for non trawl sectors as shown in this table, which is table 10. Um, as a reminder, yellow eye rockfish is rebuilding ahead of schedule. And given recent mortality, the GMT didn't see a need to diverge from the status quo. Um, and also as a reminder, the harvest guideline is based on an SPR of 65% and the ACT is based on an SPR of 70%. For cow cod south of 4010, the, the GMT recommends setting sector specific ACTs in the non trawl sector based on the previous 50-50 sharing arrangement within non trawl sectors as shown in the table below. Um, and this would help reduce management uncertainty with the removal of the 50 metric ton ACT I mentioned before. And so you can see option one is with the 50 metric ton ACT and option two is without the 50 metric ton ACT, but just showing the differences in the allocations um, amongst the two sectors uh, with, with those two different options. For canary rockfish, um, the GMT also recommends status quo allocations and shares for all um, <laughs> for canary rockfish. Um, I think that's a, a remnant of a different version of the report. Um, and you can see the canary rockfish allocations in this table. Uh, there was some discussion in March about recent canary non trawl catches after um, requests from WDFW. Um, ultimately, the, the GMT recommends the status quo sharing arrangement. Um, however, the council may want to consider whether these should be treated as hard caps like the yellow eye ACTs or soft caps like nearshore rockfish complex state shares. Uh, for Boccaccio south of 4010, within non trawl allocations, the GMT recommends continuing to use a combined commercial share as well as the status quo non trawl sharing percentages, which are shown below in the table. Um, these shares are expected to accommodate the non trawl sectors based on recent mortality. Um, for Sablefish South of 36 North Latitude, the GMT also re recommends maintaining the status quo 70% limited entry fixed gear and 30% open access shares um, that were established in 2019 and 20. And then lastly, for Nearshore Rockfish Complex North of 4010, the GMT also recommends continuing to use the status quo sharing arrangement to set state specific harvest guidelines. Um, I'll note for Sablefish, the, there are no constraints expected, which is behind the rationale. And then nearshore rockfish complex north, these are biologically based with states getting 100% of the state specific assessment ACL contributions. Um, and that table is way too large to put in a, a presentation, but it's table 14 in GMT report three that shows all of the um, nearshore rockfish complex north non trawl allocations. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions the council may have. Okay, thank you, Whitney. Questions for Whitney on the uh, GM report uh, or presentation one, I guess. Phil Anderson, Bill. Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, uh, Whitney, and, and the entire GMT for the for this report. Uh, appreciate the, all the work that went into bringing this forward. My question is on the very last. I think the very last slide or uh, issues dealing with canary rockfish next to the last um, you you um, you talked about or mentioned that some um, characterization of a recommendation to the council to consider whether these values should be considered as hard caps or something else. I wasn't sure I understood what the something else was like a harvest guideline or something. Um, you know, I've expressed my concern previously about the Washington recreational number there that um, uh, we came pretty close to that here the last couple of years uh, and in an 
in a time when we had several of our northern ports uh, that are located on tribal reservations, they were closed. Um, so um, in uh, with with the opening of some of the a couple of the rockfish conservation areas that had previously been closed due to yellow eye concerns. Um, there's an anticip there. Well, I would say personally, I'm, I'm anticipating that the numbers that we saw in the last couple of years uh, relative to the recreational catch of canary rockfish could increase uh, because these ports are reopening uh, in in 2022 and presumably beyond or, and including the time frame covered by these biennial specs. So could you, I wondered if you could speak to that concern and, and maybe reiterate uh, what you, the GMT was looking for in terms of uh, guidance from the council or a decision on the council as to how these numbers would be used from a management perspective. Sure, thank you, Mr. Anderson, for the question through the vice chair. Um, we did not specifically speak to any concern about increased rockfish or canary rockfish um, mortality, as you're mentioning. Um, we just didn't have that discussion. Um, however, with regard to your second part of the question, um, whether what I was suggesting, and this is also um, stated in our report, is that um, given the interest in um, looking at those high mortality events in recent years, as you alluded to, um, the council may want to consider the intent, the intent behind these. Um, the GMT is not offering a suggestion, a specific suggestion for how to use these. Um, I think it is, um, I, I see it as potentially a policy call based on the council's intended use. I think these sorts of things um, are typically used uh, in such a way that is dependent on um, the stock itself. And, and as you're saying, there are certain um, factors that weigh into how the council may want to use these, um, these shares. And I think at the moment they're, um, you know, they're, they're not used as a hard allocation necessarily. It's more of um, a guideline for each of the states and the states manage themselves, uh, manage their own catch individually. Um, I, I think if the council had the intent of using them as hard allocations, that is an option moving forward, but I don't necessarily, I'm not um, at all su saying that the GMT is suggesting that. It's um, just a question the GMT wanted to raise for the council. And um, if the council wants to continue using them as um, shares that are really guidelines um, that the states then manage to individually, then no action is needed by the council. Um, that would, I think in my mind be considered status quo moving forward. Um, so I think to alleviate your um, potential concern, Mr. Anderson, I would say that, um, you know, if if the council wants to diverge from using them as, um, as uh, soft cap shares as they have been, um, then that, count, that discussion, you know, could happen, but I don't, um, I don't think that that's the GMT's intent necessarily. It's um, it's really just a question uh, that does not necessarily need action or uh, or direction from the council on. Um, it's it's just a consideration to be had, um, not just for Canary Rockfish, but for any of these state shares. It's always a consideration, and as I said, typically depends on how the stock um, is doing and what sorts of um, management measures are in place for the stock. Does that help, Mr. Anderson? Um, a, a little, um, so let me, if, uh, on the, uh, just looking at this, this slide that you have here on the table, uh, for example, where you have the trawl allocation at, and those values there, um, can you, um, maybe this is an unfair question, but can you, remind me of what the trawl landings of Canary have been in the recent year or two? Uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me specifically, um, but I believe if I can remember based on the attachment to analysis, um, Canary in particularly the IFQ fishery has been relatively low attainment. Um, so 
that alone, I think there isn't a risk to the ACL um, based on non-trail catches. Um, so, and similarly in at sea, I think they just across the board for a lot of their stocks, attainments have been low in recent years and declining. Um, and the at sea canary rockfish set aside was just recently adjusted um, to allow for more uh, canary in the IFQ sector for that reason. So um, in general, I, if I can remember correctly, and like I said, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but attainment has been low recently, particularly um, for both of the trawl sectors. Can I follow up, Sarah? Please. So, you know, we came out of the uh, relatively long time frame uh, during the rebuilding of Canary Rockfish, and um, we have not, uh, to the best of my knowledge, made any hard allocation decisions for Canary Rockfish under, and I think we recognize that um, doing so coming out of the rebuilding period would have would have been I'll, I'll use the term premature and that we really didn't understand and, and wouldn't understand for a few years um, kind of what the the needs if you will of the various sectors uh, was uh, so we needed to have some of that history before we dove into making some hard allocations so um, I guess my question here is the 72.3 and the 27.7% values here that in our trawl and non-trawl, how were those uh, percentages derived? Thank you, Mr. Anderson, for the question through the vice chair. Um, I think, and if I can go back to, oh, that's not, sorry, not what I meant to do. Let me go back to, I think that should be the correct display now. Um, trying to, so those would be, uh, yes, two, status quo to your trawl, non-trawl allocation shares. And you can see canary rockfish is listed there. Um, so that is, I don't recall um, how those were set uh, or when those were set in the past um, and maybe I know, I'm sure Lynn Mattis is on the line. She may have some memory about that or um, someone else from the GMT if they do, because I was certainly not around when those were set. Um, but I, I can say that they are two-year trial, non-trial allocations. So they were not set um, formally with Amendment 21 or Amendment 29. Um, so those can be considered uh, for readjustment every two years. Um, and I... I I apologize. I don't think that there's much more I can offer in terms of answering your question because um, it's not uh, something we discussed at this meeting, and um, I don't recall when or or how those specifically were established. Okay. Thank you, Chair sure, Golick. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. Uh, actually, I I think. Um, Phil Anderson's follow-ups address where I was the questions I was going to ask here of Whitney of basically what were the attainments in these respective sectors and and uh, so knowing those attainments might help us uh, meet our obligation under national standard one optimum yield so um, I realize that's not part of this presentation but I think that that would be useful for us to know as well as where as precisely where these figures came from and what flexibility uh, we have because um, if one sector is constrained and the other is under attaining then uh, perhaps we have an obligation to fix that i think uh, lynn mattis has her hand up so maybe lynn could give us some more background on this uh, subject matter lynn uh, thank you vice chair uh Pettinger. um I was trying to help Whitney on the canary question that Mr. Anderson asked a moment ago, if it's okay if I proceed with that. Please. Yeah. Uh, the first cycle when a canary was rebuilt, we were fairly precautionary in how we set things up. The All the individual non-trawl sectors estimated what we thought we would need, um, put in flat values. Uh, as an example, I know Oregon Recreational, we thought we would need 75 metric tons. 
Um, I think the Washington Recreational was similar as well, similar number. So for that was 2019, 2020, we set specific values for the non-trawl sectors, and then the remainder went to the trawl sector. And it was just based on those numbers. Last cycle for 21-22, we actually had a fairly lengthy discussion amongst the GMT, the GAP, and the council members about how should we proceed. As the canary rockfish ACL slowly decreases with time varying sigma and all that, should the non-trawl sectors maintain those flat values, the, those static values, or should it all should it be the percentages be created? And the council decided last cycle for 21-22 to turn all of those into percentages. And at that time, it that equated to 72.3% went to the trawl fishery, 27.7 went to the non-trawl fishery. Whitney, can you change to your canary slide, please? Thank you. So when, when we did those numbers last cycle, the council decided to stick with those status quo sharing percentages rather than those hard numbers. Um, so I, uh, Washington Rec would have been 50 metric tons when we started. And when we applied the percentages from when we had those hard numbers going forward, that's where these percentages came out. And the council made the decision last cycle to have everybody stay with those percentages. That way, the non-trawl fisheries weren't held harmless, to, so to speak, um, to the changing ACL. That way, everybody took a little bit of a hit with the changing ACL. So that's some of the history of how we got to these canary rockfish percentages, where they came from. So hopefully that helps. Thank you, Lynn. Um, uh, Phil, there, I looked at the numbers and um, 2019 was the top trawl catch of canary. It was ramping up after the rebuilt, uh, like 1.1 million pounds in the last two years. They've been down due to the COVID. So the background on the, on the recent landings in the trawl fishery were about 800,000 pounds last year, I believe. So, and I believe, um, I believe uh, Katie has some information as far as Canary numbers uh, for 21 for each sector, if that would be helpful. Oh, she it's in the chat, 267.3 metric ton uh, total mortality in 2021. Okay. Questions for the discussion? Oh, okay. So uh, Whitney, or, uh, I believe we'll go to um, to Katie next. Thank you, Vice Chair um, Benninger. I will also try to share my screen. Let's see. Oh, no, wrong. Okay, bear with me. No, you're good. Okay. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Penninger. Thank you, council members. Good morning. We My name is, oh. We don't have you yet. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> Weird, okay. It says that it's showing. Um, I can assure you it isn't. <laughs> okay, let, let me try again. Stand by. Oh, wait, okay. hold on. I see it. I see it. Okay. I might be doing it. Now? Yes. Okay. Yes. So sorry. You're good. You're good. <laughs> um, Thank you. My name is Katie Pearson for the record. I will be um, presenting our GMT presentation two on action items 12 through 18, as Whitney mentioned, uh, which come out of the supplemental GMT report four. Um, what I did want to note, and I don't know if this will be a problem in this slideshow presentation, but I did note that um, there was a little bit of cutoff at the um, very bottom of the last presentation. Um, so please uh, review 
uh, that presentation in your briefing book um, if you have questions about those, and we will um, endeavor to fix that problem into the future. So at first, I just want to orient you to the action item checklist. Um, so this is item 12, which is the new management measures. And we'll be discussing those new management measures uh, that are not struck out. Um, but as you can see, we have also added four new new management measures um, that you will uh, see aligned with 12G through J. Um, so we'll be talking about 12C, which is the FMP amendment to establish short belly rockfish bycatch threshold to trigger council review. 12E is the non-bottom contact hook and line gear allowance in the non-trawl RCA. F, extend primary sablefish season from October 31st to December 31st. G, correct FMP language for block area closures. H, California recreational fishery bag limit changes. I, California Rec Recreational Fishery RCA Management Measures, and finally J, Midwater Trawl Block Area Closures. So moving right along uh, into 12C, uh, as a reminder, um, the option two amends the FMP or the, the Pacific Coast Groundfish FMP to formally set a mortality threshold that will require the council to review and investigate all appropriate fishery information and consider if management measures are necessary to reduce short belly rockfish mortality. Um, so the GMT will re recommend uh, adopting this uh, op option two as PPA. And this is being monitored already, but this option just formalizes what would happen if the threshold of 2,000 metric tons was approached. So there are no direct impacts from this action, just really a formality. That one was short and sweet. Um, this one is a little bit more complicated. So this is 12E, the non-bottom contact hook and line gear in the non-trawl RCA. I wanted to take a step back and recognize that there are a lot of pieces and parts of this 12E item. Um, first off, analysis that was done over winter did not contain a specific gear definition, whereas at the harvest specifications check-in in March, NIMS provided a supplemental report that, was, that narrowed the scope of this action as well as started to add specificity to the gear definition. That has since gone through more edits, and we saw another version here in April, which Lynn Massey just spoke to, and which the GMT understands is continuing to be refined by the GAP and enforcement consultants. The narrowing of scope is seen in this table. This NIMS 12E report scope is from 46 degrees uh, 16 north to the US Mexican border and is open to open access and limited entry fixed gear sectors. However, both sectors can only fish up to the open access limits with the EFP gears and artificial bait only. Uh, because of this refinement, I just wanted to flag for the council that the team anticipates more an analysis to be done for June. So our GMT recommendation is that the council adopt the revised 12E proposal as described in the NIMS report one as the PPA to open the non-trawl RCA to certain gear types with the gear definition revisions that the GMT understands are being further developed with the EC and the GAP. The GMT would like to offer the following rationale. Using the data from the Midwater uh, Rockfish EFPs, the gear types proposed have relatively low uh, bycatch of groundfish species of concern while being able to harvest healthy midwater rockfish. The prohibition on natural bait further reduces the impacts to seabirds, which is the only prohibited, pro uh, prohibited or protected species that the analysis found an impact to. Habitat impacts are also expected to be minimal. It is also difficult to predict the projected effort that is likely to be constrained, uh, because, as it is likely to be constrained by gas prices, potential travel danger to sport like OA uh, vessels, as well as the VMS requirement. Um, therefore, the GMT understands the potential risk of being wrong as being minimal. And I just wanted to kind of end uh, this little item as kind of talking about the relationship to the non-trawl RCA item. So if this council selects the NIMS revised 12E 
uh, report as PPA. Uh, you could consider it an intermediate step, well, PPA and then FPA. Uh, you could consider it an intermediate step to addressing some of the pieces and parts from alternative one and two of the non trial RCA uh, F6 item at this meeting. And then moving on uh, to 12F, which is the Sablefish Primary Tier Season Extension, the GMT recommends op option one and sub-option two. Option one is extending the season and date uh, to uh, December 31st. And to be clear, option one is a permanent extension that would not change any other aspects of the program. For example, uh, stacking privileges, transferability, and allocation. The GMT rationale for choosing this option is that it adds flexibility, allows for planning based on markets and weather, and potentially allows for increased attainment and profitability. Uh, we will also discuss the impacts on the next slide. Uh, the original intent of the October 31st date was for catch accounting purposes uh, when there was a significant lag between um, the information coming in. But with our 24 hour tickets, e tickets uploads, it is no longer an issue. So the GMT would like to note the impacts that we analyze from this action. The habitat impacts are expected to remain roughly the same because the number of vessels that use fixed gear is likely to remain the same. Given that in November and December, participants are often engaged in other fixed gear sectors, such as um, the LEFG uh, daily trip limit uh, sector, Dungeness crab, and then the IFQ sector. Uh, gear usage is also expected to lessen later in the year as weather worsens. Um, but we do note that all gear related impacts are likely to fluctuate with Sablefish ACLs. This action could extend the period of time when humpback whale, co humpback whale co occurrence could happen with this sector. However, aggregations of humpbacks are likely to decrease from October to December. Um, impacts to seabirds are expected to remain within the 2017 biop, and there is no or there's little to no anticipated impacts on salmon. Now, moving on to the halibut component of this action, suboption two has to do with the incidental retention of halibut by the primary fishery north of Point Chehalis, Washington, and would close that fishery on the date or time specified by IPHC, the International Pacific Halibut Commission, or until the quota is taken, whichever comes first. Suboption two would result in minimal impacts to mortality, and there is little risk of exceeding the Washington sport allocation because of the flexibility built into the catch sharing plan. Uh, this would also offer an alternative source of revenue for potentially longer. So item 12G is correct FMP language for block area closures. So in March 2022, a discrepancy between FMP language and current federal regulations was brought to the attention of the council in agenda item E9, attachment one. Uh, so the GMT recommends that the council amend the FMP to align it with federal, re re federal regulations. Item 12, F, um, CDFW recreational bag limits. There are several bag limit options that were analyzed as part of the 2023-24 harvest specification cycle. And this range can be used in season setting. So the G D GMT supports the adoption of this new management measure as PPA for utilization in the 23-24 biennium and for in-season action in the future. 12I. CDFW recreational RCA management measures. This new management measure is a novel utilization of the previously established RCA boundary lines. It allows fishing it allows for fishing seaward of this of a specified RCA boundary line and prohibits fishing shoreward. This would allow for targeting healthy shelf and slob rockfish. The GMT supports the adoption of this new management measure as PPA for utilization in the 23-24 biennium and for in-season action in the future. Twelve J is the midwater trawl BACs, which Whitney spoke uh, briefly to as she was summarizing the supplemental GMT report too. 
And it is just another flag for the council that you should expect analysis on this item in June, as outlined in that supplemental GMT report too. We will be analyzing block area closures for groundfish mitigation purposes by midwater trawl gear coastwide for all groundfish species. And as a note, BACs for bottom uh, trawl gear off Washington can be tiered from Amendment 28, but the BACs for midwater trawl gear coastwide would be a new management measure. All right, moving past uh, the new management measures into item 13, which is the shore-based IFQ. Um, the GMT recommends the status quo shore-based IFQ trip limits for non-IFQ species, and these are listed in table 1-18 of attachment two. Okay, items 14, or item 14A, open access north of 4010, um, so the GMT re recommends adopting option one for sablefish south of 36, oh, wait a minute. Sorry, north of 36 um, degrees north L latitude. Um, removing the daily li trip limit could improve proper profitability as fewer trips could be would be needed. The gap and the GMT discussed wanting to maintain the weekly limit because just a bi-monthly limit could result in an influx of new vessels that could negatively impact current participants. The GMT intentionally did not include a one landing per week specification as part of option one because we believe this requirement is no longer necessary without a daily limit and could unnecessarily constrain open access north vessels. Uh, while it is possible that removing the daily limit could entice new entrants to target sablefish in the open access north sector, the weekly limit that would remain in place and, and the barrier of entry associated with the cost of the vessel monitoring system equipment would likely offset that possibility. Additionally, the increase of the daily limit from 300 pounds to 600 pounds in 2020 did not appear to influence participation, but did appear to improve uh, existing open access north participants' ability to attain their bi monthly limit under status quo trip limits. Uh, additionally, the open access north sector is projected to attain 41 to 55 percent of the uh, bet between the low and average price scenario uh, based on our modeling, indicate that they're indicating that there's a significant buffer in the landed catch share that could be attained by any increase in the effort under option one. Um, and now kind of moving down to where I have quillback rockfish and copper rockfish. I just want to orient you to how I have quillback and copper in these next few slides. Quillback and copper have the same proposed sub, sub limits, excuse me, but they are separate limits. Um, and the recommendations are the same for both quillback and copper supplements. Um, as seen here, the GMT recommends status quo limits for quillback rockfish of 75 pounds per two months within the 2,000 pound per two month minor nearshore rockfish limit for area between um, 42 and 4010. Uh, as well as the status quo limits for copper rockfish, which are the same as I just noted for um, quillback. And henceforth, I will not read out the actual limits of the status quo since they will be seen on your screen. And now we move into 12 or 14B open access south of 4010. Uh, so the GMT recommends adopting the status quo limits, as you see on the screen, for sablefish south of 36 and quillback and copper rockfish south of 4010. 15A, which is the limited entry fixed gear north of 4010, um, the GMT recommends that the council reaffirm their November in-season decision for a limited entry fixed gear sablefish north of 36 and adopt the status quo limits of, uh, of 2,400 pounds per week and 4,800 pounds per two months as PPA for the 23-24 biennium. biennium. We also recommend adopting status quo for both quillback copper Quillback and copper rockfish between uh, 
4010 and 42 as seen here on the slide. And then item 15B, limited entry fixed gear south of 4010. The GMT recommends adopting the status quo for a limited entry fixed gear sablefish south of 36 and status quo for quillback and copper rockfish south of 4010. So moving into item 16, which is the Washington Recreational, uh, the proposed changes for 23-24 are to prohibit retention of copper rockfish, quillback rockfish, and vermilion rockfish in May, June, and July, but otherwise maintain uh, seasons from mid or season from mid-March to mid-October, status quo bag limits, and depth restrictions. The GMT recommends adopting the PPAs as indicated in agenda item F4A WDFW report one. Item 17 is Oregon Recreational. Uh, you will notice that it's much the same as 21-22. Uh, season open to all depth year round, uh, except for Stonewall Bank YRCA, which of course remains closed. Uh, the bag limits will remain the same. The size limits will remain the same. And we do have some addition of allowing long leader gear fishing on the same trip as all depth Pacific halibut and otherwise legal ground fish with all depth Pacific halibut. So the GMT recommends adopting the PPA season structure, which is figure one GMT report four, with the addition of allowing long leader gear fishing on the same trip as all depth Pacific halibut and otherwise legal ground fish with all depth Pacific halibut. And just noting that the state of Oregon may put in additional regulations through state rule to be more precautionary. Um, item 18 is California Recreational. Uh, California is uh, looking at uh, different combinations of offshore, all depth and date and season length uh, and season structures. Um, but at this time, uh, there will be a further refinement of recommendations uh, in preparation of final action in June. Uh, so the GMT does not have a recommendation at this time. And with that, I will take any questions. Okay, thanks, uh, Katie. Questions for Katie on the uh, GMT presentation too? Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks, Katie, for the presentation. Um, my question is on uh, issue nine, which is the, at least I think I have the number right, which is the short belly rockfish piece. Mm -hmm. And in looking at the draft management measure analytical document um, and looking at the wording for option two, mm -hmm. uh, the language in there um, is um, an abbreviate, I'll call it an abbreviation of what was in the motion that was adopted by the council in November for this item. Um, and I'm wondering what went into the thinking about uh, making those uh, modifications to what was in the language in the motion in November. And I, it appears to me it's just a, it's an attempt to abbreviate and, and make maybe a more uh, succinct language to accomplish what was in um, the motion. I'm not suggesting there's anything devious going on here, but uh, there it is a fairly significant difference in the way the motion was made and passed and what is in this, what's represented in option two as the FMP, um, uh, proposed FMP amended language. Do you, um, enlighten me on that. Yeah, through the vice chair. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. I'm um, sorry, can I just clarify? Are you looking at um, option two as it's in the um, big analysis document or uh, report four or on the screen right now? I'm looking at page uh, nine dash, I believe it's nine dash six which is in the draft management measure analytical document. Um, okay, no, okay. 
I'm hoping that. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for that clarification. I don't think the intent was um, to change any of the meaning behind the uh, the motion. Um, I think that uh, as I did not do this analysis um, specifically, um, I don't think that um, it was intended to change anything. Um, I do think it probably, as you noted, it was probably for brevity um, and to just streamline um, kind of what we were talking about. Uh, and that's all I have. All right, thanks. Thanks, Bill. Further questions for, for Katie? Corey Writings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Katie, for that. Um, I'm looking at um, slide 13, uh, 12 point J, the BACs for the Midwater Trawl, um, and also thinking back to the separate GMT document on spiny dogfish that uh, Whitney presented earlier this morning. Um, thinking about those uh, block area closures and about um, spiny dogfish in general, um, your analytical document also mentions the possibility of sector-specific seasonal closures as an option. Um, and it also mentions um, spatial management tools that are not currently available. Um, so I'm wondering if you are, pardon me, the GMT is planning to also consider um, those as it um, uh, has offered to propose a document to look at at our next meeting. So I hope that makes sense. Thanks. Through the chair. Thank you, uh, Ms. Writings. Um, yes, so this the spatial management tools that were not available, that is what this item addresses. Um, so the midwater trawl BACs were not available to or are not available to us at this time. And so that is what this is going to um, hopefully present to the council in an analytical document. Uh, we did also look at uh, bycatch reduction areas. Um, which we deemed were not uh, going to be a very effective tool. And so uh, we did not kind of put those forward. Um, this is really uh, the tool that we're, we're uh, most, um, I guess, uh, we're going to put into our toolbox um, to, for uh, management of this item. Um, as far as the uh, sector specific season closures that you that you uh, mentioned that is something we explored and that is not something we're going to really bring forward at this time okay thank you for that okay F further questions okay thanks katie um i would point out that the her presentation had more slides than we're seeing on screen and uh, on, on the on the um website. So, uh, but Todd is uh, getting to upload the most recent one here as soon as he can get it put together. So just a FYI. And I apologize for not taking a break in between the GMT presentations, but um, uh, I kind of lost sight of the clock there. So, and with that, we're going to take a, a 15 minute break. How's that sound? So, all right. And we'll see you back here at, uh, well, 1022-ish. <laughs>
Okay, we're going to get started here just momentarily. Okay, we're we're back in session here, and um, I believe we're going to have a uh, the gap report, and um, I believe uh, Gary Ricker and uh, Merritt McRae I see on the list, gentlemen. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Vice Chair. Good morning, Gary. We'll be reading from agenda item F4A Supplemental Gap Report One, Ground Fish Advisory Panel Report on Preliminary Preferred Management Measure Alternatives for 2023 and 2024 Fisheries. The Groundfish Advisory Subpanel and Groundfish Management Team held a joint discussion about preliminary preferred management measures. The discussion was informative and helpful. The GAP thanks the GMT for working with us on many of these difficult issues. Referencing agenda item F4, attachment one, supplemental revised action item checklist, the GAP provides comments on only those checklist items that differ from the GMT or the GAP believes require more rationale or comments to better inform the council. For the purpose of this report, we will take the items in order and by reference number from the checklist. For our checklist item five, adopt ACTs, confirm status quo or modify yellow eye rockfish non-trawl ACT of 39.8 metric tons. We didn't have a statement for that, but our understanding is it's gonna remain status quo. Uh, the next one would be the sub option to remove 50 metric ton cow cod ACT south of 4010 North Latitude. GAP supports removing the 50 metric ton ACT on cow cod to provide flexibility and stability to the non-trawl sector south of 4010 North Latitude as described in the GMT report one under this agenda item. Next sub option, investigate and develop sector specific ACTs for quillback rockfish and copper rockfish off of California. GAP understands consideration of this item may require reconsideration in June and will be prepared to provide comments at that time. Next checklist item number 12, new management measures, sub option C, FMP amendment to establish short belly rockfish bycatch threshold to trigger council review. The GAP recognizes the council continues to explore refinements to monitoring catch of short belly rockfish and groundfish trawl fisheries. Fishery participants closely track and respond to our interactions with short belly. In addition, the GMT has developed robust in-season reporting to keep the public and council apprised of short belly catch amounts with reports available on pack fin and catch summaries provided by the GMT at council meetings. When the council categorized short belly as an EC species, council discussion at the time identified 2000 metric tons as a threshold value that if exceeded could be a trigger for the council to consider whether action was needed. The GAP understands the council is considering if the additional step of amending the FMP is necessary to include the 2000 metric ton threshold value to be consistent with the EC categorization action. Relative to other actions in the 2023-2024 specifications and management, management package, GAP considers this a low priority. Sub-option E, non-bottom contact hooked in line gear allowance in the non-trawl RCA. As the council is aware, the non-trawl sector has been working for several years to get the RCA open to non-trawl groundfish fishermen. For several reasons, this needs to happen as soon as possible. The status of some of our nearshore stocks make it imperative to move fishermen offshore to access healthy midwater stocks and take pressure off nearshore stocks such as copper and quillback rockfish. The GAP has reviewed the documents under this agenda item, including the NIMS report, and talked with Ms. Lynn Massey from the National Marine Fishery Service. At this time, we support that recommendation to narrow the scope of action item 12E to the specific gear used in the Emily Platt and the Real Good Fish EFP out of Monterey. We further recommend that vessels entering the fishery declare into the fishery 
and declare which type of gear they are going to fish with, for example, jig or troll gear. We request the council adopt action item 12E with the proposed changes and adopt it as the PPA. We understand that by doing this, the regulations will be finished and implemented January 1, 2023. To be clear, the GAP views this as a first step to get fishermen into the RCA, and we'll be looking to have other gear types allowed in the future. Sub-option F, amendment to extend the primary sablefish season end date from October 31 to December 31. GAP supported this in the past and continues to support this management measure. Most of the analysis has already been completed through emergency action during the pandemic in 2021 and 20, excuse me, in 2020 and 2021. Furthermore, the GAP agrees with the GMT for option one, sub option two, ending halibut retention in the primary tiered sablefish fishery at the date or time specified by the International Pacific Halibut Commission or until the allocation is attain, attained, whichever comes first, would afford the most flexibility for fishermen involved in this fishery. Next sub-option, California recreational fishery bag limit changes. GAP understands this measure would afford the Council and California Department of Fish and Wildlife more flexibility to take in-season action for management purposes. GAP supports the development of bag limit analysis as proposed. Next sub-option, sub recreational fishery RCA management measure in California. Similar to above, GAP acknowledges this would provide managers with more flexibility to take in-season action. The GAP supports the proposed modifications to the RCA management boundaries, correcting various crossovers and following depth contours more closely. Next sub-option to develop potential control catch management measures for Pacific spiny dogfish and groundfish fisheries, such as block area closures and bycatch reduction areas. As the GMT noted in its supplemental report to industry efforts to control incidental catch through spatial management tools are generally more precise and timely than post facto actions taken by the council or NIMS. Therefore, the GAP highlights that voluntary industry actions should be the first line of defense for responding to and minimizing incidental catch of non-target species, including spiny dogfish. However, the GAP understands that the council wants to ensure it has all the tools necessary if council action is needed and recognizes that BACs are a more precise tool than fathom line based BRAs. With that in mind, the GAP accepts the inclusion of development of BACs as a potential in-season catch control measure in the management measures package. The GAP will continue to coordinate with the GMT on this matter and will provide additional considerations and recommendations in June prior to final council action. Uh, 14A, checklist item 14A, open access north 4010, north latitude, dot preliminary routine adjustments, non trawl RCA configuration, trip limits, size limits as appropriate. For Sablefish north of 36 north latitude, GAP recommends option one, which would be 2,000 pounds a week, not to exceed 4,000 pounds bi-monthly. And uh, that removes the 600 pound daily limit is what is happening there. And it's described in GMT supplemental report four. For checklist item 14B, open access south of 4010, preliminary routine adjustments, non trawl RCA configuration, trip limit size limits as appropriate. GAP recommends status quo. 15A, fixed limited entry fixed gear north of 4010, routine adjustments to non trawl RCA configurations, trip limit size limits as appropriate. GAP agrees with the GMT and recommends status quo as described in supplemental GMT report four, which I believe was 2,400 pounds weekly, 4,800 pounds bi monthly. 15B, fixed gear south of 4010. Dot preliminary routine adjustments to the non troll RCA configuration trip limit size limits as appropriate. GAP recommends status quo. 16, Washington Recreational. The GAP agrees with the proposals as were outlined in the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife report. For checklist item 17, Oregon Recreational. GAP agrees with the management measures proposed in the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife report 
with the addition of allowing long leader gear fishing on the same trip as all depth Pacific halibut and otherwise legal ground fish with all depth halibut, sablefish, Pacific cod, and other flash fish species, as noted in the supplemental GMT report four under this agenda item. Next item should read, uh, small typo there, should read action checklist item 18, California Recreational. GAP understands CDFW proposal proposed several options and is prepared to comment on these in the future. All the alternatives within the PPA provided for council's consideration within California Department of Fish and Wildlife CDFW report one under this agenda item include variations on the theme of several months of no recreational angling access to waters inshore of the 50 fathom lines and additional access beyond that. 50 fathom line. Uh, previous measures, which included areas where groundfish fishing was prohibited, also disallowed possession of the no take groundfish species, irrespective of where or how they were obtained. The gap notes language within the CDFW report states in all areas of the state during months that an offshore fishery is active, retention of nearshore rockfish, cabazon, and greenlings is prohibited. It is important that both shelf and slope rockfish complexes, as well as other species which are legally accessible, remain legally possessed while fishing in waters inshore of the 50 fathom lines, even during times when they are closed to the take of nearshore complex rockfish, cabazon, and greenlings. Waters beyond the 50 fathom lines are much more exposed to prevailing westerly winds and seas, and these winds strongest in the afternoon hours. The wind line typically moves shoreward with the time of day. It's the afternoon hours when recreational anglers most need inner waters access. Anglers must be able to legally possess legally caught fish from deeper waters while fishing in shorter areas for non ground fish species like bass, bonito, and salmon. Mr. Vice Chair, that completes our gap statement. I will remind folks, in the queue, we have Mr. Dan Platt and Mr. Merritt McRae to answer questions that I can't. Okay, thanks, Gary. Uh, questions on the gap report? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands, so you're, oh, you're good awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. <laughs> you bet. Okay, um, next up would be um, DC report and uh, Greg Bush. Greg. Morning, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Greg Bush, Chair of the Enforcement Consultants. I'll be reading Supplemental EC Report 1 for Agenda Item F4A, Enforcement Consultants Report on Preliminary Preferred Management Measure Alternatives for 2023-2024 Fisheries. The Enforcement Consultants have reviewed the documents pertaining to Agenda Item F4, Preliminary Preferred Management Measure Alternatives for 2023-2024 Fisheries, and provide the following comments. The EC have concerns with any proposed authorized fishing activity within a ground fish conservation area with specific gear and area restrictions due to the need for additional shoreside monitoring and at sea enforcement to ensure gear and retention requirements are met. As previously stated in EC in E6A supplemental EC report one at the November 2021 Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting, the EC recommend making changes to the boundary of the non trawl Rockfish Conservation Area over a partial reopening, or, or, yeah, over a partial reopening the, of the non-trawl RCA to additional groundfish fishing activity. The EC are also concerned with additional fishing to occur both inside and outside the non-trawl RCA in the same trip. This adds additional enforcement challenges due to expanded monitoring and gear verification requirements. That said. The EC recognizes the council's desire to provide additional fishing opportunities within the non-trail RCA, while additional analysis and a final recommendation on modifying the boundaries of or eliminating the non-trail RCA is contemplated. Regarding F4A Supplemental NIMS Report 1, the EC greatly appreciates National Marine Fisheries Service staff members Lynn Massey and Keeley Kent's consideration of EC recommendations made during the March Council meeting, CE9A Supplemental EC Report 1, and communications with EC members during the EC meeting and a development of F4A Supplemental NIMS Report 1. The EC also greatly appreciates comments provided by Mr. Alan Lovewell, Real Good Fish Exempted Fishery Permit Director, 
and the following comments are provided for consideration. New gear definition, distance off the bottom. Determining distance of the weights and gear off the bottom is very difficult to enforce. The EC recommends setting a minimum distance between the bottom weight and the first hooks for, or main line, such as 50 feet, rather than a distance the weight is to be suspended above the seafloor, given the difficulty of enforcing the depth of the weight in relation to the depth of the water. Defining the gear as non-bottom contact provides enforcement with the means to inspect the gear for possible indications of contact with the seafloor, such as mud on the bottom weight. Maximum number of hooks and gear types. The EC greatly appreciates the inclusion of markers floats every 25 hooks to facilitate enforcement of the total number of hooks. Mr. Lovewell indicated concerns with requiring floats to separate hooks since that was not used during the EFP and requested clarification during the EC meeting if enforcement was requesting floats or if another method of marking the hook segments could be used. The EC restated that the recommendation was for a clearly identifiable marker to indicate hook segments. This could be floats, line wraps, colored line splices, or some other visible marker. Mr. Lovewell also requested consideration for carrying spare hooks on board, up to 100. The EC are not opposed to carrying a limited number of spare hooks on board, provided they comply with the defined hook type that is artificial unweighted. The EC are concerned about the ability to verify compliance with gear requirements if there's a significant amount of spare allowable gear on board or if a vessel is fishing with or carrying both types of gear on board. Declaration reports. The EC note that new declaration codes will need to be in place in order to monitor vessels using these new gear types inside the non-troll RCA. The EC are working with NIMF staff to implement new declaration codes and make appropriate updates to the regulations to support this item and the forthcoming ground fish logbook requirement. Regarding F4, Attachment 2, 2023 to 2024 Management Measure Analytical Document. The EC had the following concern with Chapter 1 Baseline. 1111 Area Restrictions. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife provision allowing the recreational retention of petroli sole, starry flounder, and other flatfish, including Pacific sand dab, while using bottom contact gear in the RCA and cow cod conservation area is an enforcement concern. Existing regulations allow the retention of these species in the RCA and cow cod conservation area. Enforcement has made several contacts where recreational fishers were observed fishing in these two conservation areas. The fishers discarded their unlawful, unlawfully taken ground fish overboard once they saw the approaching patrol vessel. When contacted, the fishers claimed that they were, with, they were fishing for Pacific sand dabs and the rockfish floating around their vessel was prohibited ground fish they had released. The EC had the following comments in chapter 11.11, .11, enforcement considerations, long liner gear, long leader gear, also known as Holloway gear. The EC are concerned with the complexity, increased time required for gear inspection by enforcement and possible confusion that may be caused by the expanded use of Holloway gear in the recreational fisheries. This concludes the EC report. Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, questions from the EC report, uh, Chair Goldnick. Oh. <laughs> Maggie Summer. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, thanks, Greg, for the report. Question on the uh, item about uh, inspecting gear for possible indications of contact with the seafloor, for example, mud on the bottom weight. Can you give us a, a sense of you know, what the enforcement response might be or, or how enforcement officers might, might approach that? Thank you for the question, Ms. Summers, through uh, the vice chair. Um, it's a, this would be an at sea enforcement issue to where we would be verifying that the gear was not being used as bottom contact gear while fishing within the non troll RCA. It, it's a challenge to have them pull the gear up and do an inspection to determine if the gear was on the bottom 
because they have the opportunity seeing enforcement coming to raise their gear so it is suspended off the seafloor or where they could have been fishing either on or, or bouncing the uh, the weight off the bottom. Um, it's just an example of potentially having mud on the bottom if they're in a muddy bottom versus in a rocky or a, or a hard bottom area. Um, maybe an indication that was on the bottom, but, but it's a very difficult issue to enforce, which is why we recommend for enforcement to measure the distance of the first gear or mainland from the weight rather than the distance of the gear from the seafloor or the, the bottom weight from the seafloor. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Maggie. For the question, Chair Grolnick. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger, and, and uh, Greg, thanks for the report. I, I have a question with regard to the last paragraph in your report indicating concern uh, with the complexity increased time required for gear inspection by enforcement that could be caused by the expanded use of Holloway gear, which I understand is, is a legal gear type and used presently in Oregon. Um, I guess I'm wondering if the reference here is to expanded use, so I'm not sure if that refers to California or not, but why is the current use apparently not a concern, but only the expanded use may be a concern? Mr. Grelnick, through the vice chair, um, members of the enforcement consultants have discussed the use of, of this long leader gear. And while it is being, it is permitted currently with Oregon, we do know that there's varying bycatch um, or, or I should say landing trip limits based on, on what they're allowed, what type of gear they're using, which has added some complexity. And, um, and Oregon has been able to, um, to implement and use it on a limited basis. California has expressed concern about expanding it into certain areas in California, particularly where there may be limited enforcement resources available to monitor and promote compliance. So it's, it's more there's there's going to be definite added complexity. Um, I know CDFW has made comments in the past uh, several years ago um, related to um, concerns about adding long leader gear and CDFW enforcement still has that same concern now. Okay, so that's just to be clear that's a concern about having sufficient enforcement resources in California. That's correct. Uh, it's concern about having the resources available as well as ensuring um, understanding by the fishers who are going to be using it. And if there's varying differing limits based on what type of gear that they're using within certain areas. All right. Thank you. Okay. For the questions, please see uh, Marcy Urepko. Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bush. My question is about the concern raised by the EC on recreational retention of flatfish in the RCA and the CCAs. Um, in your report, you state that it's an enforcement concern. Um, but I guess I'm curious what your recommendation is for this matter in the alternatives that have been provided for consideration. And more specifically, if you've reviewed the recreational alternatives for California, um, the way regulations would be structured beginning with the 23-24 biennium would have fishing of two types, would be an offshore fishery or an all depth fishery. So right now in 2022, uh, we do have RCAs off California that are uh, areas that are closed seaward of a particular RCA line and looking to 2023 and beyond, we will be uh, proposing the use of RCAs that are shoreward of a particular boundary line. So I'm just 
wanting to confirm that the EC discussed and understood that uh, in bringing forward this concern about recreational flatfish because um, in the future, um, the RCA configurations will be much different. So I'm just wanting to make sure it's a concern for the new measures and, and not uh, where we'll be leaving things in 2022. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Borsi. Uh, yes. Anyone else? Oh, I'm sorry. If I could, uh, I'm not sure. I, I, I can't uh, answer the question, Mr. Ramsey, through the vice chair. I think, I don't believe we may have adequately reviewed that to the, the depth that was needed to analyze whether the changes would be, would eliminate that enforcement concern. And I will reach out to my CDFW enforcement uh, partner, uh, Officer uh, or, uh, Lieutenant Jason Krause, if he's available to provide any input or thoughts on this matter. But, uh, but I don't believe we went into a great deal and depth of analysis on the different alternatives that were being presented in the California report. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Barsha. Further questions for the EC? Okay, not seeing any. Thank you, Greg. Um, I believe that finishes uh, the reports. Um, we're going to go, I think we're going to public comment here, but I think we're pretty close to the salmon folks coming down um, for um, D5. So maybe let's just go ahead and start public comment and just, well, maybe not. Okay, we'll pause on, um, on F4 and we'll bring in the salmon folks and uh, we'll do public comment after, uh, after, after D5. So we'll, uh, we'll pause here until we uh, get people get to switch to their seats.
Okay, we're uh, we're back, and uh, I'll we'll turn to, to Robin to um, kick us off on uh, on D five. Robin. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Agenda item D five: further direction for the twenty twenty two management alternatives. Um, essentially, we are going to have the STT give their report on the analysis that they did and look for any further guidance uh, so that we can uh, get our 2022 salmon uh, seasons in place. Thank you, Robin. Questions for Robin uh, on the overview? Okay. Dr. Farrell? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. Uh, I'll be uh, referring to agenda item D5A, Supplemental STT Report 1. Uh, in this report, we've taken into account the Council guidance from yesterday and uh, performed our analysis. And um, <clears throat> I'll skip to page 18, first page of Table 5, um, and note that there are um, a number of, um, a few, uh, Puget Sound Chinook stocks um, not meeting their management objectives. Moving on to the next page, Washington Coastal Stocks, um, Boko Fall is not meeting its management objective. Next page, um, California, um, the Cl underneath Klamath River Fall Chinook, the H4 Ocean Harbor. Harvest rate is uh, just above the 10% uh, uh, minimum uh, or maximum for this uh, guidance for this year. And all of the coho stocks uh, in our analysis uh, make, meet their management objectives. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions on, on okay. these results. Questions for Dr. O'Farrell. Kyle? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Dr. O'Farrell, you noted on page 19 that Hoko Fall were not meeting their management objective. I assume that's the 735 projected escapement compared to the 850 MSY spawning escapement objective. There is a second objective listed there. I wonder if you could just speak to that quickly. Uh, yes, Kyle, uh, Mr. Addix, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> um, my understanding of uh, the second objective is an ISBN limit of 10%. And um, I also understand that currently uh, there's a projection of a ER of approximately 2%. Um, and I would, uh, I would ask any uh, STT members who are on the line who might be able to correct me if I've spoken wrong, uh, incorrectly about this. Okay, um, no one's speaking up, so you must be correct. Okay, go. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Dr. O'Farrell. Thanks for confirming that. I may have a couple other remarks during council discussion on that. Oh, ah. Any, uh, anyone else have questions for Dr. O'Farrell on the SDT report? Phil Anderson. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, Dr. O'Farrell, is it correct for me to assume that in the modeling, there's an assumption that the full uh, allowance of the catch ceiling in WCVI and, and Northern BC will be taken? Well, Mr. Anderson, thanks for the question. Um, I'm gonna have to defer to John Kerry on this uh, question. I, I don't think I can answer this adequately. Uh, John? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks, Mr. Anderson, for the question. Um, if I'm understanding you correctly, the answer is yes. Um, essentially, those fisheries are modeled at the annual catch limits that are derived through the Pacific Salmon Commission process, um, and the assumption in the modeling is that all of those fish will be caught, even though in some cases that's not necessarily always the case. Thank you, John. Okay, further questions? Susan Bishop. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Just a, a follow up on that, and I think this is probably directed to John, um, given the, the tenor of the conversation as it also relates to HOCO. So following up on Mr. Addicts and um, Mr. Anderson's questions, am I to understand that the, uh, per, for example, the abundance entering U.S. waters is sort of as a result of the northern fishery impacts is uh, insufficient to meet the, um, the uh, escapement goal? Thanks, Ms. Bishop. Um, yeah, that, that's my understanding based on the modeling is that the, the exploitation rate on, on HOCO stock is um, such that the majority of impacts occur in, in fisheries north of the U.S.-Canada border and um, what essentially returns or would be available as abundance in southern U.S. waters would not be enough to achieve the escape goal. Thank you, Susan. Further questions? Not seeing any, so yeah, thank you, um, Dr. O'Farrell. And you might just want to stay there because I don't think there's any public comment. So we'll just uh, make yourself comfortable and uh, we'll go, uh, I'm going to double check that maybe here. We, that, that accurate? Nope. Okay. There's no public comment. So, okay, that uh, brings us to council discussion. Um, and um, I don't know if Kyle, you want to have something to say before we go to, gu to guidance or? Um... Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I, and I think it, it got framed up pretty well from the questions for Dr. O'Farrell, but we are projecting to not meet the, the escapement goal for Hoko Chinook, but the abundance returning to southern U.S. waters is too small to meet that goal. Um, there's a very small, around 2% exploitation rate in southern United States fisheries on that stock. We do have the Pacific Salmon Treaty ISBM obligation, which is 10%, so we're meeting that. We also have a um, HOCO we're included in our Puget Sound Chinook Resource Management Plan, although it's not part of the Puget Sound ESU, and the co-managers have exploitation rate ceilings of 10% at some abundances that dropped to six percent at critical abundances on that stock and we're meeting meeting those rates at, as well so pretty de minimis level of impact in council fisheries and inside fisheries on the stock just wanted to note that okay thank you anyone else joe yeah uh, thank you mr vice chair and i just wanted to be on record that i concur with the statements that uh, kyle just made Okay, very good. All right. Well, with that, I guess we'll go to guidance. And uh, Kyle, we'll, we'll start with you and come down the coast. Thank you again, Mr. Vice Chair. And my guidance is on the screen. I'll just say um, these are changes that were made after the quoted reductions we made yesterday. Some some further adjustments to fisheries that will not affect the modeling at all, but um, just fine tuning fisheries at these lower abundances. So north of Falcon Salmon Management Guidance, speaking relative to in agenda item D5A, Supplemental STT Report 1, dated April 11th, 2022, implement the following changes. For Table 1, North of Falcon Commercial Management Measures on page 2, change the landing and possession limit for the area between the U.S.-Canada border and the Queets River to 80 Chinook per vessel per landing week, and change the landing and possession limit for the area between Ledbetter Point and Cape Falcon to 80 Chinook per vessel landing week. On Table 2, um, North, of Falcon, North of Cape Falcon Recreational Management Measures on page 11, Add October 5th through earlier of October 8th or 125 Chinook quota in the area north of 47 degrees, 50 minutes, 0 seconds north latitude and south of 48 degrees, 0 minutes, 0 seconds north latitude. Chinook only, 2 Chinook per day, Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches total length and adjust the sub-area guideline for the June 18th to September 30th fishery to 995 Chinook. So this was a, a small bubble fishery that we removed from the package yesterday as the SAS thought about it overnight. They wanted to put that in for a shorter duration um, with the reduced quota. The landing limits are just reductions to landing limits corresponding to the reduced quota. Okay. Mike, got that? Uh, yes, Mr. Vice Chair. 
Perfect. Okay. Um, Joe? Joe? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I do not have any uh, guidance to provide for the tribal okay. fishery. Thank you. Um, Chris? Yep, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I do have a little bit of guidance. Uh, the first one I'll just note before I read it is just a no effect on the modeling or the fishery. It's just a clarification to make sure that it's clear what the um, period overlap between Chinook and Coho only seasons are. So uh, in the Cape, that's donuts. It's supposed to be on silent already. Now I owe you donuts. <sighs> okay, replace open seven days uh, for the Cape Falcon to Oregon, California border, um, all salmon marks selective coho fishery. Replace open seven days per week, all salmon, two salmon per day. All retained coho must be marked with a heeled adipose fin clip. With open seven days per week, Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain, all salmon, two salmon per day. Humbug Mountain to Oregon, California border, June 18th through 24th, all salmon except Chinook, two salmon per day, and June 25 through August 21, or coho quota, all salmon, two salmon per day. All retained coho must be marked with a heeled adipose fin clip. And then in the uh, Humbug Mountain to Oregon, California border section for the Oregon KMZ, replace June 22 through August 21 with June 25 through August 21. Okay. Thank you, Chris. And I'd just like to say that the Anderson rule wasn't revoked since he's not chair, so the donuts are still yeah, forthcoming. With that, we'll go to uh, California. Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, we do have some guidance for Table 1. Uh, the California commercial management measures um, on page six, uh, just for the Monterey cell. Uh, the guidance is to include in the general regulatory language, the statement that all salmon caught in this area in the month of May must be landed within 24 hours of any closure of the fishery. And during the months of May and June, all salmon caught in this area must be landed south of Point Arena. And this guidance is intended uh, just to um, address the short uh, stop start nature of the fisheries that are proposed in the May cell in the Monterey area. Um, it doesn't affect the modeling in any way. Um, some changes were proposed at the beginning of this week um, to establish those start, stop start fisheries. Uh, that was the SAS advice. And um, this is just an additional provision that uh, should aid us with enforcement. So we'd like to include it now. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Okay, any further discussion, Kyle? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, maybe just an update on our co-manager North the Falcon discussions. We met late into the evening last night and added again early this morning to try to get to inside fisheries that meet that the list of Puget Sound management objectives, also confirming that our um, inside coastal fisheries are lining up to meet all of, our, all of our objectives. I'm not sure when we'll have sort of revised inside fishery inputs to match up with, with this. Um, possibly late today, more likely first thing tomorrow morning, but I'd like to keep this agenda item open so we can come have another check-in, even if there are no ocean changes instruct the team to go do the modeling with the hopefully final insight packages that will meet all of our objectives. Very good. All right. Any questions for us, uh, Dr. O'Farrell, as far as guidance? No, Mr. Vice Chair, I think we have what we need to move forward. Very good. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. And we'll leave D5 open until tomorrow and go from there. So thank you. And with that, back to F4. So, um, and public uh, comment. So, get those, um, get that screen up.
Yeah, if I can do a mic check. We'll get going here in a second, but we do hear you, so just stand by. Okay, uh, we're back to public comment F4. We have seven public comment cards in, and we'll start off with uh, Ken Frankie, followed by Mike Thompson. Ken, are you there? Yes, I am, Mr. Vice Chair. Do you hear me? We do. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is Ken Frankie, president of the Sport Fishing Association of California. Our membership includes a majority of the Coast Guard inspected mm -hmm. CPFV fleet in Southern California. I'm speaking to you today on behalf of both SAC and the Golden Gate Fishermen's Association. Last November, a tremendous amount of effort went into reducing the bag limit of copper and quillback rockfish down to one fish. We appreciate the extensive work of CDFW that CDFW has conducted to meet with captains and owners to seek solutions. We've just started the 2022 season and the impact results will not be known until next year, as you know. We also look forward to the results of a full stock assessment. Looking to the future, it is important to mention that we need offshore sampling to get an accurate assessment of these two species. SAC is working with OPC to create a rockfish pilot sampling project expected to start this June. This is similar to the tuna sampling program where the crews actually do the initial collection. The samples will then be transferred to the Santa Cruz lab for analysis. This is critical data collection effort to help future decision making for the present the fleet is capable of substantial species avoidance. We feel that proactive action should be taken immediately. After extensive input from our board, we are sending out a request to the fleet this past Saturday intended to help reduce impact on these species. We have requested every CPFV to do the following voluntarily. Avoid all areas copper or quillback rockfish may be encountered. Two, when depth necessitates, release voluntarily all copper or quillback rockfish with descending devices. And finally, three, as part of avoidance, the use of a six-foot breakaway to the sinker is highly encouraged to put the hooks higher in the water column. As a point of information, the data from the hook and line survey indicates the copper are typically on the hooks closest to the seafloor. In consultation with CDFW, we took this same voluntary avoidance action last November or December to reduce impact on sheephead. It works. We will work diligently in the media to ask the public's help to join a united effort in this proactive and conservation-minded endeavor. For the 23-24 specs, we recommend there be a zero bag limit of copper and quillback and that there be the use of descending devices. We've done extensive outreach within the fleet. There's concern about being caught outside 50 fathoms during bad weather. The additional potential loss of time on the water due to lack of opportunity has serious ramifications. They feel the avoidance and complete elimination of retention of these species will in and of itself be extremely painful to their operations. However, they see this as the only way to stay in business. Every effort must be made to maintain coastal access for opportunity. A key issue is their concern in the potential permanent loss of crew if they lose months of, operation or of operational access. The fleet of U.S. Coast Guard inspected sport fishing vessels has gone from approximately 295 vessels in 1998, down to 193 remaining vessels in 2022. This is a one-third reduction in our fleet size. A third of these operate offshore or in international waters. The remainder are those that are impacted by this issue. The dwindling pool of licensed and trained crew members on these vessels are a valuable commodity that must be considered. A snapshot of this time period would depict a reduced fleet size, reduced passenger capacities, enhanced abilities to avoid certain species, deeper depth being granted, an increase in fishing area resulting in a reduced fishing pressure. Extreme care must be taken when considering decisions which impact the foundational operational existence of the fleet. Within this next year, we will have better and far more accurate information in which to make decisions on. This last assessment process provided, in our opinion, an incomplete view of where these stocks are in terms of overall health. To our knowledge, there's no, been no offshore sampling, only coastal sampling. That presents a huge gap that must be filled with external observations or information streams until the full assessment is done. The full assessment must include offshore sampling. 
and hopefully the OPC effort will help in that endeavor. To conclude my uh, statement, we have a video uh, that hopefully, Chris, you could cue that up. It's just a real brief one that got put out by one of our captains Saturday. And again, we have already gone forward with uh, the zero retention uh, voluntarily. So if uh, you could cue up that video. Hey guys, we just uh, caught this copper rockfish. This is a species of concern right now on our coast and we're doing what we can to protect this by releasing these fish. We have these descending devices that have been proven effective for uh, releasing rockfish, helping them up with their barrel trauma. But uh, I'll show you how these work. We've got the rockfish we just captured. We'll get this thing in the water. And this will go down to a certain depth and release that rockfish. Especially with these copper rockfish, we want to make sure we get these back in the water. Not that we're not allowed to take them, but because it's kind of a species of concern at this point, we want to do what we can to protect the resource and our access to where we fish right now. So we're voluntarily releasing these copper rockfish. Okay, Mr. Vice Chair, that concludes my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Questions for Ken on this testimony? Marcy? Not so much a, a question, but just wanted to thank Ken for joining us here uh, this morning and offering the testimony and an explanation of the outreach efforts that uh, he and the SAC uh, operators are um, undertaking. Um, we really do, the, the department really um, rely on SAC and member vessels um, to aid us with um, outreach efforts because they really are um, a, a first line of communication with members of the public that we may not reach directly as, as department staff. So um, these efforts to uh, educate the public at large about the conservation benefits of um, releasing and releasing with de descending devices. Uh, we, we just couldn't ask for better partners and just want to um, thank Ken for putting together the short video clip and for uh, turning the focus to uh, copper and quill back when, um, you know, over the years, our focal species have been different. Um, we know it's it's new work and, and new education is needed, and you're just um, a critical asset in helping us with that uh, communication and outreach effort. So just wanted to thank you for being here. Thank you, Marcy. Okay, thanks, Marcy. Anyone else? Okay, thanks, Ken. Next up is uh, Mike Thompson, followed by Jamie Diamond. Mike? Mike, you're unmuted, so. Can you hear me? We can. Hello. You're there, Mike, we hear you. Hello. <laughs> okay, maybe someone text him to turn his speakers up. Mike? Okay, let's, um, let's go to Jamie Diamond and come back to Mike here, so. Uh, so, uh, Jamie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, good morning, Chair and Council members. Uh, my name is Jamie Diamond. I own Stardust and Coral Sea Sport Fishing out of Santa Barbara, California. Um, I came to you last November and pleaded with you not to take this, take this type of drastic action on copper rockfish, especially in light of your understanding, the data moderate assessment, while it was best available, was not best, period. I stated significant financial losses would be coming with a one fish limit, and it has already begun. Speaking for myself, $60,000 have been lost on charters so far for this year. Groups who cannot justify the cost for less quality fish in their bags. Uh, this has also turned into reduced income to my crew on fish cleaning with less fish in the bags because people are being more selective. Why? We're having to leave productive fishing grounds since we're actively avoiding copper rockfish. 
therefore wasting time and fuel, moving spots more than typical. We've noticed a reduced overall catch of rockfish, meaning less than limits, on a majority of our trips due to these same reasons, which is atypical for our company. We've had to leave spot after spot to avoid copper, which in turn leaves us without a full bag. We've only been able to run 29 out of 42 trips per boat this season due to weather. We started March 1st. Approximately 50% of those trips have been on the coast due to weather conditions making it unsafe and impossible to fish farther than a few miles off the coastline. So with any of the proposed scenarios, I would have only been able to run an average of 14 and a half out of 42 trips per boat. But it gets worse because the trips we were able to leave the coast, we were fishing at the Northern Channel Islands in far less than 50 fathoms of water because we really don't have much fishable ground in our zone in that deeper water. The severe season and depth changes proposed will be devastating to many operators up and down the California coast, including myself. All that said, to show the current burden on us so you understand the weight of my next comments. We are voluntarily taking the following measures in our company and across the fleet to reduce copper mortality right now. Zero copper retention. Avoidance of known copper heavy areas. Mandatory use of descending devices, which on my vessels, we already do this. Educating the public on the need to eliminate or reduce copper take right now. Begin implementation of breakaway gear to keep hooks higher in the water column since we know from the harm survey, copper prefer the bottom hooks. As well as the sampling project, Ken Frankie mentioned. Approximately 45% of copper rockfish are caught in greater than 50 fathoms as mentioned in one of the reports earlier. Due to the draconian discard mortality table still being used, anything deeper than 30 fathoms is counted as 100% dead. Why then would we be forced to stay out in deeper waters knowing we would have these interactions and it would all be considered dead? Logic would say give all depth access to spread out the fleet and allow those of us who have to fish on the near shore to do so while we're able to successfully descend copper and quillback, not necessarily in my area, but, but all the same. I would also note there's a much more accurate discard mortality table in existence. And from what I've been told, it's in process of approval and adoption. I ask that in addition to the self-management we're imposing, the adoption of the updated discard mortality table be considered, which could reduce the total copper mortality by 70 to 100 tons, which is incredibly significant. I'd also like to add a comment on the EC report. There will always be people who speed on the freeway. That's what tickets and fines are for. We don't shut down the whole freeway because some people speed and certainly not because CHP may be understaffed. Same should apply for access to our fishing grounds. Just because of the few, we should not punish the many. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Questions for uh, Jamie on her testimony? Okay. Next up is, um, let's go back to Mike Thompson. Mike, are you going with your speaker? How about now? You hear me now? We hear you. We heard you last time, but you can hear us. <laughs> I couldn't hear you. I, I'm not too good with computers. Sorry. Uh, okay. Anyway, <laughs> thank you, Vice Chair, Council Members. Um, my name is Mike Thompson. I'm a member of the HMSAS, Charter, Southern Charter Boat Representative, but today I'm here about ground fish. Um, so I have uh, been the captain of the commercial passenger fishing vessel aggressor participating in the hook and line rock fish survey from the pilot program in 2003 until our last survey in fall of 2021. Uh, so I have some things to tell you about this, the survey. Um, I sent in a, uh, some raw data, a chart of raw data. I, I don't see it on the screen. I don't know if the council seen it or not, but it must be available somewhere. But anyway, what that shows is that, uh, okay, first of all, our gear, we use a, a five foot ganyan. It's about six feet long from the bottom swivel to the top and five hooks <laughs> at every foot interval. Uh, the data shows that uh, 
80 percent, 70 to 80 percent of the copper rock fish are caught on the bottom two hooks and only 10 percent are caught on the top two hooks. Uh, so our suggestion is, is that we add a six foot leader on the bottom of our two hook ganyons that we fish bottom fish with. And in that way, we should be able to uh, really reduce our interaction with copper at all. Uh, so that's it really, it's just kind of a follow up to Ken's comment. We, we really feel that this would be effective to mitigate our interaction with copper rockfish. And uh, I had one other comment about the hook and line survey that I think is important. I, it's been my understanding that the hook and line survey was not given much weight in the latest assessment for some reason. There, there's something you need to understand. When, when this survey was first started, it was specifically designed to target Boccaccio rockfish. In fact, for the first few years, it was actually called the Boccaccio rockfish survey. Consequently, we ended up catching all kinds of rockfish and uh, we've been used in, uh, what is it, 18 assessments, I believe, covering 10 species. And here's the deal. We were, our industry was asked for information on where to catch Boccaccio when this whole thing started. The reason our sample size is so small is because most of our sites are deeper than 40 fathoms. We didn't provide much information on shallow water. What I can tell you is that the fish that we catch offshore are generally larger and, and uh, our ovary samples show that they're mature spawning fish. And I think you need to take the hook and line survey more seriously than apparently you do. So anyway, that's it. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Questions for Mike? Okay. Okay. Next up would be um, Tucker McCombs, followed by Jeff Chester. Tucker? Hi, can you hear me? We can. Hi, I'm Tucker McCombs. Uh, I own Ventura Sport Fishing and three CPFBs. Uh, we rely on bottom fishing for almost all of our business. Um, my boats mainly fish the Northern Channel Islands. Um, we've seen zero um, decline in copper rockfish. It doesn't seem like the science is uh, coinciding with what we're seeing out there on the ocean. So, but fleet wide, all the boats in our area are doing the same thing as Jamie's saying. We're not taking the copper rockfish in our bags and we're trying to avoid them the best we can. Uh, the 2023 and 24 management measures of 50 fathoms and seaward will have severe economic impacts to some and will be irreversible. So if the science supports it, we need to expedite a path to reopen the near shore through season in season action. All proposed scenarios will probably put my landing and boats out of business, but that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Tucker. Questions for Tucker on his testimony? Okay. Next up is uh, Jeff Shester, followed by uh, Jeff Jessup. Jeff? Is he there? Okay, we will go back to try Jeff here. Um, uh, Jeff Jessup, Jeff? Yes or no? No? Okay. Um, okay, Jeff Lackey. Jeff? Yes, can you hear me? I, I can. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you, Council Members, for your time. I would like to address the critical nature of canary in the trawl fishery to help provide context about its importance and its use. It is a species that is kept as insurance by bottom trawl, rockfish, and hake vessels because there is not enough quota for a targeted fishery, and it is caught everywhere on the coast in different fisheries except in very deep waters. Canary can be constrained into individual vessels at 40 to 50 percent fleet utilization or possibly less. Yellow eye has been extraordinarily constraining for area effort with trawl utilization of yellow eye quota not reaching 20% in any one year, that is if my math and my memory are correct. 
It may be counterintuitive that lower allocations could actually lead to lower utilization, but for critically incidentally caught species, low allocation yields different tipping points to different vessels in suspending targeting at certain fathom ranges altogether and deter overall effort. This is just the nature of species with high incidental catch rates relative to their allocation in IFQ fisheries. And this dynamic is exacerbated by its catch rate variability described further. Canary is subject to lightning strikes in the trawl fishery for bottom trawl and midwater trawl for both rockfish and whiting. This is true for the whiting fishery, especially in years when whiting moves into shallower waters, usually in the summer. Therefore, whiting vessels keep significant canary quota into the fall. If whiting vessels have canary lightning strikes, such as happened in 2018, they have to pay whatever it takes to lease quota and provide more insurance quota. This is why any fluctuations downward in trial allocation of canary in absolute numbers are likely to much more negatively impact a bottom trawl than midwater trawl. When we consider further that the utilization levels for bottom trawl dominant species are very low and management and stakeholder parties are looking for much improved utilization going forward, canary will certainly be that much more of a constraint. The current fishery and trawl program we have is not the program we want in the future. Already in 2022, there are signs of a rebound in catch for bottom trawl after two very rough pandemic years and we, we look to really um, uh, build on that going forward. Uh, thank you, and that concludes my remarks. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Jeff. Questions for Jeff on his testimony? Okay, thanks, Jeff. And I'll go back to Jeff Shester, is he there? Or Jeff Jessup? Okay, all right. Oh. Jessup. Okay. Jeff Jessup. Okay. Uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Jessup, are you there? Hold on here. Okay. We testified. Okay, I see Jeff Jessup never saw the prompt to unmute. It was in the chat feature. See Jeff here in the mute. Um. Okay, how about now? Okay, we're, we got you. All right, technical difficulties here. Sorry. Um, anyways, I'll keep it short here, guys. I want to pretty much going to reiterate what Ken and uh, Tucker have already commented on. Um, I am a little concerned with. Uh, well, first of all, let me start out by saying I, I, I am part owners in 22nd Street Landing here, as well as I own three CF, uh, CPFV vessels. Um, so this is obviously of great concern to us. Um, I'm a little concerned about the sampling. Um, it's pretty obvious to us that most, if not all, the sampling is going on on the local boats, the half day or three quarter day boats fishing along the coast. Um, I'm in complete agreement with Tucker. Uh, the reality in, in our eyes, what we're seeing at the outer islands uh, just doesn't really line up. I don't believe with the science. Um, I think if there was some sampling on the overnight boats done at San Nicolas, uh, you know, San Miguel, Santa Rosa Islands, you guys would see uh, a big difference in 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 coppers. Um, we are going to go along with this voluntary program where we're not going to retain them this season and educate our customers on it. But um, as far as these outer islands, we're 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 in a little bit different uh, 
category here as far as where our boats fish primarily, if they push us outside of 50 fathom, that essentially is gonna take San Nicolas and Santa Barbara Islands off the table for us entirely because there's 40 fathom restrictions there. Um, unless I misunderstood something here or you guys are have intentions of opening up deeper water, that would basically take our fishing areas off the table for us entirely. Um, anywhere there's a 40 fathom restriction and that would include the outer banks as well. So that's of uh, big concern to us. Um, so we'd like to see the sampling um, on, the, on the overnight boats, on the offshore boats, and we'd be more than happy to accommodate the samplers to do that. Um, basically it feels to me like we're trying to solve a small problem with a very broad stroke of a brush here. Um, anyways, uh, I guess that's about it for me. Um, I just like to see the sampling go on where I think it's going to be a little bit more meaningful. And Mike, I guess that's it. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Questions for Jeff? Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for your testimony. Um, I just want to make sure I'm clear when you're referring to uh, 40 fathom depth constraints that you are currently adhering to at Santa Barbara Island and San Nicolas. Um, the reason you are held to those depths is because those fishing areas uh, are within the cow cod conservation area. Just want to let's, let's be clear about that. And then maybe you can explain for us what portion of uh, your business uh, comes from fishing uh, at those two islands uh, when you consider uh, all of the different types of trips that you your operation runs. Thank you. Yeah. You guys can hear me still? Yes, we can. Yeah, so it, basically on March 1st, you know, we try to get most of our maintenance done and have our boats running by March 1st. So a lot of our early spring trips are uh, targeting rockfish. Um, yes, all, all that is correct. Those are in the CCAs. Um, so, you know, we don't do a lot of rock fishing at the inner islands like Catalina. Um, we do fish San Clemente a bit where there, it is not in the CCA, but a, a majority of our trips are targeting, you know, San Nicolas Island um, because of the quality of rockfish and the, the, you know, the, the availability of coppers and, and vermilion and things like this. Um, so it, it would be very detrimental to us, especially in the early season. Um, you know, our, our season changes. Unfortunately, we have other things that we fish as the year progresses. But, uh, um, you know, basically, if we went ahead and pushed this 50 fathom thing in the spring, it would it would essentially shut us down from the areas that we primarily fish um, and force us into other areas that are less productive. So um, I, I don't know exactly what it would do, but it's definitely not, uh, would not be a good thing for us. Oh, okay, further questions for uh, Jeff? Okay, all right, I see no hands. Um, and I see Jeff Shester is, uh, is logged in. Jeff, are you there? Yes, um, and my apologies, Mr. Vice Chair. I stepped away for just for a second and missed my shot. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to provide comment. Um, this is Jeff Shester representing Oceana for the record. Um, just want, briefly wanted to um, uh, speak in support of the short, short belly rockfish uh, item under this uh, agenda item. Um, in the GMT reports, this was listed as item 12. And in the an um, analytic document, it was listed as item 9. Um, we just want to uh, support the, um, the and, and thank the, the council for, uh, for its November motion. Uh, to include some language uh, that would set a, a mortality threshold for short belly rockfish that would initiate a review of, of fishery information, consideration of management measures, et cetera, if the, um, if the catch uh, is projected to or exceeds 2,000 metric tons. Uh, this would uh, hit the 
um, the council's policy goal of uh, minimizing um, the incidental catch of short belly rockfish in, in other fisheries, uh, recognizing it importance as a forage species um, and uh, we we support the GMT's recommendation to adopt this language which is currently option uh, two as the preliminary preferred alternative um, we, we do note that uh, the language is a little vague and does not include uh, certain information particularly the list of information that would be considered if, if the trigger uh, was uh, was hit or projected to be hit a list of potential management measures uh, or the reconsideration of ecosystem component status that was all in the, the, the November motion. Uh, we would support adding uh, those details uh, into this language, but uh, just mostly wanted to voice our support for um, for moving forward with that option to, to put that uh, 2000 ton trigger in the fishery management plan. Uh, thank you and be happy to take any comments. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Questions for Jeff on this testimony? Okay, not seeing any, thank you, Jeff. Okay, that, that's a vessel or public comment. And um, I believe um, before we suspend this, this, um, this item um, until tomorrow, I just open up the council floor for discussion before we, uh, we do that, if anybody so wishes to. Okay, well, with that, I'm going to hand the gavel back to Chair Grelnick and let him finish the day. So, Chair Grelnick. Thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. So, um, as uh, the Vice Chair indicated, we'll pick this up tomorrow for discussion and action. Um, we have remaining before us uh, another lengthy ground fish item. So, we'll pick that up after lunch. Um, so, we'll break here and come back at one o'clock. And um, we'll pick up uh, agenda item F6. So have a good lunch.
All right, welcome back. It's one o'clock. We're going to get started on our afternoon agenda, uh, which is uh, agenda item F6, the non trawl rockfish conservation area range of alternatives. And uh, I'll turn to our staff officer here. Uh, I guess we've got a couple of folks here. Uh, Brett or Jesse, whomever is going to get us going here. And good afternoon, council members. This is Brett Weedoff and uh, agenda item F6. I have Jesse Dorpinghaus here. We're going to tag team this presentation to you. Um, I just want to go ahead to the next slide here and tell you what's happening today. Uh, Jesse's going to go ahead and put up the slides for you guys to take a look at. Um, and we'll roll through the analysis that we have and the information that's on the briefing book as well. So we'll take a pause here if we can get Jesse to put that up on the screen. Yeah, I need to be able to share. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there an overview before we get into the slide? Uh, it's within the presentation. It's all the slides, okay. Yeah. Uh, I do want to take the time to recognize just the monumental effort that has gone on to produce this uh, document thus far. And um, it's it's been a, a long road, and I know it'll be a little bit longer. Uh, however, I just want to recognize all the effort that the GAP has put on put in this and and the, uh, the industry members outside the group and the states and just trying to pull together something that is, uh, you know, reasonable and uh, it's a very big deal, obviously. It's a really uh, big action and a lot to consider. And so we're gonna do our best to help you digest that information here and now, and then see what the next steps are. So I just wanted to just, like I said, recognize everybody who's put a lot of effort in this because it, it, it is kind of looking like an Amendment 28 package with a lot of collaboration. And I applaud the collaboration that's happening behind the scenes between council staff, between NIMS staff, between uh, the industry, between states. I just, uh, I just see a lot of uh, uh, common ground being created here and I do appreciate that. And it makes uh, Jesse and I's job a little bit easier when we nail things down and get uh, the words correct so we can do a proper analysis for you. So, okay, next slide, Jesse. All right, we'll give you a little bit of background and some info on the area-based management measures that apply under this action. And then we'll turn to Jesse, and she'll do a little uh, assessment of the each alternative that we have right now drafted. And then we have, of course, peppered throughout some questions to consider. Next slide. There's a, a whole host of uh, briefing book items in here. Uh, of course, we got the attachment one. That's what we're going to be referring to in our presentation here. We uh, got the CDFW report in the advanced briefing book regarding CalCod conservation area protections. We have two supplemental reports that came in uh, during the meeting, and uh, that's report one and two, uh, both the GMT and uh, the, the GAP had, was able to review those, and also uh, preliminary, the HC, the Habitat Committee did as well. So all the information that's in the books from CDFW and OVW has been vetted and discussed, so I really appreciate them getting that information out to the group. Uh, in a timely manner. There's supplemental HC report, of course, the Habitat Committee, and then we've got a GMT gap and EC. We've got some public comment as well. So we got a lot to go through, so I'll be, I'll be quickly quick here. Next slide, please. Again, the history of the action, this definitely stems well before 2019, but we're gonna uh, look at what we've done so far since then, and that's the gap was directed to develop the scope and the purpose and need of this action. And then we started initiating a real big scoping process and further developing the draft purpose and need. Uh, and there's been a lot of collaboration on these things. And then we refined the purpose and need and developed a range of alternatives. Uh, there was some questions about California or the CalCod conservation area off of California and some potential changes off of Washington that were included in the in the package in November. And then we understood that there was some things happening uh, in California that would further refine uh, their uh, alternatives. So what we wound up with was revising our our action here uh, and 
go to the next slide, please, was to really just review and potentially revise the range of alternatives as appropriate. We didn't think that we were ready for preliminary preferred alternatives at this meeting, so we thought some more scoping and some more discussions were needed. Uh, and so that has happened a lot behind the scenes, and I do appreciate uh, everybody's input and trying to put their heads together on what makes sense. Uh, there is a possibility that we might need to look at the purpose and need again, just uh, to incorporate some things. And I'll get into that a little bit, mostly centered on, uh, on habitat protections. And so we want to make sure that the purpose and need does connect to our alternatives. So we're also asking for you to provide some guidance on the development of the analysis and look at the schedule as needed as well. This package is growing a little. Uh, there is a lot of analysis that's going to be needed. Right now it's scheduled for a potential range of alternatives uh, adoption PPA uh, in September. Uh, and so depending on how much is needed in the package and analysis needed, we'll do our best. If that sticks in, in uh, September, we'll probably have to do a check-in in June to decide that. Uh, and see where we're at. Maybe we'll need to uh, out till November to to uh, maybe pick a PPA. Uh, next slide, please. So just we truncate the purpose and need here. And I just like I said, wanted to highlight that there may be some uh, additional text that's needed uh, to address some of the things that were added. So the purpose of the proposed action is to provide ac access to the additional areas that are currently closed to ground fish fishing inside the non troll conservation area and uh, cow cod conservation areas. And really we're focused that the access might provide, uh, you know, that by actions such as moving or modifying the existing non trawl RCA and CCA boundaries and allowing ground fish fishing inside the non trawl RCA and or the CCA using only select gears uh, that minimize bottom contact. So we'll look at uh, some of the options on the table and, and try to figure out uh, what the next steps are uh, is possibly modifying this purpose and need as needed. Next slide, please. A little background, of course, everybody knows what the non troll RCA is, established in 2003 to protect over fish species. Uh, all but yellow eye has been rebuilt now. So we're looking, um, you know, that it's possible that some of the RCA may need to be retained um, because of yellow eye conservation. Uh, but all in all, the boundaries have been amed amended a little bit here and there through the ground fish specifications process. But really the specs is not the proper mechanism to start considering large scale changes that are being proposed under this item. So overall though, like I said, the non troll RCA is though prohibiting some activity and trying to target healthy shelf uh, rockfish. Next slide, please. Uh, the cow cod conservation was of course established back in 2001 to protect cow cod and of it was declared and re rebuilt in 2019, so it may warrant removal of that area and gain some access. Um, there's two areas on the screen there, the west and the east. And then in general, vessels are prohibited from fishing outside 40 fathoms around the island within the CCAs, uh, noting that there's some exceptions for uh, commercial and recreational uh, ground fish vessels. Uh, the CDFW report, of course, adds some additional areas that are proposed to be closed, and we'll go. Uh, we'll have Andrew Klein in the seat to uh, go over those changes in, uh, after we're done here. Next slide, please. Uh, looking at yellow eye rockfish conservation areas, you asked us to look at the current suite of YRCAs that are available to you to utilize, um, whether they are active and uh, what their positioning is relative to non troll RCA. So we did take a look at that and provide maps of that information. Now, those were first developed, of course, back in 2003 uh, to help rebuild Yellow Eye. And uh, only uh, one currently active non troll North Coast commercial YRCA is, is in play right here. That's in that map, that's that little green section. Though it's not little by all means. Uh, there are some uh, voluntary avoidance areas for ground fish, uh, fixed gear fishing off of Washington, but generally most are not active for non trawl gears. Next slide, please. Uh, you asked us to think about block area closures. Um, currently, these are available only for trawl gears, and uh, they can be in instituted in pre-season or in-season, and so uh, they could be applied sector specific, gear specific, duration for as long as you need. Uh, but generally, they're to control bycatch of, of species or protected species like salmon um, or 
uh, just some, if there's a bycatch issue it, with a certain species that you might be exceeding or approaching uh, harvest guiding or a ACL. Uh, the main issue the council needs to consider here in developing BACs is really there's, um, you know, for non troll gears is the lack of data, uh, in season data and, and its availability. We really only have fish ticket data and uh, retained species. So it's a little challenging to surmise what, what the issues might be. Um, there is low observer coverage as well, and that information comes in uh, a lagging as well. We will have logbooks, of course, starting in, we believe, 2023, based on that March Council action, where that logbook requirement was expanded to all non-trawl uh, groundfish fisheries. So we wanted to make sure that the, we recognize that action. We're not proposing anything new within this non-trawl RCA package or area management package. Um, so we expect that that information at some point will start coming in to provide the council with some data to use uh, in season best uh, or just additional data to help uh, decide whether block area closures are, uh, are needed. Uh, regardless, we did have some questions to you though. Uh, does the council wanna develop the BACs coastwide uh, for all non troll gears? Because the motion really only specified uh, alternatives one through four, using the tools for alternatives one through four. And so we want to ask the council, do you want the BACs to apply off of Washington or do you want to apply down south off of California, south of 3427? Next slide, please. Okay, looking into some of these things where the Habitat Committee provided some thoughts on uh, looking at impacts to essential fish habitats, I just want to quickly touch on this. Uh, this is a big deal, I know, and, and has made this package grown a bit, but I know it's, a, it's uh, getting some serious consideration on how to handle this stuff. So just the background, of course, EFHCAs are really designed to protect or mitigate habitat impacts. And right now we have two types of EH, EFHCAs uh, in play and being utilized on the West Coast. There's a bottom trawl and a bottom contact EFH. Those apply uh, to all gears and all fisheries, federal and non-federal. So uh, those areas prohibit fishing activity within them, uh, and they include state-managed fisheries as well. Uh, Non-trawl fisheries are allowed to fish inside bottom trawl EFHCA. So there's an understanding, and need to understand that nuance there. So, But some of these EFHCAs do overlap with the non-trawl RCA. So hence, we wanted to take a look at that where we might be opening up an area uh, that would be otherwise exposed to impacts to a ground fish fishing activity. Next slide, please. When we really started to chew on all this stuff and digest what the council's motion looked like, uh, it was really um, starting to come to light about what we need to consider. And I want we wanted to start thinking about pathways as we start to consider our analysis uh, that we put together in attachment one and including the CDFW and ODFW proposals that are now uh, in the briefing book. So as part of this process, we want to be cognizant of these areas that would be exposed by the removal of the non troll RCA and the CCA as well. Um, it's also important you know, to be clear that we're really trying to articulate the need for the action in each area, the proposed protections and to which fisheries they would apply. So we really want to take a closer look at each area when it's exposed under one of the alternatives to remove uh, or remove the all RCA or to truncate it and expose some areas. So when we look at that, we want to consider the enforceability and the impact to current ground fish operations in each area. So we wanted to take a little deeper dive uh, than just doing a, a blanket approach uh, where you would just say, well, all fishing activity might be prohibited in this area or something more along the lines that just bottom contact fishing activity is prohibited in that area. So we want to examine the FMP to really decide on a mechanism to consider EFHCA, CCAs, and other closure options. So like I said, in the ODFW, CDFW proposals, there's some ideas there. Um, and maybe looking at YRCA implementation or redesigning of those things. Uh, so we want to just, like as an example, say regarding the current council motion, you said uh, add block area uh, I'm sorry, add bottom contact groundfish EFHCA layer be on top of an existing bottom trawl EFHCA uh, to, to prevent uh, impacts to newly opened areas. Uh, 
Um, so as an example there too, it's, it, it, that would likely include an FMP amendment and maybe using an interim review under habitat framework process in our FMP. So that, that can be can be utilized. But these are some of the things that we're going to have to digest and help you uh, help walk you through uh, in the next iteration of our analysis. But we wanted to make sure that we understood the implications of areas being open, areas being closed, and the purpose of those things. So, okay, so that's my general overview of these things. There's a lot, like I said, going on. And Jesse's going to take over here and walk you through all the alternatives as we have in the books and then talk a little bit about, you know, some things that we need to ask of you and consider as we move forward in developing uh, the range of alternatives and refining or adding to them. Great. Thanks, Brett. Um, so I'm going to start working through our alternatives. Uh, assume my computer wants to go forward. There we go. So alternative one would allow vessels fishing in the open access ground fish sector to fish in the non trawl RCA between 3427 and 4616 with select hook and line gear. Specifically, dingle bar, long line, and vertical hook and line gear anchored to the bottom would be prohibited. Vessels could fish inside and outside of the non trawl RCA, but only approved gear would be allowed on board. Based on our preliminary assessment of impacts, um, with this alternative, we would likely see increased attainments of midwater rockfish, um, leading to posit positive socioeconomic benefits. There are likely limited impacts to species of concern, such as yellow eye, quillback, or copper, um, or habitat, just because of the design is to um, these to be non-bottom contact style gears. In terms of protected species, there is a potential risk to seabirds um, with the specific allowance of natural bait. Um, but with all this, there is some uncertainty related to gear configurations. And I'll get how um, this conversation kind of plays into the specs conversation here in a couple of slides. Alternative two is the exact same as alternative one, except it looks specifically at allowing limited entry fixed gear vessels to now fish up to their LE fixed gear limits. So all the other uh, prohibitions are the same and our impacts would likely also um, be similar just for the LE fixed gear sector. Now for each of these alternatives, I have one of these fishery sector overview slides because I know it can get a little confusing to figure out which alternative applies to which group of vessels. And so this was kind of an idea I had to, to walk y'all through that. So for alternative one, um, as I mentioned, it's specific to our targeted ground fish sector with an open access. Um, however, as was discussed under um, the specs item in 12E, LE fixed gear vessels could choose to operate in the open access fishery, um, but they would be restricted to their open to the open access limits under alternative one. Which is why, when we look at alternative two, this is specifically focusing on the LE fixed gear uh, sector and would allow them to fish up to those higher trip limits um, associated with LE fixed gear fisheries. Now there has been a bit of confusion on the overlap between what's in the non trial RCA action discussed in the harvest specifications, AKA 12E, as compared to alternatives one and two in this package. Now, I know Katie presented a very similar table to this in uh, the GMT presentation that you just saw under agenda item F4, but we thought it was worth going through again pretty quickly and pointing out some of the differences. Um, so focusing on um, under the council's motion in November for the harvest specifications, it, it looked at allowing um, open access LA fixed gear and IQ gear switchers to use uh, non-bottom contact hook and line gear um, to fish within the non trawl RCA. And I'm sorry, I kind of got ahead of myself. So um, <laughs> there on the first column, you see items and these are kind of the key points that separate each of these uh, versions of the alternative. And then you can see 
The second column is looking at the 23-24 harvest specifications. So this is the original motion moved in November. Then we have the NIMS 12E report um, that was brought forward in March and April that kind of slimmed down the original 12E. And then finally, in the far right-hand column, we're looking at alternatives one and two in this package. So the first difference that you'll notice is that the council's original motion for the non-trial RCA package only extended this allowance to use non-bottom contact hook and line gear down to 3427. So that's one area that you might wanna consider. Um, it's in our questions to consider that I'll get to here in the next slide. Additionally, when it comes to the sectors, uh, this package uh, specifically would look at allowing LE fixed gear vessels via alternative two to fish up to their limits. So under the 12E proposal in the harvest specifications, uh, vessels would be restricted to those open access limits only. With the non-trial RCA package, we're also looking at potentially a broader suite of non-bottom contact hook and line gears. Across all of these proposals, dingle bar, long line, and vertical hook and line gear anchored to the bottom um, were all proposed to be prohibited. However, um, if the council chooses to adopt the NIMS 12E report, which would only include EFP specified gears, um, there might be different gear configurations that we could look at as a part of this package to promote um, flexibility for fishermen. And then finally, um, on the question of bait, um, under the NEMPS 12E report, only artificial bait would be allowed. However, uh, natural bait has been of key interest to stakeholders. Um, and so that is something that is a part of the current non-trial RCA alternatives one and two for vessels to be able to use uh, natural bait. Okay. So um, a couple questions to consider uh, would be, does the council want to extend the scope of alternatives one and two to the US-Mexico border, similar to the 12E proposal for 23-24 um, biennial specifications process? And we'll note that if, um, this isn't really a question, but rather if the NIMS 12E proposal is selected for 2023-2024, then our analysis for PPA would really take that into account. So we would look at the additional factors I just noted. So looking at a natural bait, expanding gear configurations. So our analysis would look at kind of picking up the pieces that weren't included in the NIMS 12B. And finally, um, just wanted to get a little clarification from the council. Um, with respect to alternative two specifically, is does the council want to allow IFQ gear switching vessels to utilize the proposed gear types in the non-trawl RCA? So currently, if an IFQ gear switcher um, would only be allowed to, uh, it was a little unclear based on the motion and alternative two because it was specific to trip limits. So we're looking on some clarification on whether um, the council wants to allow these vessels to utilize their uh, quota pounds to fish in the non-trawl RCA, as opposed to if they have dual permits registered, they could switch off and go to the LE fixed gear fishery, for example. Okay. Moving on to alternative three, which would move the seaward boundary of the non-trail RCA from 100 fathoms to 75 fathoms from 3427 to 4616. So under this alternative, all non-trail gear would be permitted um, in the 75 to 100 fathom depth bin um, where allowed. This would open nearly 2,500 square miles to fishing, um, again, to all non-trail gears. It's likely to increase attainment of various non trawl allocations, although there potentially might be higher impacts to yellow eye. In terms of sea uh, protected species, there would likely be an increased risk compared to no action or alternatives one or two in relation to seabirds and whales, as we would be looking at additional effort from or potential additional effort from long line and pot gear and where that's happening. And then um, as Brett mentioned, one of the uh, big considerations here is our increased risk to habitat. 
So currently the sub option is to change bottom draw EFH EFHCAs to bottom contact ground fish EFHCAs. Um, under this alternative, there'd be 272 square miles of bottom trawl EFHCAs opened up um, and 138 square miles of hard substrate exposed. Okay, so back to our little graphic here. So who would be affected by this action? So similar to alternatives one and two, open access targeted groundfish and LE fixed gear vessels would be permitted to fish in those opened areas using any gear types, as well as any vessels fishing in the uh, trawl IQ sector with fixed gear. Additionally, I wanted to note that salmon troll vessels would now be subject to a smaller RCA within the scope of latitude and therefore within the 75 to 100 fathom bends if they're fishing there, they could retain open access groundfish limits. The current limits though for yellowtail and lingcod if salmon troll vessels were fishing within the bounds would remain the same. Now note, uh, I, I wanted to note here that halibut fisheries are not included in this action as it currently stands. The halibut regulations are specifically reference the non trawl RCA boundaries. So if the council wanted the change in regulations for the halibut fishery, they should notice that intent here. So uh, for our questions to consider for alternative three, does the council want to consider sub option one for all EFHCAs exposed through removal of the non trawl RCAs? And to what extent should a bottom trawl EFHCA also be closed to ground fish bottom contact gears? Are we looking at only the portion exposed under alternative three, or would we be looking at the entire bottom trawl EFHCA? Additionally, does the council want to include halibut fisheries within this alternative? So I wanted to take a quick second and a quick minute and look at this council option on EFHCAs as it currently stands. So right now, the council added, a, in November, the council added an option to change the designation of a bottom trawl EFHCA um, into a ground fish bottom contact EFHCA, which was a new type. And, um, as Brett noted, this is a new type of EFHCA closure um, that we would be looking at doing. And also wanted to note that we really wanna look at not changing the designation, but rather we're adding this layer of protection. If we were to change the designation of any of these areas, we would actually lose protection um, for against fisheries like pink shrimp, for example. So a little complicated, but we're, Think about it as adding a layer of protection to habitat. Now to get to my last question on the last slide about to what degree does the council wanna look at adding this layer of protection for groundfish bottom contact gears. So some bottom trawl EFHCAs are already ex exposed to groundfish bottom contact gears. And a good example of this is the band and high spot, which I have here on the screen. So the brown uh, polygon is the bottom trawl EFHCA for the band and high spot. And then we have our current non trawl RCA boundary in the yellow green color. Under alternative three, all that hash mark section would be um, removed from the non trawl RCA. So the portion in red would be exposed um, to potential fishing. So in this case, the Bandon High Spot, the outside edges are already being fished by bottom contact ground fish gear, but the council might wanna consider if you wanna close the entire thing to bottom contact ground fish gear or just the portion highlighted in red. Um, so in a different situation, you have the Arago Reef, which is kind of on the top portion of this map. And so you can see that a majority of this bottom trawl EFHCA is actually going to remain uh, within the non-trawl RCA. However, there's that tiny little sliver 
um, in red that would actually be exposed to bottom contact gear. So in this case, the council might want to look at um, re adding a layer of for ground fish bottom contact EFHCA for the entirety of the uh, EFHCA um, rather than trying to add that little sliver, um, which might be difficult to enforce. Again, just trying to point out some of the complexities that we're going to be dealing with and reiterating Brett's point that this is likely going to be kind of a every individual EFHCA might need to be looked at depending on how the council moves forward with the range of alternatives. Okay, moving forward to alternative four, which would remove the non trial RCA from 3427 to 4616. This would open up nearly 8,800 square miles to fishing and using all non-trawl gears, and we would likely to see increased attainments of various non-trawl allocations. And I'll note here that salmon trawl vessels would no longer be restricted to RCA limits within those latitudes, so they would be able to retain, only they'd only be subject to the open access limits within this uh, latitude range. Here, we're likely to see potential higher impacts to yellow eye, copper, and quillback, and an increased risk compared to other alternatives to seabirds and whales. Finally, we see here, again, an increased risk to habitat, uh, and we would likely see uh, close to 1,000 square miles of bottom trawl EFHCAs would be opened, and a little over 500 square miles of hard substrate would be exposed. In terms of our fishery sector overview and those affected by alternative four, it's going to be exactly what we just talked about with alternative three. So all of our directed non trawl ground fish sectors, as well as salmon troll. And the questions for alternative four are the exact same as alternative three. So we're looking at wanting some guidance on how do you want to consider EFHCAs and do you want to include halibut fisheries within this alternative? Okay, now we're moving on to alternative five, which would be to remove the CCA. So currently fishing restrictions, um, so this would apply to both commercial and recreational fisheries. Currently they're restricted to fishing within 40 fathoms around the island, but uh, CDFW in November had proposed adding new potential lines at 50, 60, 75, 100, and 150 fathoms to be developed around the islands and banks. And you can actually kind of see these in the reddish yellow boundaries around the islands. Um, of course, you can see these close up maps in our report. Uh, the non trial RCA boundaries to be used have yet to be identified, but would be identified through this process. In terms of preliminary impacts, um, we're looking at increased attainment to non trawl allocations leading to economic benefits. There is some uncertainty related to groundfish bycatch impacts. And then in terms of habitat impacts, a majority of the CCA is actually bottom trawl EFHCA. Um, and there would be 307 square miles of hard substrate exposed. And while this is our kind of preliminary estimate of impacts, I'll note that Andre, when he speaks to the CCA report, they are proposing some closures due to habitat, habitat concerns for corals and sponges. Looking at alternative five, so again, we have our commercial, um, similar to all the previous alternatives, our directed commercial ground fish sectors would all be permitted to operate within um, the CCA bounds and the applicable non trawl RCA boundaries. But here we also have our uh, recreational fisheries would be able to operate within those bounds as well. So our questions to consider for alternative five, what non trawl RCA lines would be recommended to be used if the CCA were repealed? Does the council want to consider developing block area closures south of 3427 that could be applied within the current bounds of the CCA? 
And then um, this last part, um, this was our initial question, but um, this is just getting some specificity about what fisheries would be restricted to any new closed areas as proposed in CDFW report one. And does this action meet the purpose and need developed by the council, which Brett has already spoken to a little bit in terms of habitat um, and aligning the purpose and need. And our last alternative is alternative six, which would change the seaward boundary off of Washington for pot gear only. Um, so this would open up limited areas seaward of the 75 fathom depth contour, uh, and these are yet to be identified. However, the goals outlined in the WDFW report for November include minimizing yellow-white bycatch, avoiding sector conflicts, impacts the sensitive habitat, but be easy to enforce. Since there were no coordinates for the areas uh, identified, staff did a preliminary assessment based on opening the non trial RCA from 75 to 100 fathoms. So this is similar to what we did for Alternative 3, but it's just off of Washington. This would open 715 square miles to pot gear, and the economic benefits um, are thought to be through access to larger stable fish, uh, which would result in a higher price per pound um, for vessels. There is likely little yellow eye impact with the use of pot gear, um, and there is some preliminary analysis in table 13 of attachment one. In terms of potential habitat impacts, uh, there are three EFHCAs that would be exposed under alternative uh, uh, moving the non trawl RCA back to 75 fathoms. Um, two of these are already primarily exposed to pot gear but Gray's Canyon has a higher degree of exposure, so just something for the council to consider. Uh, there are potential whale risk when considering additional pot gear and moving that pot gear um, where it may be fished. And then of course there might need to be further investigation needed on sector conflicts. Um, I know the GAP spoke to this in March and um, I believe spoke to it in their current report under this agenda item. So while the sectors officially to be impacted by alternative six are still yet to be determined, at the broadest level, we're looking at uh, our targeted non trawl commercial ground fish sectors. So LE fixed gear, open access targeted ground fish, and then uh, our IFQ gear switchers. And they would be able to use pot gear in these select areas to harvest sable fish or potentially other species. Again, that is yet to be determined. Questions to consider here, uh, are there areas seawards of the 75 fathom depth contour that can be identified as possible areas to be opened under the criteria laid out by the alternative six description? Does the council wanna prohibit all bottom contact ground fish gear and bottom trawl EFHCAs that would be exposed under this action? And does the council want to consider developing block area closures for waters off the Washington coast? And again, your council action for today is to review and potentially revise the range of alternatives as appropriate and to provide guidance on the development of any analyses and schedule as needed. And Brett and I would be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Jesse and Brett. Let's see if there are any questions on, on the lengthy and detailed presentation. Pete Hassemer. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks, Jesse. Maybe I can start off with the easy question here. Can you go back? I don't know which slide number it is, uh, but it was the first one for alternative three. That's it. And the question also, I believe, applies the same to alternatives four and six, but it's the piece about the increased risk to seabirds and whales. And as I heard you talk about this, and I read in the analysis, the increased risk seems to come from the simple fact that more area is available to be fished and therefore 
effort would be increasing um, as opposed to just a redistribution of the current effort. If a fisher were under the current arrangement were fishing pots in 105 fathoms, now they could go move those same pots in the 85 fathoms and fish them instead of buying additional gear and putting it out there. So either that or um, there's the increased potential for interactions in those areas. So can you, um, and as I said, that uh, applied to alternatives four and six also, can you explain where the increased risk um, originates from under those scenarios? Thanks. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Hasmer. Yeah, um, I think we could maybe revise this below a little bit. Um, so this is just our preliminary assessment, and this is really based on the fact that we could see a potential increase in effort if we were to open up these areas. Um, this is by no means definitive, but it's really linked to the fact that we're looking at um, long line potential increase in long line effort um, if under alternatives three and four, and then um, pot affecting whales under three, four, and six potentially. Um, but all that is really a preliminary assessment and more relative to the other alternatives. So um, hopefully that answers your question. So I, I don't wanna make it sound like we've definitively answered that question. It, it's something that we are, it was more of a relative assessment, like I said on this the screen here. So it's, it's an increased risk compared to the other alternatives rather than just like an increased risk overall. Uh, thank you. That answers my question. And I understand it's just a, a very preliminary or early step in the analysis. Thanks again. Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Jesse. I'm looking at slides 16 and 17, where you've laid out for us the uh, items uh, involved in this action compared with the 2324 specs, uh, the NIMS 12E report, and the non trawl RCA alts 1 and 2. My question is about the IFQ gear switch sector. And I believe the question that you're posing for us in slide 17 is whether we want uh, the action for Alt 1 and 2 to apply, or I'm sorry, for alternative 2. Um, only, I guess, um, if we want to allow gear switch vessels to utilize the proposed gears in the non trawl RCA. And I guess my question is, are you asking for clarification if we want the IFQ gear switch sector to be authorized um, under the alternative one and two, or are you asking just about two? Mr. Chair, Ms. Yuremko. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little odd. So um, with alternative one, that was pretty specific to open access. And so we are asking the question under limited entry, the alternative two, which was specific to LE fixed gear. And um, the reason being is that a lot of the gear switching vessels are subject to uh, the same, a lot of the same regulatory requirements as LA fixed gear. But ultimately we're looking for direction on um, whether or not IFQ gear switching vessels would be able to use these non-bottom contact hook and line gears, fishing their quota pounds um, because the motion in November was specific to the LE fixed gear trip limits, which of course IFQ vessels don't operate under. Oh, does that answer your question? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, it sounds to me like you're looking for guidance on inclusion of IFQ fixed gear vessels all the way around as part of this action. But I guess I, I have a question back to you. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge and my appreciation for the discussions that we've had on this topic um, over the past several months, um, and you did uh, raise the question about IFQ gear switch vessels and their um, uh, involvement in this action. Um, at the time, I'd asked you um, how easy or difficult it may be for an IFQ vessel to temporarily uh, unregister their trawl permit, thereby um, allowing them to participate uh, in these opportunities as either an OA vessel or if they happen to have a fixed gear permit uh, as a, a fixed gear vessel. Um, and I remember we left that discussion with... Um, the need to do a little bit of research about how easy it might be to park um, a trawl permit in order to um, park the requirements of the IQ program and to fish as a vessel either in the OA or the fixed gear sector. So um, maybe you can bring us up to date on that situation and what would be involved. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Mr. Imko, I'm going to be honest that I did a little bit of digging and things kind of got away from me and I didn't get to do as much digging as I uh, wanted to. I and mean, we did, can, trawl vessels can unregister their permits. And if they were to do that, they could go and theoretically fish open access. However, I would just note that that is a highly unlikely occurrence, I would guess, and I don't even know if that's ever happened. I didn't, I haven't looked. Um, I think there would be more of a chance of a dual registered uh, vessel. So someone who has a, you can be jointly registered to a limited entry fixed gear permit and a limited entry trawl permit at the same time and switch back and forth between um, the IFQ program and like the tier fishery, for example. So I that that's definitely an easy, that's, that's a declaration move. Um, so my apologies for not getting any more specifics and I don't know if, um, I believe Ms. Kent might be in the NIMS seat and might have any other thoughts here, but that would be kind of my uh, answer that I could give you at this, this moment in time. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Jesse. Um, one other question back. Um, I would have expected that one of the primary interests in this package by the IFQ gear switch group might be alternative three, which would be about moving that seaward line from 100 into 75 and the access that might be afforded pot gear vessels with that line move. Um, so I, I'm looking at all three and the questions for consideration that um, you've posed for us. And I don't see that question here on slide 20, but I guess I'm just asking if there's a mechanism, I mean, I'm assuming that the non troll RCA um, would, any line move would 
allow access to that newly opened area to the IFQ gear switch sector. So do I have that that much understood correctly? Mr. Chair, Ms. Yeremko, yes. So under alternative three, if you were to revise the seaward boundary and move it into 75 fathoms, that would apply to any vessels fishing in the I IFQ gear switcher gear switching sector because the RCAs are gear specific, not sector specific. So while they're operating within the trawl RCA program, they are subject to the same non-trawl RCA bounds as the LE fixed gear or open access ground fish sector. So they are already included within alternative three. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jesse. That's excellent news. Hoping what I, that was what I was hoping to hear. Thank you. All right, further questions on the presentation? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands, so thank you very much, but I know you'll be with us for the rest of this agenda item. We're going now to the uh, CDFW report, Andre Klein. Welcome, Andre. Good afternoon, Council. Andre Klein, CDFW, ground fish staff. Um, I'll just go ahead and read CDFW report one, unless uh, it's the council's pleasure to do elsewise. Well, um, I think you should you should go ahead. I think if there's um, some redundant information or stuff you can summarize, that's fine, but it's not that long a report. It's mostly pictures, so go ahead. You got it. Um, so California Department of Fish and Wildlife report on proposed protection areas within the CalCod conservation areas. Last November, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife or CDFW proposed repealing the CalCod conservation areas or CCAs and managing fishing, uh, fishery impacts using rockfish conservation area uh, boundary lines. That can be found in agenda item E6A, supplemental CDFW report one from November, November 2021. Meanwhile, last September, the Habitat Committee identified the need and framework of consideration for protection of areas that may be sensitive to bottom contact gears that can be found in agenda item C6A supplemental HC report one from September 21. In response to the suggestions of the Habitat Committee, uh, recommendations were developed by an ad hoc work group comprised of key stakeholders as described below. Based on these recommendations, CDFW provides the following report proposing closed areas that would be established with the goal of protecting corals, sponges, and sea pens from contact with ground fish fishing gear should the CCAs be repealed. Mechanism for protections. In total, the two CCAs encompass 4,300 square miles of the Southern California Bight, in which most ground fish fishing is only permitted shoreward of the 40 fathom RCA boundary line, significantly limiting ground fish opportunity in Southern California for both recreational angers and anglers and commercial fishermen. CDFW has proposed repealing the CCAs, rec recognizing the areas are no longer needed to protect CalCod, which is now rebuilt. 
Concurrent with the repeal, CDFW supports establishing new discrete area closures, which would prohibit ground fishing in certain sensitive areas to mitigate effects to bottom habitat that might come with the resumption of ground fishing activities in the CCAs. Following the advice of the ad hoc CCA work group, which is described below, to advance the proposal as core element of the proposed repeal of the CCA, CDFW has considered the socioeconomic framework outlined in the ground fish fishery management plan in using the socioeconomic framework, the following criteria must be addressed. A, how the action is expected to promote achievement of the goals and objectives of the FMP. This action would further goals two and three, as well as objectives six, nine of the FMP, increasing the value and utilization of the ground fish fishery by allowing for increased access while ensuring protections are established. B, likely impacts on other management measures, other fisheries and bycatch. This action is not anticipated to affect other management measures. Other fisheries would not be impacted by the discrete areas, area closures, as only ground fish fishing would be prohibited. Uh, recre recreational bycatch would continue to be accounted for using established sampling methods and the non trawl logbook currently being devel developed by the council could provide additional bycatch data to augment instances of low observer coverage for commercial fisheries, biological impacts. CDFW conducts extensive in-season catch tracking and monitoring to ensure commercial and recreational fishing mortality stays within harvest limits and if needed, in-season action can be taken to slow or stop additional mortality from occurring. Economic impacts, particularly the cost to the fishing industry. This action is anticipated to have a net positive economic impact on industry by increasing commercial landings of healthy and underutilized under stocks, offering new areas to uh, recreational fisheries is likely to attract participants with possible increases in fishing effort and activity overall. It also may increase the efficiency of recreational fish uh, trips that may not have had success participating in other fisheries offshore by providing opportunities for ground fish in locations where none previously existed. Impacts on fishing communities. This action is expected to have a positive impact on fishing communities by restoring access to fishing grounds in Southern California. How, how the action is expected to accomplish at least one of 14 items listed under uh, F, uh, this is from the FMP, including enable an allocation to a P, uh, be achieved. While this action may not achieve allocation of underutilized stocks, increased utilization, uh, utilization of stocks such as chili pepper rockfish south of 4010, sablefish south of 36, and thorny heads south of 
3427 north latitude is expected. Avoid exceeding in allocation. It is expected that by opening the CCAs, both commercial and recreational effort might shift offshore and away from nearshore stocks by distributing some of the effort to deeper depths, increase economic yield by repealing the CCAs, greater access to underutilized stocks will be afforded, potentially increasing economic opportunity to individuals individuals and fishing communities. Maintain or improve the recreational fishery. This action will improve the recreational fishery, allowing additional opportunity and restoring historic fishing grounds. Notab uh, notably, representatives of the South, uh, Southern California commercial passenger fishing vessel fleet have requested many times in recent years that they be able to access more of the offshore banks to target deeper water ground fish spots. While at this time, CDFW does not support using essential fish habitat uh, designations for these new area closures, the identified areas may warrant such considerations during the next EFH review. The EFH pathway would allow evaluation of any new information and input from a wider range of stakeholders beyond the federal ground fish industries and participants in the non-trawl RCA agenda item. As an example, EFH close, closures proposed in the future would require consult, consultation with agency and industry representatives of state managed fisheries or other federal fisheries that may be affected. CCA work group progress. Following the November 2021 council meeting, an ad hoc CCA work group met, comprised of CDFW staff, industry, including both commercial and recreational representatives, and Oceana. The stated goal of the work group was repealed the CCAs given the rebuilt status of CalCOD to increase fixed gear and recreational opportunity while establishing new protections for coral sponges and other living habitat. Over the course of several meetings, the work group used data from NOAA's Deep Sea Coral Data Portal, hereafter referred to as NORA, NOAA data portal and industry knowledge to identify discrete areas within the CCAs suitable, suitable for protection. The work group identified eight proposed protection areas that were generally agreeable to all. The proposed areas encompass approx approximately 44 and 35% respectively of the observed corals and sponges inside the CCAs. The proposed closures would encompass roughly 12% of the total 4,300 square miles uh, of area currently off limits to ground fish fishing in the CCA. CDFW would like to acknowledge and thank members of the ad hoc work group for their leadership and collaborative and constructive approach. Representatives brought the necessary expertise to the table and worked together toward common goals, leading to the formation of this proposal in only a few short months. 
Members included Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel Representatives, Mr. Harrison Eibach, Mr. Merritt McCray, Mr. Dan Platt, Mr. Gary Rector, and Mr. Louis Zim, Recreational Fisher and Executive Director of the Coastal Conservation Association of California, Mr. Wayne Cotto, Ms. Tara Block Brock, Mr. Ben Enticknap, and Dr. Jeff Shester of Oceana, and myself of CDFW staff. On the next page, you can see an overview map of the CCAs and the relation of the proposed protection areas they're in. Um, the proposed protection area at Hidden Reef measures 5.7 by 6.6 .6 miles and includes 471 coral and 1,493 sponge observations. Uh, these can be seen in figure two while table one includes the coordinates. Modeling from the NOAA data portal it shows areas of high habitat suitability for uh, Acanthrogorgia, Antipathies, Eugorgia, Paragorgia, and Plumarella in the proposed protection area. West of Santa Barbara Island, the proposed protection area measures 12.6 by 7.9 miles and includes 665 coral and 1,102 sponge observations. Again, this can see, uh, be seen in figure three with the coordinates of table two. Modeling from NOAA data portal shows areas of high habitat suitability for Acanthrogorgia, Delogorgia, Antipathies, uh, Paragorgia, and Plumarella. Uh, the proposed protection area at Potato Bank measures 8.5 by 13.8 miles and includes 26 coral and 1,018 sponge observations as seen in figure four coordinates. For the protection area can be found in table three. Modeling from the NOAA data portal shows areas of high ha habitat suitability for Acanthrogorgia Adelogorgia, Antipathies, Paragorgia, and Plumarella in the proposed protection area. The po proposed protection area at 107-118 bank measures 9.1 by 6.8 miles and includes 37 coral and 353 sponge observations. Uh, these can be seen in figure five coordinates for the proposed protection area are seen in table four. Modeling from NOAA, the NOAA data portal, portal indicate areas of high habitat suitability for Acanthrogorgia and Paragorgia within this proposed protection area. At Cherry Bank, the proposed protection area measures 13.9 uh, by 3.9 miles and includes 143 and 337 sponge observations as seen in figure five. Coordinates for this protection area are shown in table five. In the proposed protection area, modeling from the NOAA data portal shows areas of high habitat, 
habitat suitability for antipathies, paragorgia, and plumarilla. Uh, the proposed protection area at Seamount 109 measures 19.8 by 3.7 miles. That's measured on the southern end and includes 88 coral and 139 sponge observations as depicted in figure six. Uh, coordinates for this protection area are found in table six. In this proposed protection area, modeling from the NOAA data portal shows areas of high habitat suitability for antipathies and paragorgia. Uh, moving on, the proposed protection area at Northeast Bank measures 6.3 by 10.1 miles. Uh, the proposed protection area can be seen in figure seven, the coordinates of which are in table seven. Cur currently, the NOAA data portal does not show coral or sponge observations within the pro proposed protection area, and the area has not been modeled for habitat suitability. However, some on the work group felt it was important to include this proposed protection area at Northeast Bank due to a likelihood of similar features observed on the bank outside of the CCA being present on the portion of the bank which is currently protected by the CCA. Lastly, the proposed protection area at, at the 43 fathom spot measures uh, eight by 11.2 miles and includes 74 coral and 67 sponge observations as shown in figure eight. The coordinates for this protection area are shown in table eight. Modeling from the NOAA data portal indicates areas of high habitat suitability for Acanthrogorgia, Adelogorgia, Antipathies, Eugorgia, and Plumarella within the proposed protection area. And that concludes the CDFW report. I'm happy to answer any questions. Sorry, thank you very much, Andre. Are there any questions on the CDFW report? Thank you very much, Andre. We'll move on to, there are two ODF and W reports. Maggie Summers. Thank you, Chair Grilnick. Supplemental ODFW report one presents a proposal in the area west of the Hecata Bank EFH conservation area uh, for potential addition to the range of alternatives for non trawl area management. The Hecata Bank essential fish habitat conservation area and the adjacent area to the west or Hecata Bank West, noting that that term used in this report uh, differs very slightly from the area um, that had the same name in a proposal considered by the council under amendment 28. It is generally the same area, but I just wanted to clarify that the, the uh, boundaries are not exactly the same. That area is between the Hecata Bank bottom trawl EFHCA's seaward boundary and the 100 fathom line as illustrated in figure one. It was identified as a sensitive habitat with a high probability of yellow eye rockfish occurrence as illustrated in figures two and three during the amendment 28 process. Pardon me, I closed the file I wanted. Uh, pardon me, return to reading the report. Uh, alternative three, 
would open the area between the 75 fathom and 100 fathom lines, including Hecate Bank West, to commercial fishing with any non-trawl groundfish gear type. While an existing option would exclude commercial groundfish non-trawl bottom contact gear from any bottom trawl EFHCA that would be opened under alternative three, Hecate Bank West is not inside a bottom trawl EFHCA and would therefore be opened to all non-trawl gear types under the current range of alternatives. I note that while this area is currently open to trawling, the Rugos habitat and yellow eye rockfish constraints in the trawl IFQ program may inhibit trawling here, whereas the use of long line and pot gear could be more likely. And just to expand briefly on that, in the Amendment 28 process, the Council considered uh, this area. It gave it quite a bit of uh, attention and uh, in the end chose not to expand that trawl EFH conservation area to uh, include the western zone, uh, the Hecate Bank West area, uh, for a, a number of factors, but importantly because uh, it was deemed to be unlikely that bottom that trawl that trawling on the bottom would occur there because of the boulder cobble habitat type um, and the potential for gear damage and also because of the uh, IFQ programs um, uh, effective deterrent from fishing in areas of likely yellow eye rockfish bycatch because of the need to obtain uh, relatively scarce yellow eye rockfish quota pounds in that program to cover all catch and the significant economic uh, consequences of uh, catching a lot of yellow eye rockfish in the trawl program. Returning to the report, because of the uh, potential for benthic habitat damage and uh, yellow eye rockfish bycatch, um, focusing here on the non-trawl sector in this unique area, ODFW proposes development of an option with alternative three for analysis and public input that would exclude commercial non-trawl groundfish fishing with bottom contact gear uh, defined in federal regulation from the Hecate Bank West area between 75 fathoms and 100 fathoms management lines and northern and southern boundaries at new lines illustrated in figure three and the coordinates are provided in table one. This would provide precautionary protection of benthic habitat and groundfish EFH in this area from potential adverse effects of fishing gear if alternative three was adopted and implemented. It is expected that the next groundfish EFH review process will include a more comprehensive evaluation. The proposal is also expected to support yellow eye rockfish rebuilding by reducing the potential for bycatch in the non-trawl commercial groundfish sector. ODFW requests that if possible, council staff provide options for the most appropriate type or types of area management measures. For example, non-trawl RCA polygons, yellow eye rockfish conservation areas, et cetera, to achieve the desired objective of protecting benthic habitat and yellow eye rockfish from impacts by commercial groundfish non-trawl bottom contact gear when the council next considers the non-trawl area management measures item. Figure one on the following page uh, it, uh, is an, an overview and, and illustrates the uh, position of the location of this area uh, relative to the Hecate Bank Trawl EFHCA at the bottom of the figure in uh, diagonal shading. It's the area immediately to the west of that. You can see from the uh, color coding with the uh, habitat classification that it is uh, quite uh, primarily boulder habitat, pardon me, boulder cobble there. Moving down to figure two uh, represents the entire Oregon coast. Uh, and this is a map uh, showing the probability of yellow eye rockfish occurrence through a, a hotspot color scheme off the Oregon coast. This was produced by the Northwest Science Center in the Amendment 28 process. Um, uh, the map itself here was produced by ODFW staff, but the underlying yellow eye rockfish probability data uh, were produced by the Science Center in Amendment 28. Uh, and you can see that the Hecate Bank area off Oregon Central Coast really, really lights up with a higher probability of yellow eye occurrence. 
And the final map zooms in on the area uh, and the purpose of this one is to show those red lines, um, which are just uh, potentially illustrating the, the northern and southern boundaries of, of the zone we are proposing for uh, an additional layer of protection. Thanks, that concludes report one. All right, before you go on to two, let's see if there are any questions on report one. Please proceed. Thank you, Chair. Supplemental ODFW report two is just providing information, not making a proposal at this time. This is uh, on several long-term monitoring sites that ODFW uh, has established in the Nehalem Bank area uh, that could potentially be affected if the non-trawl RCA is adjusted or removed. Uh, the Habitat Committee uh, report one that we will hear uh, shortly um, notes as well that uh, ODFW has initiated a long-term study of seafloor habitats associated with the shrimp trawl fishery in the Nehalem Bank area uh, in 2007. Sites inside and outside the trawl EFHCA in that area provide a uh, before and after control impact uh, comparison that allows examination of changes in invertebrate abundance between the uh, EFHCA, which is closed to trawling, and nearby areas open to shrimp trawling, uh, which was the point of the study design. Those comparison areas were placed in locations expected to be uh, trawled by the shrimp fleet. We have been conducting uh, ROV transects at that uh, at all of those sites in 2007 and in 2013, intend to get back out shortly this year and hope to continue that surveying into the future. And we hope that results uh, will contribute to the understanding of the impacts of trawl gear on benthic habitat and invertebrates and of recovery after trawl gear exclusion. Uh, the point of this report is to note that two of the comparison sites uh, could be um, impacted by non-trawl bottom gear, uh, particularly under alternative three, which would, re, uh, which would move the seaward boundary from 100 into uh, 75 fathoms. These sites um, have been uh, uh, protected from non-trawl bottom gear uh, since the study's inception. Uh, pardon me, but the area would be, the uh, again, the area would be uh, opened to that activity if under alternative three. Um, it's possible that the use of bottom contact non-trawl gear in this area could confound the study. Um, but again, I note that these sites are in a soft bottom habitat currently trawled by uh, the shrimp fleet. So it um, is also possible that the use of non-trawl bottom contact gear in these sites would not have a significant, significant effect on the value of the study. Uh, we do recognize that the fishery management plan uh, recognizes the potential of using research sites unaffected by fishing in comparative studies to better understand the effect of fishing on habitat. We considered uh, proposing a regulatory closure here in the comparison sites to exclude non-trawl bottom contact gear. However, again, the sites are already affected by fishing with trawl gear, and they are small. They're 1.1 nautical miles per side, uh, making enforcement uh, challenging, even if it was uh, just possible with VMS, and potentially making compliance challenging. So we are not uh, recommending development of a regulatory closure at this time. And figure one simply illustrates the two outside sites in the yellow boxes uh, just east of the Nehalem Bank or Shale Pile Trawl EFHCA. The sites inside that EFHCA are not shown on this map. And Table 1 provides the coordinates. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Maggie. Are there any questions for Maggie? All right, thank you very much. Well, uh, next here from the GMT, Mel Mandrup, I think. 
Yes, you are correct, sir. Welcome. Uh, welcome. <laughs> Good afternoon, welcome. rather. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I am uh, Mel Mandro from the Ground Fish Management Team, uh, and I will be re reading from agenda item F6A, Supplemental GMT Report 1 on non trawl sector area management measures, range of alternatives. The GMT attended a joint briefing with the GAP by Ms. Jessie Dorpinghaus and Mr. Brett Weedoff from the Pacific Fishery Management Council staff, reviewed the documents in the briefing book and had some detailed discussion. The GMT would also like to thank Ms. Lynn Massey of the National Marine Fisheries Service for providing additional information on gear description portion on the gear description portion. Below are some GMT thoughts for council consideration, which are based on the questions posed in agenda item F6, attachment one, uh, April 2022, along with any additional questions posed by council staff during GMT discussion. In addition to the recommendations provided below, the GMT recommends including the development of block area closures or BACs coastwide in the range of alternatives because BACs could be a useful tool for mitigating bycatch of other ground fish stocks as well as protect or prohibit species or as well as protected or prohibited species. If action is taken under any or all or all of alternatives one through six. The GMT also recommends aligning alternatives one and two with, the, with, with what is being proposed in the 23-24 management measures package by extending the southern edge of the non troll RCA proposals to the Mexico-US border in order to reduce regulatory management and enforcement complexity. On an overarching note, the GMT does not believe that the actions pertaining to the habitat protection, such as adding protections to existing bottom trawl essential fish habitat conservation areas, meet the purpose and needs statement as adopted by the Council in November 2021. We recommend Council staff revise the purpose and needs need based on the feedback received from this meeting. Specifically, the purpose and need should address some of the habitat needs outlined in the H the Habitat Committee report, but brought in to include more than just EFHCA concerns. Alternative one, allow open access vessel, vessels targeting ground fish to fish in the non trawl RCA using a pro Proved hook and gear, hook and line gear. Oh my. The GNT recommends including alternative one in the range of alternatives as it could provide additional opportunity and flexibility to vessels to target mid water rockfish outside of that considered in the 2324 management measures. In response to a question about additional gear configurations or beat types to include, Beside what is proposed in agenda item F4, Supplemental NIMS Report 1 from this meeting, the GMT does not offer any additional gear configurations beyond what have already been proposed and looks to the gap for any additional requests and the enforcement consultants for any refinements. In general, the GMT is supportive and inclusive of, inclusive, of an inclusive range of alternatives and of allowing for flexibility around gear innovation, bait types, and improvements above and beyond what is found in 12E item, in the 12E item that is proposed in the 23-24 biennial management measures, um, as in the, the NIMS report. Alternative two, allow limited entry fixed gear vessels targeting ground fish to fish in the non trawl RCA using approved hook and line gear up to the limited fixed gear trip limits. For equity reasons, the GMT recommends including alternative two in the range of alternatives as it could provide additional opportunity for the limited entry fixed gear vessels to fish 
to the limited entry fish gear limits for midwater rockfish, which is outside the scope of measures analyzed and considered in the 2324 management measures package. The GMT also recommends including individual fishing quota gear switching vessels to utilize the proposed gear types in the non troll RCA in the range of alternatives for further analysis. The team notes that the council's motion from November only specified limited entry trips, trip limits, and gear switching vessels fish under IFQ quota. So it is unclear to the GMT whether the council the council's intent was to allow gear switchers to have access to the non troll RCA and continue to fish under their quota limits. The GMT is generally supportive of simplifying regulatory burden while allowing equitable access to newly opened areas. Alternative three, reconfiguration of the non trail ba RCA boundaries. The GMT recommends including alternative three in the range of alternatives because this could provide increased opportunities for multiple sectors to harvest underutilized species in areas that have not been open ground fish fishing in 20 years. Currently, the non-tribal directed commercial Pacific halibut fishery is prohibited from fishing in the non troll RCA. The GMT notes that many participants in the directed Pacific halibut fishery also retain ground fish if they have the appropriate license and vessel monitoring system. Participants in the fishery have previously requested changing the non troll RCA for the directed halibut, Pacific halibut fishery to 75 fathoms, as there is thought to be more Pacific halibut in that depth range during the summer months when the directed fishery is open. If changes are made to the non troll RCA boundaries, the ground fish in the ground fish regulations, Pacific halibut regulations would also need to be, reflect such changes for them to apply to the non-tribal directed commercial Pacific halibut fishery. It is the GMT's understanding that if the council wishes to include the, the Pacific halibut fishery in this action, both regulations can be adjusted via one council action. To ensure that all directed Pacific halibut participants, including both those who are also both those who also participate in ground fish and those who do not, are aware of the potential ch for change. Careful consideration would need to be given in how this agenda item is noticed, so that all so that all of the interested parties have the opportunity to participate. The GMT recommends including the Pacific halibut fishery in the range of alternatives to address their request for access to those areas within the non troll RCA. Alternative four, remove the non troll RCA. The GMT recommends removing the alternative from this alternative from the ROA because of a lack of data available for analysis. However, the GMT recommends including it on the workload prioritization list for consideration at a later date. Given the availability, ability rather, to pre predict impacts from full removal is limited, if alternative three moves forward, the GMT anticipates a data stream to help inform this action at a later date. Alternative five. Repeal the cow-cow cons cow conservation areas for commercial and recreational fisheries. The GMT recommends including alternative five in the range of alternatives uh, as cow cod south of 4010 north latitude is rebuilt and no longer needs the area-specific protection. Further, the GMT recommends that all the non troll RCA lines around the island's banks and high spots within the CCAs proposed in agenda item E5, CDFW report one from November, 2021, be included in the range of alternatives for further analysis. This item has been under consideration for multiple management cycles, moving the CCA repeal forward in a package that would be modifying other groundfish conservation areas 
where the intent is to provide access to additional areas that are currently closed, groundfish fishing makes sense. For many years, sablefish, thorny heads, and other deep water species have been under attain south of Point Conception, uh, partially due to the extremely limited access in the CCA. Ability to access the deep water species could help rebuild markets in Southern California. Additionally, opening the CCA would allow for more unrestricted research access to a large portion of the Southern California bite. The additional research opportunity could reduce the uncertainty, uncertainty in biomass estimates for species of concern and economically important species. Alternative six, open limited areas of the non trial RCA to pot gear only, specifically off Washington. The GMT includes alternative six in the range of alternatives, but reiterates that there is less urgency in, the, in implementing this alternative over the other alternatives in the range of, altern uh, range of alternatives. The GMT agrees with the rationale provided in agenda item E6A, Supplemental WDFW Report 1 from November 2021, specifically that opening select areas could provide vessel, vessels access to larger sablefish and potentially a higher price per pound. The GMT understands that the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife is still working with stakeholders that identify areas of interest and will likely have options for September 2022. The council will want to look carefully at any areas of interest that overlap with EFHCAs, given the objective in the November WDFW report to minimize habitat impacts. Noting that the interest is to only open these areas to pot gear, which could be considered as bottom contact gear. The GMT recommends analyzing pot gear impacts from ground fishing, ground fish fishing to any bottom trawl EFHCAs that overlap within the 75 to 100 fathoms off Washington. And a formal decision on a prohibition can be made at a later date. The GMT looks to the EC on the ability to enforce this prohibition within the Olympic II in Wallapa Canyon EFHCAs, given the small amount of overlap with the current non trawl RCA. The Grays Canyon EFCA, EFHCA may have been much easier to enforce and covers more habitat within the non trawl RCA. With that, it concludes the GMT report, um, and I'd like to walk you through our long list of uh, uh, recommendations um, just to, to help uh, line you up better. The, the uh, recommendations one and two are our general recommendations uh, hitting the overarching points. Uh, recommendation number three pertains to alternative one. Recommendation four and five pertain to alternative two. Recommendation six and seven pertain to alternative three. Recommendation eight pertains to alternative four. Uh, recommendations nine and 10 pertain to alternative five. Uh, and recommendations 11 and 12 pertain to alternative six. And uh, I would like to also call attention uh, again that we do have a recommendation um, for a purpose and need statement and you can find that in um, paragraph three at the top of the report. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Mel. Are there any questions on the Groundfish Management Team report? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mel. Awful lot there. Um, I was attempting, uh, as you worked your way through the GMT report, to cross-check uh, with the council staff presentation. Uh, 
regarding the slides that they presented to us that had questions for the council's consideration. Um, my understanding as council staff is wanting uh, the council to provide answers to those questions here today. And I believe as I worked through your statement that the GMT's recommendations does in fact cover each and every one of those questions that council staff posed to us. But I want to double check and verify that that's the case. Thanks. Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, uh, a majority of the questions uh, have been answered in the statement. Uh, we did have the, the questions laid out um, originally, and then we kind of folded them into our responses. Um, but they they are there. Um, we've addressed, um, I believe, all of them uh, except for some specific EFHCA questions. And I'm... Bear with me and let me get back to the presentation. Uh, there was one EFHCA question specific that we, we didn't really dive into too much. Um, you know, Mel. Um, for the most part, yes, we answered these maybe, questions. Yeah, maybe we'd ask Jesse to see if there are any un unanswered questions. Mr. Chair, yeah, um, thank you for the res uh, ability to respond. Yeah, I actually worked really closely with the GMT, and they answered uh, the vast majority of questions we had, except for um, just getting some comments on those, how the council would like to apply the sub option for alternative three and four regarding EFHCAs. Um, so that was the one place, and I think the GMT had some good discussion on that, um, but, you know, I think it, given the time it was last night that, you know, there, that was the only question left over, I guess. So to my knowledge. Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Mel, for confirming that. I think that certainly will help us uh, as we look to develop motions on this item. Um, I do have a, a second question about the GMT recommendation on IFQ gear switching vessels and um, including them in alternative two. Um, appreciate the recommendation. Um, I guess before we just go ahead and, and jump forward with that idea, I want to get a little better understanding about uh, the analytical lift involved. And if you've explored the question of cost recovery, um, and if that has any bearing on our thinking about whether to include the authorization for IFQ gear switch vessels in this action. Thanks. Uh, thank, thank you for the, the question. If uh, that was directed toward the GMT, um, I'll, I'll say that we don't typically discuss a whole lot on cost recovery uh, in any way, shape, or form, and that definitely did not come up in our conversations or discussions yesterday um, when talking about including IFQ fixed gear uh, within this package. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions on the team report? All right, thanks very much, Mel. We've been at this a while, so uh, we're going to take a 15 minute break and be back at three o'clock.
Thank you. All right, welcome back. Uh, we're on the home stretch here today, I hope. We have a few more reports. We have a fair amount of public comment on this agenda item. So we will go next to the Habitat Committee report. Arlene. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Arlene Marams, Habitat Committee member, and I will be reading Supplemental Habitat Report 1. Uh, in the interest of time, I will be abbreviating some of the written statements. Habitat Committee Report on non troll Sector Area Management Measures. The Habitat Committee received a briefing by council staff on the proposed range of alternatives and preliminary analysis. The HC also considered the revised definition for non-bottom trawl contact gear provided in F4A Supplemental NIMS Report 1 and a presentation to the HC by the Deep Sea Coral Research and Technology Program. The Habitat Committee offers the following considerations towards further refinement and analysis of the ROA. The Habitat Committee notes that several of the proposed alternatives include measures to protect benthic habitats and sensitive species, including corals, seabirds, and whales from the effects of groundfish non troll fishing gear. However, the stated purpose and need for this action does not reflect these considerations. The Habitat Committee recommends that the purpose and need statement could be revised by adding a phrase to the end of the statement that reads, while working to minimize impacts and alterations to habitats in currently designated EFHCAs and other ecosystem components to the extent practicable. Proposed hook and line gear definition. Under the proposed NIMS definition of non-bottom contact hook and line gear, the gear must be suspended at least 50 feet off the bottom. Ideally, this would prevent contact with sensitive benthic habitat features and structure forming invertebrates. However, maintaining gear at a constant height off the bottom could be challenging in particularly high relief habitats and could result in damage to fragile structural organisms living in those habitats. This may warrant evaluation during the ROA analysis. Pacific halibut fishery. The Habitat Committee recommends that any bottom contact gear in the Pacific halibut fishery be prohibited along with other bottom contact gears addressed in the alternatives. And if I may, I'd like to provide a clarification of this statement um, in the context of potential habitat impacts from bottom contact gear, the intent of this recommendation is that the halibut gear should be considered along with groundfish bottom contact gear in the revised ROA, not that halibut fishing should be prohibited per se. Returning to the report, alternatives one and two consider allowing the use of natural bait. This raises concerns for impacts to non-target ecosystem components and increased risk to seabirds. The Habitat Committee supports including alternatives one and two in the revised range of alternatives to expand fishing opportunities with non-bottom contact hook and line gear. The HC recommends that the use of natural bait not be included in the revised range of alternatives. Alternative three would allow all ground fish non troll gear, including ground fish non troll bottom contact gear, to fish in essential fish habitat conservation areas whereas sub-option one would prohibit ground fish non troll bottom contact gear in the EFH conservation areas inside the non troll RCA, thus providing continued protection for sensitive habitats previously identified under Amendment 28. The HC considers sub-option one an appropriate measure for mitigating the effects of new fishing pressure on habitats that have been protected for nearly two decades. The HC supports including sub-option one in the revised ROA to provide continued protection in existing EFHCAs. And for EFHCAs with small portions outside the existing non troll RCA, such as Band and High Spot and Nahalem Bank, the, Heck uh, the Habitat Committee recommends prohibiting ground fish non troll bottom gear in those entire EFHCAs. 
and thereby protecting important habitats and simplifying enforcement of the boundaries. This change may restrict a small amount of fishing that is occurring there now. However, compared to the amount of fishing that will be open under this alternative, it will be in line with the purpose and need of this action. Consistent with the Habitat Committee's previous recommendations on this action, the HC recommends analysis that the analysis for alternative three include updated high resolution habitat maps and updated coral and sponge information. The HC also recommends the analysis estimate the amount of anticipated fishing effort by gear type and habitat type for each biogeographic subarea and EFHCA. Alternative four would likely require a more comprehensive and robust analysis than available data and resources can support at this time. The HC recommends not including alternative four in the revised ROA and to consider this action at a future time. As part of alternative five, California Department of Fish and Wildlife and Conservation and Fishing Interests identified areas for increasing fishing opportunity while providing habitat protection for habitat forming invertebrates. The Habitat Con Committee considers this an appropriate measure for mitigating the effects of new fishing pressure on sensitive habitats and commends the collaborative process. The HC supports including alternative five and the CDFW proposal in the revised ROA. Alternative six, an objective of this alternative is to avoid impacts to sensitive habitats. However, a portion of the Grays Canyon EFHCA is in the non-trawl RCA and would be exposed to possible new pot gear effort. The HC supports including alternative six in the revised ROA, but recommends keeping the area close to pot gear in the Grays Canyon EFHCA, where ground fish bottom contact gear has not previously fished. This is consistent with the HC's recommendation under alternative three, sub option one. And then a couple of additional alternatives for consideration. Um, one, habitat protection. The Hecata Bank West margin, also referred to as Hecata Bank West in the ODFW report, is outside the Hecata Bank EFH conservation area, is characterized by high relief boulder habitat that supports a diversity of species, including several long lived corals and sponges. Species habitat modeling shows yellow eye rockfish occurrence is highest on Hecata Bank based on the Northwest Fishery Science Center statistical modeling that was developed for the recent ground fish EFH review. Under any proposed alternative, the west margin would be open to ground fish non trawl bottom contact gear. The HC notes that long line and pot gear could impact sensitive species and habitats in this unique environment. The HC recommends the Hecata Bank West margin remain closed to ground fish non trawl bottom contact gear to protect the ecological significance of this area. This could be accomplished with adjustment to the 75 fathom line when delineating the non trawl RCA seaward boundary. And it could be a sub option under alternative three in the revised ROA. And lastly, long term monitoring sites near Nahalem Bank and Hecata Bank EFH conservation areas would not be protected under any of the proposed alternatives. These sites provide opportunity for studying the long term effects of fishery closures on habitat recovery and fishing, fish abundance, a research need the Council has previously identified. The HC recommends continued closure to ground fish non trawl bottom contact gear in established monitoring sites within the non trawl RCA. Long term monitoring, monitoring areas could be included as a new alternative in the revised ROA. This concludes the Habitat Committee report, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Arlene, are there any questions on the Habitat Committee? Thank you very much for your report. Thank you. Uh, we'll now have the GAP report. I believe that's uh, Harrison Ibach and Dan Platt. Welcome. Thank you, Chair and Council. Um, 
<clears throat> Name's Harris Nybach. Be reading the uh, ground fish advisory panel report on non trawl sector area management measures. Um, <clears throat> agenda item F6. I don't know that I'm qualified to summarize this, so if you bear with me, I will try to get through it in a timely fashion. The GAP received an update and further information on this item from <clears throat> Brett and Jesse of council staff and appreciate their leadership in identifying alternatives and potential changes that might affect implementation of this package. The GAP offers the following recommendations for the council consideration. Referencing F6 attachment one, the analysis of the range of alternatives for this agenda item, the GAP discussed the pros and cons of each alternative. The non-trawl area management measures item was expanded in November to include potential changes to the essential fish habitat conservation areas and cow cod conservation areas. While we appreciate considering the holistic nature of including all of these areas into one package, the GAP is concerned that the impetus for the original request will be lost and that combining areas deemed for management with areas created for habitat protection will unnecessarily conflate the primary problem. Finding a path forward to enable non-trawl fishermen access to healthy stocks on the shelf and slope, primarily midwater species, and decrease pressure on nearshore stocks. The gap reminds the council that fishermen would like to see this process move forward in an incremental fashion. As the gap noted in our F4 management measures report one, we consider the actions taken under management action 12E, only the first step to allowing non-trawl commercial fishermen access to some midwater stocks within the non-trawl rockfish conservation area and CCAs with exempted fishing permit gears to fish midwater species. The second step is to consider additional actions under this agenda item. The ultimate goal is to enable non-trawl fishermen using mid-water or bottom contact gear access to the certain areas of the non-trawl RCA and CCA. However, the gap realizes this may take more time and analysis since there are several new proposals being considered regarding new area restrictions. Furthermore, the gap understands that block area closures may be one solution to opening up as much of the non-trawl RCA as possible to provide ground fish ground fish fishing opportunities while avoiding potential bycatch hotspots. We recommend adding this tool to allow it to be used coastwide as needed to control catch of ground fish or protected species. Specifically regarding the alternatives outlined in F6 attachment one, the gap supports moving both alternatives one and two forward for analysis and recommends the following. <clears throat> Alternative one, which allows open access vessels targeting ground fish to fish in the non-trawl RCA using approved hook and line gear and alternative two, allowing limited entry fixed gear vessels targeting ground fish to fish in the non-trawl RCA using approved hook and line gear up to their limited entry uh, trip limits. The gap supports both of these alternatives and to extend them to the US-Mexico border. This extension will align with the action included in agenda item F4 management measures under action item 12E. It will also make it easier to apply to multiple fleets, although the gap recognizes some fleets may not take advantage of these alternatives. The gap appreciates the extension of exploring the use of natural bait, other gear configurations, and the allowance of limited entry fixed gear vessels to fish up to their trip limits as part of these alternatives. Furthermore, the gap thinks it may be beneficial to fishermen in the limited entry trawl fishery using fixed gear, gear switchers, to fish in the non-trawl RCA using their quota pounds. Therefore, we support inclusion of this option in the analysis. Alternative three, the gap fully supports moving the seaward boundary of the non-trawl RCA line to 75 fathoms. Additionally, it is important to include the Pacific halibut directed commercial fishery access to those areas. Sub-option one, which is to prohibit all bottom contact ground fish gear in ground fish EH, EFHCAs that would otherwise be reopened under this action. The gap has concerns with this option, which prohibits all bottom contact fishing gears in ground fish EFH that would otherwise be reopened under this alternative. The gap does not support changing the designation of any bottom trawl EFHCAs into bottom contact EFHCAs. There are very large bottom trawl EFHCAs, such as Eel River Canyon, that have been open to bottom contact gear for many years. Non-trawl fishermen reiterate the goal of this action is to open more fishing opportunities, not take more away. The GAP also reviewed the ODFW report under this agenda item. 
This approach seems reasonable for analysis, but encourage potential inclusion of other industry developed options for the west side of Hecate Bank, Rogue River Canyon and Cane Blanco off Southern Oregon for future analysis. The GAP understands we will be able to provide additional input for this alternative as the process moves forward. We expect a detailed analysis of each bottom trawl EFHCA that could be affected by reconfiguration of the non-trawl RCA. We suggest the analysis include a closer look and discussion of the type and extent of closures that could be developed and may be most appropriate for each bottom trawl EFHCA should the area in question include a new bottom contact groundfish EFHCA. Preserve the non-trawl RCA similar to the ODFW proposal, create or turn on yellow eye rockfish conservation areas or create some other type of closure that is unique to the area. <clears throat> alternative four, remove the non-trawl RCA. The gap does not support this alternative at this time, but would like to move, move toward this action at a later date. As we noted above, it is important to move this action forward incrementally. Alternative five, to repeal the cow cod conservation areas for commercial and recreational fisheries. The gap supports the repeal of the cow cod conservation areas as outlined in agenda item F6A CFW report one. The gap applauds the collaborative efforts of industry, the environmental community and CDFW staff to come up with protections to key benthic habitat while also opening up important ground fish areas that have been closed to ground fish fishing for the past 21 years. The gap strongly supports moving forward with the CDFW report to include it in the range of alternatives for the non-trawl sector areas management measures process at its progress. As pointed out, cow cod has been declared rebuilt and this closure has served its purpose. The proposal includes areas to remain closed to ground fish, take in possession with the goal of providing long-term protection from damage by fishing gears for deep sea corals and sponges. Nevertheless, the gap would favor a more refined approach, one that prohibits the use of fishing gear and methods that might damage some of these benthic organisms, yet allow fisheries access otherwise. Therefore, a more defined purpose of the closed areas with clear connections to the fisheries affected would help staff analyze the action appropriately. As a practical matter and for future consideration than developing implementing regulations, ground fish closures have, to date, always included language that not only prohibits take of groundfish, but possession of groundfish therein. If fishing gear or of any type or target were deployed, this includes trolling tackle for tunas and fishing with unweighted lines. In practice, this has resulted in foregoing opportunities to fish for pelagic species in these areas once rockfish have been taken, no matter where. It's equally resulted in foregone opportunity to fish groundfish in order to preserve the ability to fish tunas and other surface fish should they appear in areas closed to groundfish. Alternative six, open limited entry, excuse me, open limited areas of the non-trawl RCA to pot gear only. The gap recognizes some concerns related to gear conflicts and accessing to the area between 75 and 100 fathoms exists between fixed gear and recreational fishermen in Washington will need to be resolved as this alternative progresses. Fixed gear representatives identify changes to the non-trawl RCA in Washington will be very discreet in nature and are unlikely to overlap with some of these species related to concerns voiced by sport fishermen. However, the gap realizes the sport industry in Washington have very limited access to areas outside of 50 fathoms to pursue, to pursue deep water lingcod trips. During these times, in June and September, weather is always a factor. Both charter and private sport fishermen depend on access to these grounds for fishing opportunity. In conclusion, the GAP recommends additional analysis of the areas off Washington, both spatially and temporally, need to be considered and discussed. Outreach to both groups regarding potential changes should also be conducted so a complete vetting of concerns and issues can be had while focusing on solutions and reducing gear and fisheries conflicts. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Harrison. Are there questions of the gap on the report? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Harrison. Um, I'm looking at your discussion under alternative five, repeal the Calcot areas. 
Um, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding the last two paragraphs in this section. Um, you're talking about uh, possession of ground fish in closed areas and then fishing gear for other species like for tunas and then you just you indicate that um i think you're talking about groundfish closures have resulted in foregoing opportunities for fish for pelagic species to fish for pelagic species in these areas once rockfish have been taken uh, it's equally resulted in foregone opportunity to fish ground fish in order to preserve the ability to fish tunas and other surface fish. Um, I'm just trying to put those paragraphs in context with the proposal that is presented uh, in Alternative 5, which is to repeal the Calcot area and replace it with the small discrete areas proposed by the work group that have would have the net effect of uh, replacing um, or making 88% of the area currently included in the Calcot area uh, open to ground fish fishing while uh, keeping closed 12% of the Calcot area. So I'm just trying to understand how these two paragraphs relate to the proposal. Thanks. Um, through the chair, uh, Ms. Ramko, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to be able to phone a friend on this one, someone who might be able to uh, better answer this question. If we could bring up Merritt or Gary um, to answer this, I think that would be, uh, that'd be best. Chair Gorelnik, council members, this is Merritt McCray on the GAP. I'm the Southern California representative, uh, charter representative on that group. Um, <clears throat> I first want to say that the GAP strongly supports and our fleet strongly supports uh, the CDF and W's recommendation under this item. Um, that would open up an awful lot of opportunity for us. And the fact that we uh, remain having lost the opportunity to fish pelagics easily on ground fish at all in some of the smaller areas that would remain closed um, is trivial by comparison to the new access. However, uh, the gap in their statement does note that um, there is this preference, if at all possible, uh, for being able to somehow remain, um, well, somehow be able to fish pelagic fish in these closed areas, even though we've already got ground fish on board, often what will happen is we'll be fishing um, in the morning for uh, ostensibly for os pelagic fish, and, and they just won't bite, them being fickle as they can be. But there'll be an afternoon bite, and we'll have that in mind. And you just never know when those fish are going to pop up. So in the morning, we're sitting there twiddling our thumbs, and maybe somebody catches a, a nice ground fish. And, we have to tell them they have to let it go and we put it back down on their descending device. And this is all to preserve that access to areas that are close to ground fish uh, so that we can fish tuna in them should they decide to show their faces later in the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have one more question, if I may, on a different topic. Please. Thanks. Um, going to the GAPS recommendation on page three regarding um, fixed gear in the non trawl RCA um, for the IFQ sector uh, to be able to use their quota pounds. Um, not sure if you heard the exchange that I had earlier with the uh, GMT and with uh, Jesse, but I'm just wondering how how much the gap 
discussed this this particular uh, recommendation to allow gear switchers access into the RCA using the gear type. And if you discussed uh, the idea of um, unregistering and fishing either under OA or LE fixed gear limits as appropriate. Um, specifically, I'm just hoping you might confirm that you did not discuss cost recovery or give that any consideration. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> through the chair, uh, Marcy, uh, there was some discussion regarding uh, gear switching when it comes to uh, this agenda item. Uh, we had multi a couple GAP members, one a representative and another who is a participant in the uh, gear switching, uh, gear switching fishery. And um, no, we did not discuss uh, cost recovery and basically ultimately to kind of summarize what the, the, how the discussion went, I would say that uh, there was not a lot of interest per se. That being said, uh, maybe, maybe the thoughts were that there might not be a whole lot of participation, but also at the same time, because it is opportunity, um, we want to make sure that that, that op opportunity exists. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Harrison. That That's very helpful. All right, are there further questions on the GAP report? All right, thank you very much, Harrison and Merritt. So we'll now go to the Enforcement Consultants Report. Greg Bush. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Greg Bush, Chair of the Enforcement Consultants. I'll be re reading Supplemental EC Report 1 for Agenda Item F6A, Enforcement Consultants Report on Non-Trawl Sector Area Management Measures. The Enforcement Consultants have reviewed the documents pertaining to Agenda Item F6, Non-Trawl Sector Area Management Measures, received a presentation by Pacific Fishery Management Council staff, Brett Weedoff and Jesse Dorpinghaus, discussions with California Department of Fish and Wildlife staff, Andre Klein, and National Marines Fisheries Service staff, Lynn Massey, who provide the following comments. The EC have provided preliminary comments previously under agenda items F3A, Supplemental EC Report 1, April 2021, and E6A, Supplemental EC Report 1, November 2021. Regarding non-trawl rockfish conservation area boundary modifications, the EC prefer boundary changes rather than allowing fishing within the non trawl RCA and note concerns about enforceability in some areas where the inner and outer boundary depth contours are very close, such as along steep, steep bank shelf with little separation, which makes monitoring with vessel monitoring systems ineffective. Further, if fishing is allowed within the non trawl RCA, declaration code should be developed for vessels permitted to fish within the non trawl RCA. This aspect would simplify enforcement and distinguishing vessels and gear types that are allowed to fish within the non-trawl RCA for those that are from those that are transiting. EC comments regarding F6 attachment one. Alternative one, allow open access vessels to use select hook and line gear in the non-trawl RCA. Alternative one appears to be enforceable, providing consistent regulations apply both inside and outside the non-trawl RCA. These regulations include gear gear carriage, use, and switching restrictions, trip limits, species-specific retention prohibitions, observer requirements, and VMS declaration requirements, including creation of new declarations as needed. Alternative two, allow limited entry fixed gear to use select hook and line gear in the non trawl RCA. EC have the same recommendations for limited entry fixed gear as alternative in alternative two as for open access gear in alternative one. Alternative three, move the seaward boundary of the non trawl RCA to 75 fathoms from 46 degrees 16 minutes to 34 degrees 27 minutes north latitude. The EC are generally supportive of alternative three as a preferred alternative. The EC have, not have noted that by moving the non trawl RCA to 75 fathoms, some essential fish habitat conservation areas would be divided and portions of the same 
the FHCA would potentially have different regulations. The EC recommend having consistent regulations for the entire EFHCA to reduce confusion and provide larger contiguous areas to assist with VMS monitoring. The EC also note that if the non-trail RCA line is moved from 100 fathoms to 75 fathoms, there'll be different regulatory closed areas for the directed and incidental Pacific halibut fisheries than for the ground fish fisheries. The EC recommends that if the non-trawl RCA boundary is moved under this alternative, that the closed areas under the Pacific halibut regulations found in 50 CFR 300.63E be similarly changed to reduce confusion and regulatory complexity. Alternative four, removal of the non-trawl RCA from 46 degrees, 16 minutes to 34 degrees, 27 minutes north latitude. Alternative four the, is the preferred alternative for the EC. Even with the allowance of sub-option one and prohibiting all bottom contact fit ground fish gear and the ground fish EFCHs that would otherwise be open under this alternative, the EC consider this alternative to be fairly straightforward and will reduce the overall complexity and enforcement effort. Under alternative four, the EC still have the concerns with the different regulatory non trawl RCA lines between the ground fish and the directed Pacific halibut fishery. If alternative four moves forward, the EC asks the council to consider addressing this difference. Alternative five, repeal the cow cod conservation area. The EC have reviewed alternative five and have the following comments. CDFW has limited enforcement capability due to an anticipated increase in fishing activity within this remote area the effort of large patrol vessels and aircraft will have to be redirected to this area. Additionally, the cow cod conservation areas have been in place for over 20 years and require an increase in enforcement outreach and compliance assistance during this transition. The EC have reviewed the related agenda item F6A, CDFW report one on proposed protection areas within the CCAs and have the following comments. Shape and coordinates. The EC recommends the shape of the protection areas be all square or rectangular and the latitude and longitudes be rounded to the nearest minute. Ideally, the EC recommends the protection areas D, E, and F be adjusted so the two sides run north and south and the other two sides run east and west. Transit through protected areas. The EC recommends requiring vessels to follow the continuous transit with gear stowed regulations when entering a protected area with ground fish on board. Take of species other than ground fish. The EC recommends that fishing for other species not be allowed within the protected area. Due to their remoteness, many of these areas will be patrolled by aircraft or large patrol vessels. It'll be difficult for an aircraft to determine if a vessel found fishing in a protected area is targeting ground fish or other species. Likewise, it'll be difficult for a large patrol vessel to approach a vessel fishing in a protected area without being detected before any illegal catch is discarded. Alternative six, non trawl RCA adjustments off Washington for pot gear. As mentioned in past statements, the EC have concerns about enforceability in areas where the inner and outer boundary depth contours are very close geographically, such as along a steep bank shelf with little separation, which makes monitoring with BMS difficult. In addition, on the water enforcement would be equally challenging to determine if gear was set lawfully in areas where the inner and outer bank boundary depth contours are very close, such as along a steep shelf or bank with little separation. The EC recommends limiting additional gear exceptions within the non trawl RCA as it would create complexity and increase the enforcement burden beyond what is already anticipated with this alternative. If this alternative moves forward, a new declaration code may need be de may need to be developed to facilitate monitoring. Finally, page 67 notes this alternative will be refined in the future to ensure the open areas avoid direct and indirect conflicts with recreational and other fisheries currently fishing within the 100 fathoms. The EC would like to note the strong possibility for gear conflict during recreational halibut seasons in the waters near the southwest corner of the North Coast Recreational Yellow Eye RCA as it is an extremely popular recreational fishing areas. For this reason, the EC recommends consideration of a late summer, early fall commercial fishery. This concludes the EC statement.
Uh, thank you very much for the EC statement, Greg. And I'll look to see if there are any questions from around the table. Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bush. I'm looking at your recommendations under Alternative 5 to repeal the CCA. Um, I'm looking at the last one on the list for take of species other than ground fish and that the EC is recommending that fishing for other species not be allowed within uh, the protected areas. Um, I guess I'm just curious if uh, you discussed with council staff um, kind of the bounds of this analysis and the scope of the action under consideration here and the difference between um, the proposals and uh, consideration of establishing um, EFH uh, protections, which would apply to a multitude of species um, or could. So I'm just wondering how much, um, how much interchange you had with council staff uh, on the scope of the proposal. Thanks. Thank you for the question, Mr. Renko, through the chair. Um, this, our statement um, related to the take of species other than ground fish is an ideal um, situation that we, we wanted to put forward is that if we had our, if, if we had our uh, ability to make this area, these areas completely enforceable, we would not allow any fishing to take place within them and make them similar to a marine reserve um, that would have to be established under, that would normally be established under, say, a different regulatory authority. And we recognize that there would be potential um, implications with the other areas outside of ground fish within, uh, within, uh, within this, uh, our 660 regulations. Um, and we did not discuss this with other uh, council entities or council staff for, for evaluation. We just look at this as being a, in an ideal world. If we had the ability to control access to the area, this would significantly improve um, our ability to enforce those protected areas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Greg, for the clarification. That helps a lot. All right, any uh, further questions of the enforcement consultants? All right, thank you very much, Greg. And that completes all of the reports we have. We have 10 folks signed up for public comment. Um, the first uh, is Ben Ednicknap and Greg Shester. Oh, Jeff Shester. Great. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I think uh, we're, we're waiting for a PowerPoint to be uh, set up and put up on display here. And I'll, uh, I'll pass it over to my colleague, Ben Enticknap. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the council. I'm Ben Enticknap, and with me is Dr. Jeff Shester, representing Oceana. We wanted to testify today in support of adding the recommendations in CDF&W Report 1 to the range of alternatives that are being considered under this agenda item. Starting last fall, Jeff and I participated in a series of meetings with CDFW, Southern California Recreational and Commercial Fishing Representatives. And this work uh, became the basis for the recommendations that are before you in CDFW Report 1. And at this time, we wanna provide some additional background and context to those collaborative meetings, to describe the group's process, the data that we considered, and also to share some highlights of the important habitats within the proposed protection areas. Next slide, please. So we started with the, the shared goal as a, a working group to repeal the CCAs, given their rebuilt status of, of CalCOD to increase fixed gear and recreational opportunities while establishing new protections for the corals and sponges and other living habitats that are within, within that area, within the CCAs. Next, please. So first, here's a, an overview of the two CalCOD conservation areas. And I just wanna note here the physical geography of the Southern California Bight 
is like no other place off the West Coast with its large offshore islands and complex of extensive offshore banks and ridges that rise up from the surrounding deep sea basins. Next slide. And so we considered the substrate data uh, that was made available during the Amendment 28 EFH review, showing the location of rocky reefs and mixed substrates in, these, in this area, which is you know, an overall a rare habitat feature. Uh, next slide. And then we also looked at the um, most recent information on deep sea coral and sponge uh, observations from the NOAA Deep Sea Coral Sponge Database. There are over 3,700 coral observations and 14,000 sponges in the two uh, CCAs. Next slide, please. And this uh, map here shows the predictive models of areas of high suitability for cold water corals that um, Andre presented in his report. So we also considered this predictive information. Uh, next slide. And then uh, based on all of, all of the data, we then identified areas of discussion. And then as a working group, we real deliberately talked through every one of these, these spots to see if they, we can find agreement for areas that would stay closed for the purpose of habitat protection or for the underlying habitat features. And you know, we did find a lot of agreement, but there were other places, for example, Tanner and Cortez Banks, where we, uh, we found that you know, it'd be really difficult to get to a consensus based on the importance of those areas uh, for the fishery and for fish fishermen wanting to get back into those, those places. So next slide, please. Which then uh, following those discussions led us to the areas that you have before you, the eight sites. Um, these areas make up less than 12% of the overall area of the two CCAs, but represent nearly 44% of the coral observations and 35% of the observed sponges. And we feel that these areas accurately reflect the work um, of the, the group and they will would be successful to meeting our shared goal. Next slide. Um, I'll uh, take over from here. Again, this is Jeff Shester from Oceana. Um, so just to go through some of these areas, uh, I mean, basically uh, we have just a slide showing some of the photos. These are all photos from specifically within the areas uh, that, that are proposed in the CDFW report. Um, that are from that you can find these in the NOAA deep sea coral uh, data portal. Um, so in some of these areas, like for Cherry Bank, have uh, a rich with uh, lophelia beds, um, many different species of strawberry anemones, uh, deep sea corals, and and just uh, look to us appeared to be one of the the the, the prime sites for consideration in, in this process. The next slide, please. Yeah, 43 Fathom Bank uh, is is one that's a bit closer to shore, and I think after a lot of discussion, there was there was some important uh, fishing in this area, but also was was uh, shown to be uh, very important for cow cod. And this area has some of these large uh, demo sponges, those big kind of barrel tube looking ones on the right, um, a, a, diff a high diversity of stony corals and gorgonians, as well as the that white whitish coral is the the Christmas tree coral, uh, which is a type of black coral that um, and black coral Corals are some of the most long-lived species that can, uh, some of some species can live for uh, hundreds of years and are very slow growing. And you can also see there's some reef building corals there on the right, the Lophelia as well. Next slide. Uh, this 107, 118 bank, these are some areas just uh, to the north of Cherry Bank. Uh, you can see uh, a, a wide diversity of some of these glass sponges, um, uh, vase sponges, as well as uh, Gorgonian corals. Um, you can see um, the, the, the black coral there that's kind of that purple one in the top middle as well, uh, one, of, one of kind of the larger specimens there that we'd seen. Uh, we've also saw a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, different rockfish species, uh, not only next to, but also inside of and using some of these sponges as habitat in this area. Next slide, please. Hidden Reef is also one of these areas that's a, a bit more close to shore. We had some deep discussions, I guess, of this, and there were uh, two large banks there, the, the 17 Fathom and the 60 Fathom uh, bank there that um, were identified as very important uh, uh, areas for, for habitats, while, um, while the area did not include some of the uh, existing real high, high important areas uh, for, for fishing opportunities, particularly uh, when we looked at uh, Kidney Bank, which is a little bit to the south and avoided 
some of those areas. Again, uh, rich abundances of uh, of uh, and big big pinnacles of rocks uh, surrounded by lots of fish. Uh, these crinoid beds and and very dense densely populated um, uh, areas full of these deep sea habitats. Next next uh, slide, please. Potato Bank is also a, a, a bank that was recognized in the original EFH process in 2005. Uh, and protected early on uh, from bottom trawl impacts. Uh, so we used similar boundaries uh, that were that overlap with the CCA to include some of the areas uh, here. You can see uh, several different species again, as well as some of these reef building uh, corals uh, uh, and, and a number of different types of uh, pelagic tunic, or not pelagic, but uh, compound tunicates, as well as the strawberry anemones and other biogenic uh, habitat types. Next slide. Northeast Bank uh, is basically at the lower, uh, or I guess the southern, um, uh, southwestern uh, corner of the Calcod Conservation Area. Um, it, it's it's basically a large seamount feature that uh, has been explored. It hasn't been explored for a long time, uh, since uh, I think 2004, when a Monterey Bay, Bay Aquarium Research Institute got some of these uh, images uh, going at deeper depths. It is deeper. It's definitely one of the furthest offshore. And uh, the, the whole feature itself uh, appears to be a very, very important for some of the deep sea corals. Um, and so these, these images are not from inside the proposed area. These are from just outside it. But the idea is to at least protect the uh, components of this uh, feature that appear to be also in the Calcod conservation area, uh, the similar habitat types uh, to, to these that you see here in these photos. Next slide. Seamount 109 is uh, just a bit west of the Cortez and Tanner banks. Um, these these habitats have a lot of these rocky pinnacles. Again, some of the uh, the glass sponges uh, that also were some signs of uh, some fishing gear debris in some of the the photos. Um, so many of these areas uh, would be unlikely to be trawled, but uh, um, there there are there are is evidence that there are, uh, could maybe some fishing impacts in, in these areas as well. But Seamount 109 was one of the the places that the deep sea coral program really identified as kind of one of the more exciting places where there's only been a few dives and the ones that have been done uh, appear to, to show just some some really amazing and gorgeous uh, deep sea coral habitats. Next slide. And then, yeah, West Santa Barbara Island was the the uh, the last one. And I did one. These these are all photos from Oceana. I wanted to maybe go over to the video uh, and, and just play that just a quick two minute video at the uh, end here, if we can get that going. So this is um, a video that hopefully will uh, will we'll play for us here. Um, this was uh, basically showing uh, a, a number of um, uh, ROV dives that we did uh, out in 2016. Uh, we partnered with a group of marine applied research and exploration, uh, as well as the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. And we put the uh, this remote operated vehicle down uh, to a range of depths between uh, 100 and 400 meters. These are all images uh, uh, and photographs from the West Santa Barbara Island site from within that area. So you can see uh, these large boulder fields uh, that have uh, several species of Gorgonian corals uh, in them here. Um, it's, it's a little difficult to see with the, the skippy video, but this is the uh, Acanthagorgia, the, which is known as the gold coral. You can see black corals here as well in, the, in these images. Uh, many uh, kind of fields of these large sponges, many of which did have uh, a small or and large uh, rockfish in them. You can see some of those hidden uh, in the cracks of those sponges there, as well as other types of uh, invertebrates and, um, and and animals there in, the, in there. So the video is not showing up super well, but uh, uh, hopefully you can see some of the uh, types of habitats that we were able to encounter there and just a wide diversity of, I think, the key prime species that you, you would uh, hope to want to some of these areas to protect, uh, including some of these uh, these large gold corals and black corals, uh, and and what the uh, deep sea coral program describes as these coral gardens that have high uh, densities of of deep sea corals. And there was a, a long discussion at the habitat committee on those. Um, so yeah, I just uh, I see the times up. So just as we uh, show those last images, wanted to to thank uh, the department as well as the various collaborators on the working group. I think it, it demonstrated that that we can come together and find some um, collaborative uh, opportunities here. Uh, we ask that you do for now protect these as ground fish uh, conservation areas to uh, ensure that they can be fully considered uh, for a more durable protection in the upcoming EFH review. And we'd be happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you very much for your time and letting us show those videos. All right, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Ben. Any questions? 
All right, thank you very much. And Steve Westrick, followed by John Keppen. Steve? Can you hear me okay now? Can hear you now, yep. Okay, thanks. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Council Members, and thanks for the opportunity to speak today on a very heartfelt issue. My name is Steve Westrick. I'm from Westport, Washington, the fishing town I grew up in and still reside in today. As an adolescent, I worked for my fantastic dad as the deckhand on the family charter boat. <clears throat> and when I got old enough, I applied for and eventually received my own captain's license. We still have a family charter business in Westport and my son, who's also licensed and 40 now, which I can't believe, job shares with me on our boat. I'm quite enthused of late also because my 10 year old grandson Cooper has taken some interest and comes out with us on occasion as well. I think this is a big reason I'm so passionate about the recreational sport fishery and wanting to help leave a healthy and productive legacy going forward. The Westport Charter Boat Association is the organization I am representing today. I've been an active board member here for decades. <clears throat> Our organi organization was originally formed in about 1960 with the primary intent of salmon involvement but our group has evolved into so much more with all of the different fisheries we are now involved in. In representing our association, I do not want to exclude that in a big way, we are representing the interests of the public that fishes with us. We are kind of their voice, so to speak, to strive for the best sport fishing opportunities possible. My comments today relate to Agenda item F6, non-trawl sector area management measures, and in particular, alternative six. This alternative seeks to move parts of the non-trawl RCA fathom line into 75 fathoms from 100. We feel this alternative has the potential to adversely affect the sport fishery in the ground fish area between 75 and 100 fathoms. So for a little background and the heartfelt concerns, I felt compelled to tell our story about a very important fishery. Prior to 2019, the recreational ground fish fishery off the coast of Washington and outside of 50 fathoms has been restricted for about 20 years, except for the few open halibut days in which we could, in addition to halibut, retain lingcod. However, the RCAs remained completely no fishing zones until 2021. The present regulations now allow us access to the RCAs and outside of 50 fathoms, but only for a brief period, two weeks in, two weeks in June and the month of September, which never doesn't have weather issues. Needless to say, our time offshore for Lincoln is quite limited. With the nowadays restrictive salmon seasons, we have developed what we call a deep water lingcod trip that accesses the offshore waters. And this fishery is utilized by the recreational fleets as well as charter operations. This fishery is an extremely important part of our overall economic survival. And with that said, the key component of this fishery is the benefit of high quality lingcod fishing followed by catches of species like canary and yellow tail rockfish. A high, a high quality lingcod fishery depends, depends on areas that are not heavily fished year round and have time to repopulate during our extensive closure periods. We are concerned about introducing a commercial fishery into these areas particularly when they have extensive open periods throughout the year. We believe that this could result in depletion in certain areas that we, that we depend on, resulting in a severe negative impact on recreational fishing in those areas. Yeah. 
Lastly, we obviously need ample time to carefully consider the ramifications of opening the area from 75 to 100 fathoms on our fishery. So that concludes uh, our test, my testimony, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve. Are there questions of Steve? Thank you, oh, okay. Phil Anderson. Sorry. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, could you just briefly speak to, um, I mean, a lot of people who aren't familiar with fishing out in the ocean look out at the ocean and it's this big expansive area, but those of us who fish out there realize that there are some, you know, that the, the fishing areas where you find success are finite. Could you give us a sense of kind of the number um, in, uh, of areas that are, are, do you find productive fishing with recreational gear types? You mean offshore? Yeah. This, I, I, I probably a half a dozen, six, seven, maybe even eight. Um, you know, some are better than others, but uh, it's very beneficial to, to have more than than two or three spots to go to, obviously, because this is, yeah. Am I correct in assuming those areas are fairly small? Uh, yeah, yeah, they're not huge, expansive, but but um, I don't know what you what what you determine as small, but I I think some areas are as much as five or six uh, miles up and down the coast. Okay. Thanks, Steve. You're welcome. Any further questions? All right. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Uh, John Keppen, followed by Mike Conroy. Good afternoon, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is John Keppen. I'm speaking on behalf of the uh, Morro Bay, Moss Landing, Santa Cruz, Fort Bragg, Fishermen's Association, and the um, San Francisco Crab Boat Owners Association. We are speaking on uh, agenda item F, uh, F6. And um, you know, for, we'd like to re reiterate my written com uh, comments which encouraged adoption for analysis of alternative one with an increased sense of urgency, as well as support for the GAPS recommendation to move alternative one, two, and three forward. It is imperative to the commercial fishing industry for the council and fish managers to realize our sense of desperation in that restriction on uh, quill, copper and quillback in near shore waters, abbreviated Dungeness crab seasons, and ever tightening restrictions on ocean salmon all add to a failure, a failing industry. Infrastructure in coastal communities, historic reliance on commercial fishery, and we request the council to give guidance which will well, allow uh, for private fishing, for, excuse me, for a pivotal fishery for the um, small boat fleet. Please move alternatives one, two, and three forward. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for John? All right, thank you, John. Uh, Mike Conroy, followed by uh, Sherry Flummerfeld. And, and Mike, uh, I assume, please assume we can hear you unless we you hear otherwise. <laughs> I got that fine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My, my name is Mike Connor. I am here today speaking on behalf of the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations. Um, I'm going to buck my typical trend in being verbose in my comments and just be very quick here today. Um, as you all know, we've been pushing uh, for gaining open act, gaining access to the non-trawl RCAs for California small boat and large boat commercial fishermen. Uh, we hope that you would take whatever actions you can to move that forward in an expeditious fashion. Um, between the constraints facing our members from the salmon fishery, from the nearshore fisheries, 
and from the Dungeness Crab Fisheries, any additional opportunities that that we can create to kind of help bridge this this challenging time for for our members and others uh, would be greatly appreciated. Um, I do want to talk just for a brief moment about there was a back and forth between Marcy and and Merritt. And as a guy who used to run sport boats, I can fully appreciate what Merritt was saying about getting access not getting access, but, you know, being challenged and fishing certain depths and, and, and fishing for tunas and the like and catching a ground fish and ha having to deal with that. And then I believe somebody at some point in time mentioned the possibility of setting up marine reserves for this in these future RCAs, if that's what the CCAs are converted into. I, I will remind you that there is also an active squid fishery that this past year was very successful in Kidney Bank. I fished squid on Kidney Bank years ago and also on the 43. So, you know, just, just be sure that when you're moving forward, uh, considering these things, that you don't invert, inadvertently uh, take away opportunities for fisheries that, that do not interact with ground fish. And with that, I will stop and say thanks. Thank you very much, Mike. Appreciate your comments. Any questions of Mike? Thank you, Mike. All right, uh, Sherry Flummerfeld, followed by Harrison Iback. Welcome, Sherry. Uh, hi, thank you. Uh, I'm with the Monterey Bay Fisheries Trust. I said I'm Sherry Flummerfeld, and the Monterey Bay Fisheries Trust is a nonprofit that works to support our local fishing community and increase the public's access to local sustainably harvested seafood. And I just want to thank the council for continuing to prioritize and make progress on increasing access to the non troll RCAs. And I hope that this will continue to move forward in a timely fashion. This has been a top issue of concern in our community since before I started at the trust eight years ago. And it's never been more urgent given what's happening with Dungeness crab, salmon, and new constraints on quillback and copper. If we want our small boat operators to survive, and if we want to keep this livelihood and way of life in California's coastal communities, then we have to increase their access to recovered rockfish stocks sooner rather than later. And it's not just about meeting the needs of fishermen, it's also about meeting the needs of the many businesses that depend on local seafood and the general public that deserves access to healthy local seafood and shouldn't have to rely on imported seafood often caught unsustainably with questionable labor practices and a much higher carbon footprint. So I ask you to please continue your hard work, keeping this important issue moving forward towards authorization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sherry. Are there questions of Sherry? Thank you, Sherry. Harrison Ibach, followed by George Bradshaw. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Harrison, again here. Um, here. On behalf of Humboldt Fishermen's Marketing Association, the rep to all of open access. Um, and it, in this scenario, all of open access for the entire coast. Uh, first and foremost, I want to just say that it really, we, the fleet, appreciates all the work that's going into this non troll agenda item. Um, I understand it's a huge workload, um, but also at the same time, um, as has been stated by Sherry and Mike, um, there's definitely a need for this uh, to get into the non troll RCA. Um, first and foremost, I just want to touch real quick. I mean, the, kind of the future of where I'm seeing this going, potentially and ideally, is probably with block area closures. Um, we understand that there's sensitive habitat out there uh, but the vast majority of the non troll RCA consists of softer substrate, and that does not include sensitive habitat. And a lot of these areas, I'd say the vast majority of these areas, is already open to many other bottom contact fisheries. I mean, trawl fisheries such as bottom trawl and pink shrimp and California halibut, and also pot fisheries such as Dungeness crab and hagfish and spot prawn and coon striped shrimp and and then there's also the salmon fishery that utilizes a whole lot of the non troll RCA. So from our perspective, you know, from the, from the fisherman's perspective, we see all these other fisheries utilizing the non troll RCA, but yet we feel as though that we've been locked out of there. And I, and I understand that there's concerns. Obviously, there's habitat concerns, bycatch concerns, yellow eye constraints, um, 
And I feel as though that with block area closures is probably going to be the best path in moving forward with that. Um, but also at the same time, I mean, right now, as Sherry and Mike had just touched on, like the importance of getting in there, it's, it's really, really important. We need opportunity. Um, I know that I've signed up <laughs> to, to get front row seats to all the issues that we have at hand right now. But I mean, the constraints that we have with our fisheries right now, especially with Nearshore with Copper and Quillback is just <laughs> quite brutal. Uh, we all know that the salmon fishery um, is far from ideal right now. Um, in California with the Dungeness crab fishery, I mean, that is far from what it once was not even too long ago. And the future of the fishing industry needs as much opportunity as possible. And right now with these issues, we're getting less and less opportunity. And there's been discussions on how expensive it is and how maybe fishermen are getting priced out of the industry, but that's not necessarily the case. I mean, a fisherman can work his way up from the bottom up as long as he has opportunity, just like I did from a small skiff up to where I am now. The prices are expensive, yes, but as long as you have opportunity, you can get there. And we're getting dwindling opportunities with these other fisheries. And it's not just that. We also have these looming threats, these threats of like offshore wind, fish farms, these pending lawsuits that's going on. I mean, the threats of uh, changing over our fisheries to ropeless gear, the, the 30 by 30 action. I mean, now we're having more discussions on more marine reserves. I mean, for, the, for a standard fisherman, this really leads to the feelings of like fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And the non-trawl fleet needs a win. Fishermen can only handle so many losses until they walk away from the industry. I mean, even me personally, I mean, I am feeling an overwhelming amount of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. At this point, I don't really know when I'm going to have to walk away from the industry. And I'm not saying that opening up the non-trawl RCA is going to be the solution to all of this. I'm not going to say it's going to be the cure-all by any means but it is a win and it's gonna create opportunity. And right now the fleet needs as much opportunity as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Harrison. Questions of Harrison? Thank you, Harrison. George Bradshaw followed by Daniel Lee. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair, Council and staff. Um, you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, you know, I'm George Bradshaw. I'm going to represent my local area region out of Crescent City, California for the Crescent City Commercial Fishermen's Association. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have, I'm not going to spend time here right now to go over my recommendation of, you know, council action for this agenda item because I'm not fully engaged enough to give that specific um you know answers however you know the sentiment that harrison was just sharing is the reason why i'm calling in and specific to my region you know we are sitting here looking down the gun barrel of you know failing salmon seasons once again zero access zero none at all in in, in our local region for salmon and you know new constraints on the near shore fisheries which was kind of the lifeline for my local fleets. And, you know, a salmon or a crab fishery that again is getting shut down months early and looks to potentially, you know, open late again next year and continue to have constraints. Um, you know, I, I have the same unfortunate feelings as Harrison has shared of, of doubt. Um, you know, I, I'm engaged in every process of all my fisheries because I, ha I I thought there was hope. I thought that there was, you know, if there was engagement, there would be a way to find our way through this. I thought that, you know, being able to share our expertise that we know on the water would help expedite some of these situations that we're in. Um, 
unfortunately, it seems as though there's a lot of closed doors and a lot of a, a lot of answers saying that it isn't possible. We run into you know enforcement issues and habitat issues and everything every step of the way. And not that those aren't real, um, you know. And I'm not saying that they aren't, but you know, at some point something's going to have to give. Otherwise, like Harrison is saying, that you know this fleet isn't going to be able to support itself. Um, you know, and and it brings me to a situation that I was just in myself with my my oldest son, which at his ripe old age of six wants to go fishing with me. But honestly, like, do I discourage that? because there's not a future. And that's a really poor situation to be in as a parent and as a father because I'm proud of of what I do. And and like Harrison said, you know, this isn't probably a fix all, but it's it's more of a lifeline until we could get a handle on our other fisheries, the more mainstay fisheries. And we've been engaged in this conversation for multiple years now. Um, obviously, with a lot of work that's gone on, a lot of analysis, a lot of conversations. But the fact is, we have a population of over for overpopulated, underutilized fish. The fishermen took the weight on their back to allow those fish the time to repopulate with the hope that we'd be able to go fish them again in a sustainable way. And that is all we're asking for. And it needs to happen sooner than later. Um, you know, with that, I'll, I'll just once again say thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, George. Are there any questions for George? Thanks again. Uh, Daniel Lee, followed by Merritt McRae. All right, uh, council members, uh, commercial fishermen. I was originally from fishing out of Humboldt County and, and uh, Mendocino County out of Fort Bragg for brownfish and salmon. And as the salmon season started to fall apart, uh, I was forced to buy a deeper nearshore permit in order to supplement my income uh, to stay at a, the ability to live. And then uh, COVID hit and I lost my markets out of Fort Bragg because the restaurants closed and it caused me to move my business all the way down to Half Moon Bay. Um, about that same time, we had a meeting. Uh, I forget when it was. It was right at the start of all this when we meet, used to meet still in person and there was a discussion that was had about moving the rca out to uh, 50 fathoms below point arena we were able to get that done as well as open up some of the quota uh that of these over abundant rockfish stocks uh namely shelf widow and boccaccio um and then last this upcoming last year uh the loss of the copper and quillback fisheries forced me out of my deeper near shore slot, my, my preferred market, and uh, forced me into finding a new ground fish market yet again. And I couldn't move north because there was no access. I had to remain in Half Moon Bay. And so I had to switch into fishing out there in the 50 Fathom, right next to the 50 Fathom RCA for the abundant yellowtail stocks. And uh, it's, it's been able to keep me afloat, uh, just keep you know, within three years, I've had so many drastic changes happen in my life just to to not be homeless. Um, like you guys say, it's disheartening as hell. Uh, the fish are there. You know, we all want to go to work. Uh, in my case, I, I'm I'm having to travel seven hours from my front door just to commute to work so that I can go catch fish for the local community down there. Um, and I would say just to couple things to the, the council as they consider moving forward these dented items like this is going to be make or break here in the next few years for a few of us um unfortunately
unfortunately break is going to be the reality for some. And if we don't get these changes through quickly, that number is only going to grow that do not make it. Um, I would say as well, now that I've actually gone out there and uh, trolled for these particular rockfish, that not only do you give us access to this area, but I would highly recommend uh, increasing the quotas, especially the Caccio and shelf rockfish as they're quite easy to target um, with zero bycatch, I think, uh, out of the species of concern uh, in the last uh, probably seven or 8,000 pounds that I've caught in the last few months, uh, I've seen two coolbacks, um, maybe three yellow dye, zero cow cod. Uh, my interaction with the species of concerns is just non-existent, you know, point zero zero one percent of my total poundage is uh is even any type of bycatch of concern um and then as we move into the rca with the specific gear types that requires that the hooks are even further from the bottom i would imagine that our contact rates are going to go in that area to zero of uh, species of concerns so if it's you know important for me to reiterate that while we're getting access to these areas it would be very important it's not going to be detrimental to anything to increase those shelf rockfish and the uh, quotas. I remember at the time we had that meeting about uh, signing those quotas, we actually had an option to, to go up to 10,000 pounds for Boccaccio, 10,000 pounds for uh, shelf stock and 10,000 pounds for widow stock. And at the time it seemed like it was unnecessary because we had some salmon opportunity, COVID hadn't really started getting going and we had a viable deeper near shore fishery. Um, now that's all gone. It's gone. It's not coming back either. I mean, I've heard talks of rebuilding plans that are supposed to last decades. Um, so yeah, I would, I would highly, I don't know how to encourage you guys anymore, but I would highly encourage you to act now to save what we might have in the future. Cause if you don't, we're screwed. And that's the reality. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Daniel. Any questions for Daniel? All right, thank you, Daniel. Uh, Merritt McRae, followed by Ken Frankie. Merritt? Good afternoon, Chair Gorelnick, Council Members. I'm Merritt McRae, and um, thank you for hearing me this afternoon. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the Coastal Conservation Association of California. I note that the Sport Fishing Association of California President Ken Frankie has signed up uh, right after me and he'll testify on the CFP, CPFB fleet's behalf. Members of both groups participated in several meetings of the CDFNW's ad hoc working group on repealing the CalCod conservation areas. We support the repeal of the CalCod con uh, conservation areas as described within CDFNW report one under this item. We support and appreciate the GMT's report here as well and their recommendation nine. We also concur with the GAP statement. Anglers would re prefer gear-based management methods, which would protect benthic invertebrates, deep water corals and sponges from damage. Nevertheless, opening the majority of the CCA to ground fishing is the priority for anglers, even if portions remain closed on a more permanent basis. We appreciate the efforts of the CDFNW staff, uh, fellow members of the ad hoc working group, and in particular CDFNW's Andrew Klein. We appreciate Oceana staff for having provided much of the GIS mapping analyses and facilitation of this group. Oceana was instrumental in supporting these discussions and the results put forward in the CDFNW report one. Uh, thank you and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Merritt. Are there any questions of Merritt? All right, thank you, Merritt. Ken Frankie, welcome. Chair Gronick, uh, council members, Ken Frankie representing the Sport Fishing Association of California. Uh, Merritt said it well. Um, this statement pertains to the Calcot Conservation Area. First, I want to acknowledge the work by Andrew Klein of CDFNW. Jeff Shester with Oceana, CCA, and a long list of other folks that helped in the development group. 
good outreach effort without a doubt. This includes especially Andrew or Andre spending a lot of time with our captains. That said, we're in support of the removal of the CCA with a recommendation that science be developed regarding impact of light tackle recreational bottom fishing. And I'm talking about those areas that are shallower near, near the core, near the coast, not those deep water areas proposed to be uh, closed completely for the coral protection. As a point of information, the anglers now use light tackle with two hooks and an eight to 16 ounce uh, weight. The anchors, the anglers frankly avoid spending more than an occasional moment on the bottom. The anchor cr angler cranks up many turns uh, to get the sinker off the seafloor. In most cases, there's very little for a sinker to tangle with, with uh, the hooks are well above the sinker. If there's minimal impact, then it should be considered to open for recreational bottom fishing. This would also make it easier to manage from a law enforcement perspective. Uh, final comment, ships in some of these areas anchor with several thousand pounds of anchor and tons of chain. I don't think our 12 ounce sinker is that much of a big issue. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you very much. Ken, are there any questions? All right, thank you, Ken. You bet. And that concludes um, public comment. It concludes all of our reports and takes us to council uh, discussion and action. Um, and certainly if folks want a break uh, before concluding this agenda item, we can do that as well. So. What is the council's pleasure? Yeah, so I'm getting some signs we wanna, would 10 minutes be enough? So let's just take a 10 minute break. We'll be back at 4.31 and we will tackle uh, this agenda item.
All right, let's uh, make our way back to our seats so we can um, get to work on this agenda item. We've had um, a great presentation, a number of reports from bodies, and uh, a significant amount of public comment. It brings us to our council action here, which is on the screen before us, including to provide guidance. I don't think that we're looking for a lot of detail here but we do want to be clear on our guidance and provide it in the form of a motion. So let's get some discussion started. Keely Kent. Thank you. Um, before we get rolling into discussion, I did just really want to take a moment to thank um, council staff and the other teams that worked on all of the information that was brought forward today. I really appreciate the level of detail um, that was provided. I think it's been really helpful for the council to consider refining the range of alternatives. Um, and I will say this is uh, this is the type of team that has been built with council staff and NIMP staff and our JS um, contractor that um, I envisioned under our new regional operating agreement. So I'm especially thrilled to see the coordination and communication that's happened. So I just wanted to take a moment to call that out. Thank you, Keely. All right, let's get started with some discussion on this agenda item. Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm ready with a motion and maybe that will prompt discussion. That may be the most efficient it, it, it way It often forward. does when people don't raise their hands. But let me just see before we have the motion, does anyone has anything to say before we have a motion? Any form of discussion? Corey Ridings. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I'll just uh, quickly continue the kudos. I just wanted to thank CDFNW um, for leading the ad hoc work group and producing the report, especially wanted to say thank you to Andre, who did a really amazing job with that work. Um, I sat in on a couple of those meetings and was able to um, participate in the discussion. And it's um, just another example of successful collaboration um, that produces good reports like this and good things for us to work with. So um, we'll support that as being included, obviously, but just wanted to say thanks to everybody involved. Well, it's amazing what we can do when we work together and pull in the same direction. So uh, Marcy or Bob Dooley and then Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think this is a culmination of a lot of work, good work by a lot of people. And we've heard heartfelt, uh, testimony by many in industry that this is really needed. It's a critical time where we need to get into that area. Those sectors need to get into that area that's been closed for 20 years, and particularly now with all of the other challenges, including price of fuel, failing infrastructure, all of the things that we need to keep our industry alive. So that being said, I'll be my broken record again for every time we talk about this. I, the un overarching um, issue that I always think about is we're going into an area that hasn't has been closed for 20 years and we're gonna have interactions with species that have been rebuilding over time. And we've had warnings that there's critical habitat that hasn't been touched and there's worries about bottom contact, all of these things. I think the overarching thing that I hear that I don't necessarily see front and center is they talk about the logbook coming in and I think that's a critical part of, of, of this program. And I think I'm, I'm going into this understanding that that logbook will be a critical part of this. That's a requirement, that mandatory logbook. The other part is we heard last meeting from, um, might not have been last meeting, it had been one before, we had an observer report of observer coverage. And it's acknowledged in, in several places 
in in our uh, presentations today that some of the sectors have very low, low observer rates. And I think it is incumbent upon the agency and the observer program to re-examine these areas as we re-enter them and understand if we have adequate observer coverage in those to verify the discards that may be in the encounters that will be happening. And I don't, I don't say that from a sour grapes type of thing that one sector has more than the other. That's not what it's about. I want to, I want to sit here in five years and say, we did a good thing. I don't want people coming back and go, you didn't do this. You didn't check that box that you were doing it with accountability and you were doing it with proactive. And I think that particular box is the agency's job, making sure we have science behind our, our actions. And I think that <clears throat> with some of the sectors down in single digits of observer coverage, with this proposed, or what I think we're going to be doing here, opening up areas, which we should be doing, I think they need to be on the team and, and helping us so that we don't come back in five years and people are waving flags that we did we did the wrong thing and we, we didn't act to keep our fishery sustainable. So I'll stop there, but I, I'm thinking that this, I'm coming into this, with full support, a lot of good work here by a lot of people, but I'm doing it of the understanding that we're going to have logbooks. That's an added level of scrutiny on this fishery. We're also going to have a revisit of the observer coverage to make sure it's it's deemed adequate by the agency that it's their responsibility to do so. So I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bob. Uh, Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sandra, I believe you have a motion. Thank you. I move the revisions to the range of alternatives for non trawl sector area management measures as recommended by the Groundfish Management Team in agenda item F6A, Supplemental GMT Report 1, April 2022. Thank you, Marcy. And the language on the screen appears to be accurate and complete. I'll look for a second. Seconded by Maggie Summer. Please speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I'll start by saying, uh, thinking about constructing a motion on this enormous topic, my biggest fear was that we would leave something out. So uh, in order, I think, to most completely capture uh, our intent and the steps forward for analysis, um, the easiest way to um, move ahead today, uh, in my mind, is to move the recommendations in their entirety forward from the GMT report. So uh, that's what I'm intending to do here. And just wanted to make that clear up front, um, noting that um, I very much appreciate uh, the interchange uh, we had with Mel and Jesse about the GMT report and the crosswalking between the content in the GMT report and the number of questions that council staff uh, have developed for us to weigh in on uh, as they begin their analytical work preparing um, the alternatives and the analysis uh, that we have in the attachment um, provided for us for review under this item. So um, I didn't want to leave anything out. I thought this was the best way to go about moving it forward, but I would note that particularly with alternative three, which is the item that discusses the RCA line moves that um, some additional uh, clarity and guidance um, might be needed beyond what is in 
the GMT's report. And so that uh, will come forward in a second motion uh, that will follow this one. So I just want to say that up front so that um, we're clear on the pathway and on the intent. Um, also want to take a second to acknowledge how we got to um, this suite of alternatives uh, that we are now calling non trawl sector area management measures. Um, there have been a number of past actions where we haven't been able to do everything that we want to do in the time um, and the capacity that council staff have had, NIMS regulatory staff have had, um, and some of our previous specs actions. And um, this uh, kind of catch-all um, action was created to combine um, items that we felt were priorities from our new management measure discussions. And we know we needed to make action on or make progress on these items outside of our biennial specifications process. And um, the suggestion to combine these items into this package uh, came about after a lot of thought about what naturally can pair together and how can we um, make progress on um, our priorities in a, a most in the most efficient way. Um, so I want to acknowledge um, the thinking behind combining um, items that have been a priority for the council on its list for some time, some number of years, and um, putting things together in this natural way um, has been, uh, even though it's big and seemingly complicated, really does achieve a, a large number of the priorities that we have been talking about for many, many years. So I just want to um, appreciate that and the, the work um, that council staff has put into um, thinking about that. Um, also want to um, acknowledge uh, some remarks that have been made um, in some of the statements as well as some um, public comment that I just I want to kind of put aside some um, some question that's been out there about what what the scope of this action is relative to essential fish habitat. Um, that is its own distinct and unique process that uh, we take up every five years and is next slated for 2025. Um, we don't know what that process might look like in our future, um, but if our last review of, v any, of EFH is any indication, it's a multi-year and detailed and complex uh, review that might take a number of uh, years to actually implement into regulation. Um, I appreciate that we have um, that process and I look forward to um, working on that when the time um, comes, but I'm very sensitive to the remarks of, um, of folks indicating that, you know, some of these areas that we are talking about um, wanting access to as uh, identified in our draft purpose and need, um, there is a sense of urgency. And I appreciate that and am sensitive to it. And I feel that this package, um, which focuses on management of ground fish fisheries, um, strikes the right balance between providing uh, protections to the most sensitive of habitats while uh, allowing greater access to areas that right now can't be utilized um, for groundfish fishery activity on many of our very healthiest of stocks. So um, this item really is uh, a step forward in a stepwise progression um, toward greater utilization by the non trawl sector of the healthy stocks. Um, 
so I just um, wanted to to note that we do have another process that will be um, coming forward in in a few years that will um, take a look at uh, EFH conserva conservation areas more fully, and that does involve um, considerations that would affect non ground fish fisheries. So we heard a lot of testimony about other species, HMS, um, trawling, pink shrimp, spot prawn trapping. Um, there are a number of fisheries that utilize um, areas that right now are in our rockfish conservation areas and our cow cod areas um, that, that have full access to those areas while it's our ground fish fisheries that don't have the same access. So with regard to uh, the purpose and need, um, the GMT has recommended to us that um, we task the council staff with revising the purpose and need based on the feedback from this meeting, um, including some of the habitat needs that were outlined in the habitat committee report. And I think that's a, that's a solid recommendation. Um, I support giving the council staff the discretion to incorporate um, the pieces of that that will help us um, have a fully complete purpose and need um, that meets our objectives in the alternatives uh, one, two, three, uh, five, and six. So I'll look forward to that. Um, specifically related to alternative one, which is to allow open access vessels uh, targeting ground fish in the non-trawl RCA using approved hook and line gear. Um, this is the alternative that um, really is a next step in the sequence of events with regard to providing um, broader access in the RCA for our healthy midwater uh, stocks. Um, we're taking a, a first and significant step in the specifications under the uh, action item 12E um, and appreciate um, NIMS finding a way uh, for that action to move forward in the biennial specs package so that will be it will be effective in 2023 as a first step. Um, but appreciate that here in the non trawl package, we will um, take a look at the gear definitions and determine um, what, if any, other gear configurations uh, might be authorized uh, beyond the EFP uh, gear, um, explicit EFP gear definitions that will be employed in Action 12E in the specs. Um, this should allow for uh, increased flexibility around gear innovation, um, potentially looking at uh, other bait types um, and other improvements that should allow increased utilization with hook and line gear in the non trawl RCA. Um, alternative two, this is um, again, a holdover that was um, something that was initially explored in the specifications process and was something that was really just too big an animal to get to in the specs, digging into uh, really the, the nuts and bolts and, and guts of the FMP and the regulatory language surrounding our limited entry fixed gear uh, permits and um, authorized gear types and um, trip limits and how it would all work to be able to allow the fixed gear fleet to fish to their higher trip limits, which are authorized under our FMP, um, but yet while using um, the approved hook and line gear that would be authorized for the open access fleet. So um, I appreciate the discussions that have gone on in the specs process that have daylighted um, that this is 
um, a very weighty, meaty issue. Um, but certainly, as the GMT notes, for equity reasons, uh, this alternative um, should move forward. Um, on the question of IFQ gear switching vessels, um, appreciate the council staff identifying this question and bringing it to us. Um, throughout the discussions on this particular action, we haven't heard much from the IQ sector and their interest in gear switching and using their uh, quota share in the RCA um, within the scope of the, the actions under consideration and alternative two or, or one for that matter. Um, I look forward to hearing more input from them on this item as um, the analyses continue. Um, I appreciate the discussion that uh, I had with Ms. Dorpinghouse and that um, there are some things to look into here. Um, I think in the event that it is easier or not difficult, and if there's a desire to fish under limits established with a limited entry fixed gear permit um, or the open access limits, if, if that's the preference, maybe that's more efficient. Um, I note the gap report and the interest um, potentially in utilizing quota pounds um, in the non-trawl RCA um, under the the definitions that would apply to the fixed gear fleet. Um, but I do expect that more discussion is needed and consideration as to whether or not cost recovery would be an element. Um, so I'll look forward to some more um, discussion on this point and a little more research and information to help inform us if in fact we want to um, ultimately include um, an alternative that allows uh, for use of IFQ gear uh, under the regulations that would be established to implement alternatives one and two. Um, so I'll look forward to more information as well as input uh, directly from uh, the IFQ fleet on that point. Um, regarding alternative three and the reconfiguration of the non troll RCA boundaries, um, there have been proposals to move the seaward line of the RCA that is at 100 fathoms uh, into the 75 fathom line for a number of years. Um, there's been a lot of interest in doing so because the number of healthy target stocks available um, is numerous and the fish uh, <coughs> reportedly are abundant. Um, particularly the midwater stocks, uh, chili pepper, yellowtail, um, boccaccio, and others that um, folks would like uh, greater access to. Um, we've also heard from those that pursue Pacific halibut that um, they would be interested in moving that line as well from 100 to 75 fathoms. Um, in years past, we have paused on considering this alternative further because of potential yellow eye impacts. Um, so this, this particular management measure has been under consideration um, and deferred. Um, gosh, I am thinking at least four years, probably more. Um, so examining um, how to get this done while um, maintaining our ability to monitor um, changes in bycatch um, is certainly important. Um, council staff brought, uh, brought the question to us about Pacific halibut and whether we're looking to include Pacific halibut in this action. Uh, the GMT is recommending um, including uh, the halibut fishery in this range of alternatives uh, to address the requests. Um, I know that there's some additional analysis to be done about 
um, whether halibut um, can be included in this action given um, it is managed under the Halibut Act. Um, but I think at, at this stage, it is um, important to um, to consider that, noting that we've received information that suggests it might all be accomplishable in this single action uh, that would apply then both for uh, ground fish and the Pacific halibut fishery. Um, I did, I think, fail to mention that um, the question was also posed whether the purpose and need might need revising to encompass um, opportunities to utilize Pacific halibut as well, and and again, I think the the direction that we give here to council staff um, to pursue um, modifications to the purpose and needs statement um, will leave to their discretion whether or not halibut um, is included in the purpose and need um, based on the additional analysis that will um, proceed from here. Uh, alternative four, this is the non-trawl RCA repeal idea. Um, have recommendations both from the GMT and the GAP that um, while this has been an item on our new management measure list that the council has retained for consideration, um, more modern thinking is that um, we're we are proceeding with considering um, access to the RCA in, in a stepwise fashion. And that's, I think, what we see in alternatives one and two and three, and that uh, removal of the RCA wouldn't be appropriate at this time. And there really isn't uh, an ability uh, or data to effectively analyze it. Um, the GMT is recommending that we include it back on the workload prioritization list um, among the other items on our list. Uh, and that seems like a, a reasonable um, placement for this alternative um, so that it's not lost from our thinking, but um, would not move forward as part of this action. Um, alternative five on the CalCod conservation area repeal. Um, been a lot of uh, very positive comments about um, the ad hoc work group and um, how uh, effective that um, process was. Um, I'll refer to the information provided to us uh, both in the report and um, in the presentation from um, Oceana today um, that how important it is to consider um, that with the repeal of the Calcott areas, um, fish, new fishing effort is certain to emerge and we want to be thoughtful about it. And it seems um, appropriate to not increase um, bottom contact with new gear types and new activities in these most sensitive areas. Um, I appreciate um, Oceana's um, approach in that um, they were looking to protect the most sensitive areas. And it was quite amazing to me to see that um, with retaining only 12% of the Calcott area um, and propose new closure areas that would protect uh, the most uh, densely abundant species of coral and sponges. Um, in fact, encompass, you know, what, 44 and 35% um, of those populations that currently are in the Calcott area. Um, it's quite remarkable. And I think it is the, the right step forward. Um, appreciating that there's some work to be done yet on what mechanism is used to employ uh, the new closure areas and maybe um, we might need some refinement uh, in the thinking about what they are called. Uh, there's been the suggestion both in the GMT report and elsewhere that um, these may be, um, the, the, the mechanism of block area closures might be uh, the most effective mechanism to um, 
to enact these new proposed closed areas um, and certainly support the analysis moving forward, um, whether the me whatever the mechanism might be. Um, so I, I can't state enough how many times we have been um, seeking um, movement on the Calcod conservation area. Um, historically, we asked for adjustment of the outer boundaries because we really wanted to um, provide access to those deeper water slope fishery resources, um, particularly sablefish, which we've identified over and over as being underutilized in the southern area. We've made it a priority to increase utilization of sablefish uh, in the south. And this particular action, I believe, will go a long way toward attaining that goal. Um, similarly, uh, we now have rebuilt cow cod and there are a number of other areas beyond just the, the deep slope that certainly will um, afford opportunities for shelf and slope uh, fisheries, uh, both commercial and recreational, to improve their utilization as well. So um, very pleased to see this element of the proposal. It's been a long time coming. Um, and with that, I will wrap it up and say thank you. All right, thank you, Marcy. Are there questions for the maker of the motion? Heather Hall. Excuse me, Chair Groundlick. I do not have a question. I was just gonna make some comments. All right, um, let me just first see if there are any questions on the motion. And then we'll have discussion, so Heather Hall. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Groundlick, and thank you, uh, Marcy, for the motion. I. I just want to note and appreciate that it does include alternative six, which is the alternative um, that's specific to uh, Washington. Um, and just uh, provide some comments here. Um, in WDFW has a long history of being uh, precautionary um, with our approach to the RCA. And um, this particular issue, I, I don't see as a departure from that. Um, our report from November uh, really does um, provide some of that background as well as laying out how we are um, thinking about this and, and talking about it. Um, as the council considers changes to the non trawl RCA, we, we wanted to provide the opportunity uh, to hear from stakeholders in Washington and, and get their input on that. But we've also really um, uh, put some specific objectives out to frame those discussions. Um, and uh, our, our November report also uh, points out that we expect to take some time to do that. Um, we uh, specifically made the Washington alternative separate from all the others, uh, so we don't hold up actions in Oregon and California. And I would just, um, add that I think the public comment that we heard this afternoon really um, highlights the contrast in that in what we heard from uh, Steve Westrick from the um, Westport Charter Boat Association and, and others from um, California about the need and the urgency for action. And, and so I just wanted to provide that as, as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Bill Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and um, I just have one small uh, add to what Heather uh, provided uh, in the GMT report under it's Alternative 6. They talk about the anticipating or that it's highly likely that there'll be some alternatives developed in time to bring to the September Council meeting. I personally think that's unrealistic. We're about ready to enter into the prime fishing time and, and the people that need to collaborate and discuss this topic are gonna to be fishing. So I, I, don't, I don't anticipate that we would be ready for that uh, or be bringing that forward in, in September. Further discussion on the motion? Thank you, Summer. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to support the motion and um, support 
all of Marcy's very comprehensive uh, rationale for the motion. I don't have anything to add. Thank you, Maggie. Anything else? Okay, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Marcy, for the motion. Um, Maggie Summer. Thank you, Vice Chair. I'd like to offer a second motion. Sorry, Chair. Didn't mean the demotion. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. May I offer a second motion, please? You may. Thank you. I move the council add to the alternative three sub options as follows. For sub option one, include an option to prohibit groundfish non trawl bottom contact gear in the entire EFHCA for trawl EFHCAs with small portions outside the existing non trawl RCA seaward boundary, as recommended in F6A Supplemental Habitat Committee Report 1. Add a new sub option two. Prohibit commercial groundfish fishing with non trawl bottom contact gear in the area west of the Hecata Bank EFH conservation area, as proposed in F6A Supplemental ODFW Report 1. Add new sub option three identify potential new yellow eye rockfish conservation areas, if any, that could be used to mitigate impacts to yellow eye rockfish resulting from this action which could be implemented in biennial management measures or in-season action. And request that council staff, one, provide information on the types and extent of area management measures that could achieve the intent of each suboption, and two, consider recommendations on analysis of alternative three in F6A Supplemental Habitat Committee Report 1 and Supplemental Gap Report 1, April 2022. Thank you, Maggie. Is the language on the screen accurate and complete? Yes. I look for a motion. Seconded by, or rather, I look for a second. It was seconded by Marcy Remco. So please speak to your motion. Thank you, Chair. This motion um, adds options uh, for measures to, uh, pardon me, adds options to alternative three for measures that would protect habitat and or rebuilding species as an area long closed uh, to non trawl groundfish fishing may be reopened under alternative three. Recognizing that although the primary purpose of the non trawl RCA has been bycatch reduction, uh, it has had a corollary mitigating effect on adverse impacts to EFH from non trawl groundfish fishing. Uh, Reminding ourselves that EFH is every for groundfish is everything from the uh, from shore out to 3,500 meters, not only those areas in EFH conservation areas. As Marcy highlighted, the council will be conducting a full groundfish EFH review in several years, and we expect that will include a broad range of stakeholders and data. And I agree that's the right venue for considering changes that could affect non magnuson fisheries, such as new or expanded bottom contact EFH conservation areas that would apply to state managed fisheries, as well as federal. However, we also have a responsibility to consider impacts to EFH in our fishery management actions, as action on this item could occur before the next EFH re groundfish EFH review, potentially resulting in opening some areas to non trawl groundfish fishing where it has not occurred in many years. I think it's wise to consider taking precaution to keep the gear types most likely to affect habitat out of these areas uh, if and when they're opened as a result of this item. Specifically, uh, the intent of, of sub option one as presented in attachment one is to minimize to the extent practicable adverse effects on groundfish EFH in portions of trawl EFH conservation areas that would be opened under this alternative. As currently worded, previously adopted by the council and presented in attachment one, this could result in bisecting some EFH conservation areas with new management lines illustrated in red on the band and high spot EFH conservation area on one of the slides Jesse presented earlier today. The intent of 
the addition that this motion proposes would be to include an option to apply a layer of protection to the entire trawl EFH conservation area for those EFHCAs where a small portion is currently open because it is outside the seaward boundary of the non-trawl RCA. In addition to extending the habitat protection to the entire area within these EFHCA boundaries, it would simplify compliance and enforcement by avoiding subdividing the EFHCAs with different regulations in different portions. To be clear, I am proposing adding this to the existing suboption rather than substituting it in response to the concerns expressed by the GAP about creating new closures under this action. Off of Oregon, there are two trawl EFHCAs this could apply to, the Bandon High Spot and the Halem Bank, and the portions of both that are currently open to non-trawl ground fish fishing because they're outside the seaward boundary of the non-trawl RCA appear small on the map. But there are EFH conservation areas in California that are situated differently relative to the existing seaward non-trawl RCA boundary and applying gear prohibitions in the open portions of those could result in significant new closures, which is not the purpose of this action. So in this context, the word small is important, even though it is subjective. Analysis of the approach proposed here in this motion should include an investigation of fishing effort in the portions currently open using VMS logbook and other available data. And uh, I hope to receive industry input on the effect of applying the proposed protections in the currently open areas. Regarding new sub-option two, uh, this proposes the uh, Hecata Bank West area described in the ODFW Supplemental Report 1 under this action item. And the intent here is to minimize to the extent practicable adverse effects of fishing on groundfish EFH uh, and to minimize impacts on yellow eye rockfish as they rebuild by adding a layer of protection in this area as recommended by the Habitat Committee, as well as proposed in the ODFW report. For the new sub-option three, the intent is to provide additional options to minimize impacts on yellow eye rockfish through the establishment of yellow eye rockfish conservation areas uh, of new ones, if appropriate. I recognize that other tools such as block area closures uh, may be effective and more appropriate I just wanted to specifically request looking into the yellow eye rockfish conservation tool, uh, recognizing um, as we did with our report, the, um, uh, the high probab uh, occurrence probability in particular off of the Hecata Bank area. Uh, the request number one, uh, the intent here is to recognize that there are multiple pathways to achieve the objectives uh, and um, providing flexibility for council staff in consultation with agency staff, the enforcement consultants, GMT, industry, and others as appropriate to identify options and provide the council with information on those potential mechanisms and pathways. The next time the council considers this item will allow us to make the best decision on how to achieve our objectives here. And for request two, uh, the intent is to support the recommendations for analysis included in the Habitat Committee and GAP reports uh, referenced here, but not intended to limit the analysis to only topics identified in those reports. Uh, others may be explored. And for example, there is an additional recommendation from the Habitat Committee in their November 2021 report. Uh, which was not um, repeated in the report at this meeting just for brevity. That concludes my remarks. Thank you. Great. Right, thank you, Maggie. Are there are questions uh, for Maggie on the motion. Discussion on the motion. All right, not seeing any hands. I will call the question. All of those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much for the motion. 
Further motions and or discussion on this agenda item. All right, um, Jesse, Brett, how are we doing? Thank you, Chair Duralnik. I think uh, we're doing well and I appreciate the motions and uh, the detail here. I think we've completed our task where we've uh, revised the range of alternatives and solidified those and put down some new options as well. Uh, I appreciate all the input. I also see that we got some guidance in the development of the analysis and I do appreciate some of the leeway there uh, for council staff to work with NIMS and other uh, staff to continue to develop this analysis. And uh, we'll do our best to come back with a robust analysis of the information that's been put on in these motions. I question to the, the, the comment regarding alternative six from Phil and trying to collaborate and develop something there. Um, so we'd like to have some more discussions on the side about that and the efficacy of that. But at this time, we're going to move forward with alternative six and analyze that as it is. And uh, we'll work on a timeline and come to you likely uh, in workload planning. We could have some discussion on that and, and how much work will be involved here. We're going to have to do some thinking and strategize. Having said that, we also could think about then in June whether we're ready in September and we can update you then as well. So I appreciate all the work that everybody's put into this and the conversations we had up until this to get a smooth uh, motion passed. And I, I thank Marcy and Heather and, and Maggie especially. So I think that completes our council action for this agenda item. All right, thank you very much. Marcy Rimko. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Um, it's been brought to my attention that um, while my intent was there to um, include or that the GMT's report was comprehensive and all inclusive for everything that we needed to move forward, um, it's brought, been brought to my attention that in fact um, the item five discussion in the GMT report references only uh, the CDFW report one back from November, which uh, includes the non trawl RCA lines um, that might be utilized uh, with the repeal of the Calcot area. Uh, the GMT report does not include as a reference the CDFW report on this item that is um that was discussed under the materials for this meeting so in other words um the the new habitat protection areas uh, for coral and sponges that were proposed in the cdfw report uh here in april um, that report is not referenced in the gmt report so i just i think i can probably just give this as guidance that um my intent is that the proposal that is included in the CDFW report is included among the range of alternatives. I'm getting uh, a positive nod from our executive director, Merrick Burden, so we can deem that included. Phil Anderson. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in response to Mr. Weedoff's comment about talking to me about Alternative six, while that might be useful, it would be more useful to talk to uh, Heather about the timing of all that. Um, I'd be happy to be included in the conversation, but Heather's the one he needs to talk to. All right, thanks for that clarification. I'll ask again, anything further on this agenda item? All right, thank you very much. I gather that concludes what we're gonna get done for the day and I'll turn to Executive Director Merrick Burden for a preview of tomorrow and any other announcements. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, um, I would like to congratulate everybody for not adjourning early today. Uh, 
but very, very good work uh, today on some thorny issues. Um, I do have uh, an update on the salmon uh, item that um, we paused earlier. Um, so it looks like if we look ahead to tomorrow, um, what I would recommend we do is start off the morning with F7, electronic monitoring. And then from there, um, plan on turning back to D5 for more salmon guidance. And then to proceed um, accordingly through the rest of the agenda as scheduled. Um, we are still optimistic that we could get to D6 at the end of tomorrow. I think that's still a possibility uh, from what I'm told. Um, but anyway, Mr. Chairman, that would um, that would be my recommendation regarding tomorrow's agenda. Thank you. Um, and I, I've been doing my best to try to establish the expectation that that will be will be doing a final action tomorrow afternoon so that there isn't the assumption that we'll roll it over because that has gotten us into trouble in the past. So hopefully you're right. And uh, we don't have a lot of issues. We can conclude uh, all of tomorrow's agenda tomorrow. But I guess we'll see what happens. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, see you um, right and early tomorrow at 8 a.m. <laughs>